Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's New York City Council remote hearing on the committee of zone, uh, subcommittee of zoning and franchises. At this time, everybody, please turn on your cameras. If you have any electronic devices that are going to make any disruptions, please set them to vibration or turn them off. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we want to make sure that we respect everybody's right to express their opinions today. So make sure that when it's, everybody will have a turn to testify, make sure that when it's your turn to testify, please do not use any offensive language. We'll have many different people testifying here today in various languages. Anybody that attempts to disrupt the meeting will be removed from the meeting. So please, we need everybody's cooperation. We have a very long list of people to testify. I will repeat the same thing in Spanish for some of our Spanish speaking folks. Uh, buenos días a toda la gente que han venido a esta vista pública del eh, Comité de Zoning y Franchises. Para todas esas personas que quieren testificar hoy, si ya están registradas, van a tener su tiempo para testificar en el día de hoy. Por favor, cuando sea su tiempo de testificar, no use ninguna palabra ofensiva. Queremos que todos se puedan comportar de una manera que podemos todos cooperar en esta vista pública de hoy. Vamos a empezar dentro de, de pronto uh, y espero que todas las personas que se hayan registrado tengan eh, una oportunidad de expresarse en el día de hoy. Uh, Chairman, we are ready to begin, sir. Thank you so much. Good morning. I am uh, Council Member Francisco Moya, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. Uh, I am joined here today uh, remotely by members uh, from the subcommittee, uh, members Gredenchek, Rivera, Reynoso, uh, Levin. We are also been joined by Council Member Menchaca, Yeager, Adams, and Ayala. Today we will be holding uh, a public hearing, uh, public hearings on two rezoning proposals. Uh, before we begin, uh, I would like to recognize the subcommittee council to review the remote hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public who are wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. As part of the registration process for today's hearing, council staff have made and continue to make efforts to facilitate language translation services for those who request such services. We ask that all speakers bear with us as we work to ensure that everyone has their opportunity to testify. If you wish to testify and have not already done so, we ask that you please register now by visiting the Council's website at www.council.nyc.gov to sign up. For members of the public who are viewing this meeting online, Council is providing multilingual live stream viewing options at council.nyc.gov with audio translations in Arabic, Cantonese, Mandarin, and Spanish, ASL interpretation, and CART translation services. Once again, these options can be found at the Council's main website at www.council.nyc.gov. We also ask that anyone registered to testify who requires translation services please tune in to one of the live stream channel options on the council website in order to keep track of where we are in the overall meeting schedule and to anticipate the approximate timing of your own testimony. When called and admitted into the virtual hearing space, individuals about to testify before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. Witnesses, that is members of the public who have signed up to testify will be called in groups or panels. The applicant panel will be called first, followed by witness panels from the public who will be called in groups of four names at a time. Once the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your microphone is on before you begin speaking. And I will remind all participants that there is a slight delay in the process of unmuting. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit instead of appearing before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. 
please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of your participant panel. During the question and answer, answer portion, I will announce council members with questions in order as they raise their hands. And Chair Moya will then recognize members to speak. Each council member will have five minutes for questions and answers inclusive of questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this hearing for various technical reasons. And we ask that you please be patient as we work through any and all issues. Chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you uh, to our council. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU 678 and 679 for the 5914 Bay Parkway rezoning uh, relating to property in Council Member Yeager's district in Brooklyn. The applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to change an R5 district to an R6 C24 district and a zoning district uh, and a zoning text amendment to map a mandatory inclusionary housing area on the east side of the Bay Parkway between 59th and 60th streets to facilitate the development of a nine story mixed use building with ground floor retail community facility use and residential use estimates for the uh, residential uses are as follows 36 dwelling units 11 of which would be affordable units and 25 below grade parking spaces um, i now would like to take this opportunity to recognize uh, council member jaeger to offer some remarks uh, on this project good morning mr chairman thank you very much um in light of today's calendar and uh the work that the committee the subcommittee has to do I'm going to defer an opening remarks uh, and a statement uh, simply uh, just to allow the committee to get to its work today. Uh, I do want to, however, express my thanks to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the work you put into uh, uh, looking at this project and, and uh, understanding it and understanding and knowing my district and our community, um, and especially in light of uh, the heavy burdens that you're carrying with the work that the subcommittee has to do today. Uh, but for now, I would yield back to you, Mr. Chairman, to uh, get on with today's business and allow the subcommittee to do its work. Thank you, uh, Council Member Yeager. Uh, Council, if you can please call the first panel for this item. The applicant panel will include Rachel Skull and Jay Siegel, Land Use Council, appearing on behalf of the sponsor, SUW4 LLC. Panelists. If you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. The council, can you uh, please administer uh, the affirmation? Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? Good morning. Before I get started, um, is someone controlling the slides from another computer? Scott, please stand by.
sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm gonna try again. Good morning, my name is Rachel Skull and I'm an associate at Greenberg Charig. We represent SUW4 LLC, the applicant seeking to rezone 5914 Bay Parkway from its current R5 zoning district to an R6 zoning district with a C24 commercial overlay. Should also be mapped for mandatory inclusionary housing. I am joined today by my colleague, Jay Siegel. Um, could I get the next slide, please? So just quickly before you begin, uh, I just want to uh, thank you. Um, Sorry. Again, we are in receipt of the, the proposal. Uh, when you're ready to present the slideshow, uh, as you see, it's already been displayed on the screen, but the, to advance to the next um, slide, just say next. Uh, and please note that there may be a slight delay as the presentation is loaded uh, as well for the advancing slides. Uh, and finally, uh, just before you begin, uh, I know you already stated your name and the affirmation for the record. Um, but I just wanted to let you know um, sort of the protocols of this. So you may begin now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, can you hear me? Can someone just confirm? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to start over. <laughs> Sorry. My name is Rachel Skull and I'm an associate at Greenberg Charig. We represent SUW4 LLC, the applicant seeking this rezoning and text amendment for mandatory inclusionary housing. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Jay Siegel. Um, as you can see on the screen, the, the proposed um, rezoning is located at the corner of Bay Parkway and 60th Street. It's in an, currently in an R5 district about two blocks south of Washington Cemetery and two blocks west of McDonald Avenue at the eastern edge of Borough Park. Um, next slide, please. Our client owns the approximately 100 by 100 foot development site, which is currently unimproved. Um, the development site is at the intersection of two wide streets. There is an R6 zoning district to the development site south, an R5 district continues to the west and north, and a C82 district improved with auto and warehouse uses to the east. Um, next, please. Um, the development site sits across 60th Street from a nine-story medical facility, caddy corner from the approximately 90,000 square foot Bishop Kearney High School, and across Bay Parkway from a Rite Aid with accessory outdoor parking. Um, and, oh, and there you can see the nine story medical facility and this, the three photos there, the tall building the development site is um, the green construction fence that you see on the top right on the left hand side, you see the high school and on the bottom right in that image, you have the Rite Aid. Um, next please. The proposed R6 C24 district would allow up to 4.8 FAR or approximately 48,000 square feet of development on the development site. Our client is proposing to construct an approximately 46,300 square foot new building, which would contain approximately 5,800 square feet of commercial use on the ground floor, which would likely be local retail, approximately 6,200 square feet of second floor community facility space, and the remaining approximately 34,300 square feet would be used for residential uses. Approximately 10,300 square feet of the residential floor area would be affordable pursuant to the proposed MIH workforce option. The proposed new building would rise to a maximum 95 feet, but significant setbacks mandated, mandated by zoning would prevent the new building from overwhelming the lower rise residential buildings to its north and west. Parking is required for 50% of the new building's dwelling units. However, we understand from the community board and our clients' knowledge from living in the area, the parking is in short supply in this part of Brooklyn. Our, plan, our client plans to, plans to provide the 25 parking spaces requested by the community board. The spaces would be provided in a cellar level semi-automated parking facility. The proposed workforce option will help offset the significant cost of providing the additional parking, which is almost double what would be required by zoning. The proposed rezoning, which was voted on favorably by the community board and the borough president, will create a transition between the lower rise residences to the west and north and the dense intersection of Bay Parkway and 60th Street, while bringing local retail community facility uses and affordable housing to the development site. And we're happy to answer any questions that you have this morning. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'd just like to say that we've been joined by council members Lansman, Richards, Amprey Samuels, and um, Gibson.
Also, uh, I advise the public that if you need uh, an accessible version of uh, this uh, announcement or this presentation, please send your uh, email request to the land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, and now I just have a, a two quick questions for you um, before I turn it over to um, the, our councilman. Um, you, can you give an example, this is dealing with the affordability uh, issue. Can you give an example of what eligible income and sample rents are under the workforce MIH option uh, and how that compares uh, to the local neighborhood? Um, so the MIH level is for workforce. So it's 30% of the residential floor area has to be affordable at an average AMI of 115% for a family of four, that's about $123,000. Um, the maximum income ban cannot exceed 135% AMI, which would be 144,000 for a family of four. 5% um, of the residential floor area must be affordable at 90% AMI or lower. Um, that's 96,000 for a family of four. And 5% must be affordable at 70% AMI or lower, which is 70, about $75,000 for a family of four. Um, I don't have the income levels for the area, but I do have um, comparative rents. Um, the, the maximum rent that we could charge under the workforce option in conjunction with affordable New York, which, which is what our, our client is, is seeking to do here, would be 130% AMI, which is those maximum rents are still lower than um, the, the market rate rents in the area. However, our client um, feels that what's actually marketable as affordable housing here would be closer to the maximum that could be charged for 105% AMI, which makes the the maximum rents being charged for their workforce units significantly lower than the market rate. Okay. Um, and also, can you describe your plans for the local based uh, contractors and subcontractors participating uh, in the development? Um, we haven't gotten to the point of seeking bids yet. I know that my client is going to be seeking bids uh, locally and from minority and women owned businesses. I can, I can get more uh, details on that plan and respond in writing. Uh, and is there a commitment uh, uh, to good jobs uh, for the future property service and maintenance workers at uh, the completed development? I, yeah, that's something I will speak to my, my client about and we can respond in writing with our commitment. Thank you, that, that would be um, really appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, that's it for questions from me. Uh, I wanna now turn it over to our council um, to see if there are any members uh, who have questions. Mr. Moya, council member Yeager has a question. It will be followed by council member Reynoso. Council member Yeager, you may begin. Sure. Can I, uh, I, I see uh, Councilman Reynoso also has his hand up. May I defer to my, uh, my colleague who's a member of the subcommittee and then just come in after that? Sure. Thank you. Council Member Reynoso. Uh, uh, one, a couple of questions, but uh, this is in common, uh, Council Member Common Yeager's district. Can I con confirm? Say that again, I'm sorry. In whose district is this application? Uh, Council member Yeager's, yes. Okay, um, so I'm gonna do this with all, all due respect to Council member Yeager. I would have loved for him to go first to understand um, why the workforce option is something that we should be considering here. Um, but uh, to the applicant, uh, can you please again, speak to why $123,000 a year is, uh, is is a is the option that's being chosen um, by this developer? Sure. So we're seeking the workforce option more for the flexibility than the maximum rents allowed. It will help uh, offset the parking that was extremely important to this community. We understand that parking is is very important here. Uh, we also are looking to help some of community members who are maybe being pushed out of the area because as rents rise, um, we understand that it's much more common to see one and two family homes constructed here rather than apartments. And um, we feel that we're 
were able to contribute um, more middle income affordable housing here and the the fact that it will also be rent stabilized, we hope will bring some from sta some stable affordable housing to the neighborhood. So can you speak to the changes to the the parking? So there was, there's been an, a request for an increase in the parking requirements in this property? Sure, so if we did option two, um, because parking is required for 50% of units rented at greater than 80% AMI, if we were doing option two and sticking with 80% AMI, the building's um, market rate units would only require 13 spaces. But by providing the 25 spaces that are required, that's almost double. And in order to provide those spaces, we need to use a um, semi-automated facility in order to fit them on the small footprint of this building without having to go down two levels underground. And so the, the workforce housing is really helping to offset those significant costs. Um, what is the current zoning of the lot and what is it and what is the proposed zoning? The current zoning is R5 and we're proposing an R6 with a C24 commercial overlay. How many apartment units are currently in the project and how many are going to be in the project? The project site is currently vacant. Um, the current proposal is 36 apartment units. The, uh, can, what is the rent of a one bedroom apartment at 100 and what is it, 30% AMI through the workforce option? Sure. A one bedroom apartment would be um, about $2,500 a month. Our client is not proposing rents that high. They understand that that would not, not be. That is not true. That's, uh, well, by law, that is not that is not the case. The applicant at this point is one second. Um, Anna, um, so what the applicant is like, actually asking for hundred up to 130% AMI, am I correct? That, that is part of the workforce option. Yes, it's actually the workforce option. The maximum would be 135% AMI. The reason we're discussing 130, that's the maximum for affordable New York. Which which I wanna be very clear with you, you've done this work for a long time. Uh, it's almost always at the top of the max, the minimum requirement for these projects. Very rarely do landlords take the option to go lower um, out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, so at 130%, you're saying a one bedroom, for $2,500, uh, considering the crisis that we are currently in when it comes to housing, and considering that this is uh, in a district that has, uh, there's more, uh, that is, let's say, uh, more white, um, uh, I'm extremely concerned about the burden of building deeply affordable housing going almost exclusively to black and brown neighborhoods. And this is a perfect example, a workforce option, where I'm concerned that even in, in any district, including Common Yeager's district, that $2,500 for a one bedroom is questionable. And the fact that we're giving a bonus to this property or an opportunity for growth from an R5 to R6 to this property to uh, allow them to charge rent at $2,500. Um, I don't wanna ask for two and three bedroom apartments. We're talking about going above $3,000. Um, we have a crisis and everybody needs to do their part. And I don't think that this applicant is necessarily doing that. But but um, my decision on what I'm going to do with this vote is going to is going to fall on um, the opinions and the, um, uh, and the uh, testimony of uh, Council Member Yeager, which I'm excited to hear. But um, I'm very concerned about this applicant um, on face value. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Reynoso. Uh, I now um, hand it over to Council Member Yeager. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Council Reynoso. So I, I asked uh, that my colleague go first because I wanted to be in a position to answer some of his concerns. And, and I do recognize the crisis of affordability uh, very much. And, and I have, uh, in this council, voted for every single application uh, that has come up in, before this council uh, for rezoning that has proposed um, uh, affordable housing uh, without regard to my personal opinions, uh, simply because I think that we have to develop affordable housing anywhere we can in this city. On this particular site, this is, uh, this is what I would call a, an, an urban blight site. It, it is, uh, uh, it, there's nothing there. Uh, it is a decrepit lot um, in a neighborhood that we would like to see something uh, be built there. Right now, throughout my neighborhood, what people are doing are building one and two family homes. Um, I am not seeing, and in my time here in the council, this is literally the first project where somebody has come before the council 
uh, since I've been here to ask for more space to build. People are not building in my district, they're just not. Um, I need to be in a position where we can incentivize the building here. And I also recognize that uh, without the additional space, uh, the, the uh, applicant has the ability to build market, um, perhaps a few less apartments, uh, but market and we'll get nothing out of it. And I won't get the stabilization, which to me is amongst the most important concerns. I want people to know that when they sign a lease, what their rent is today is what they can count on their rent being tomorrow and the next day and the next year and the year after that. I am constantly worried about people's rent uh, not, being, not, not being counted on for their future. What I'm seeing in my neighborhood is people who, who are living in, uh, in rented uh, multiple dwellings, three or four or five family homes, and their rents are going up every year. They're not stabilized. They're not controlled in any way, and they're being priced out of the neighborhood. Uh, $2,500 is a lot but $2,500 is affordable in my neighborhood. Um, uh, this is the, the kind of trade-off. And when they came before the community board, um, I had not taken a position. I wanted to hear what people would say. Um, and I made no statements at the community board. There was not a single person from the surrounding area who objected. And the community board voted in favor of this uh, to the tune of 100% of the members, less one vote. Um, and I like to defer to a community board when, when they see a project like this for the same reason that when I was on a community board for 18 years, um, I wanted our opinions to be respected as well as, as projects move up. This, was, this also had a hearing in front of the borough president. Um, borough President Adams looked at the project. Uh, he supports the project as well with his recommendations. And so for me, uh, uh, getting the ability to bring 36 units um, with the mix of affordability and, and market uh, is important. Um, one of the greatest challenges in that area in building anything is my concern about uh, parking. This is, not, uh, this is not a transit zone, if you will, where subway is right around the corner. Virtually everybody who's going to rent one of these apartments is going to have a car. I know we like to hope that New York City gets to the place where uh, we're not an exclusively car city, but the reality is not every part of New York City is Greenwich Village or downtown Manhattan. There are places in the city where people do rely on cars to get around. This is more of the suburban part of the city um, where I know just, it's not, it's not merely anecdotal. It's look around, everybody's gonna have a car. The ability to take these cars and get them off the streets and get them underneath the building was incredibly important to the community board. I heard that concern there and that makes it incredibly important to me as well. Um, for me, it's also important that the applicant is stating on the record his commitment to going to uh, 25 spaces, even though it is not required to do so. That's a give back that I think is important. Uh, the give back of offering up um, space in the building uh, for use by community institutions as well uh, is, is also important. They are going to have community facility space. That's important as well because it gives us the ability uh, to have local doctors. It gives us the ability to have local institutions stay and be local. Um, and that's important as well. And in terms of the retail, you know, I don't know what they're going to end up doing, uh, but anytime somebody wants to create jobs in my neighborhood, I say, give me a shovel, let me just start digging because I don't, I, I, I know who gets employed there and it's people from all over the city and I want them to have jobs and we have to do everything we can to get jobs. I believe this project's going to be a good project. I believe it's going to be a union project. I'm hopeful it will be. Um, I want that to be the case. I know they're going to hire locally based uh, uh, companies because I insisted when I spoke with them a few weeks ago, I know that the chair is something that this, would he, this is what he would insist. Um, and I spoke to the applicant about my desire to make sure that people who live in Brooklyn are employed by his work in building in Brooklyn. Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back to you. Uh, I, unless, unless the chair has a question for me uh, or, or no. Councilman Reynolds. Thank you, Councilman Mayega. Thank you. Okay, um, are there any uh, other council members uh, who wish to ask questions? Moya, I see no uh, members with further questions for the panel. Okay, uh, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this application? Yes, Chair Moya. Thank you. So uh, 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to now uh, thank the panel um, and excuse them uh, for from this uh, panel right now. And uh, as I said, we thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, council, if you could please um, call up uh, any members of the public who have signed up to testify. Thank you so much. The first witness panel for this item will be Jocelyn Sutil and William Rodriguez. Okay, members of the public um, will be given two minutes to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. Uh, and before you begin, please state your name and uh, uh, affiliation. Uh, if any, and either the LU number or the project name on which you are testifying. Chair Moya, please stand by. Chair Moya, we will uh, seek uh, members of the public to testify at this time. Uh, those witnesses uh, are not available at the moment, but we will now seek uh, public testimony. Okay. If there are any members of the public who wish to testify on LU numbers 678 and 679 for the 5914 Bay Parkway rezoning, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will stand at ease while we check for members of the public. Chair Moya, I see no members of the public uh, who wish to testify on this item. Okay, there being uh, no. Okay, uh, since there is no uh, additional members of the public who wish to testify on the 5914 Bay Parkway rezoning proposal. I now turn it over to you, um, Council. Yes, Chair Moya, there are no members of the public signed up to testify. You will uh, announce the closing of the hearing. Thank you. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on the public hearing on LUs uh, 678, 679 for the 5914 Bay Parkway rezoning uh, is now closed. Okay, uh, now we will move to the next item uh, that we will be hearing is for LU 674 through 677 for the industry city proposal relating to the property located in council member Menchaca's district in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant seeks approval for a series of related land use actions to facilitate the expansion of industry city, a 16 building 5.3 million square foot complex of historic loft buildings located in the industrial waterfront section of Sunset Park, Brooklyn. The requested actions include a city map change, a zoning map amendment, a zoning text amendment, and a zoning special permit, and would establish the special industry city district. The proposed action would facilitate the development of up to 1.45 million additional square feet as part of three new buildings and or vertical additions to the existing buildings, bringing the full uh, complex to a total of 6.6 .6 million square feet 
4.97 FAR and allowing retail, academic, and hotel use that are not permitted by the current zoning. The Sunset Park waterfront stretches from the border of Bay Ridge at the 65th Street rail yards to the mouth of the Gowanus Canal and is one of the last active industrial waterfronts in New York. It is home to large city-owned properties where the city has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in industrial economic development, including the Brooklyn Army Terminal, Bush Terminal, and South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. The industry city proposal poses difficult questions about how to balance industrial and commercial development, public and private investment, and achieve more and more of an equitable, inclusive, and sustainable economy in our city. Uh, while New York is in need of investment to help drive recovery from COVID-19, proposals that affect land use at this scale also have long-term impacts we must consider, especially in an area as sensitive as the industrial waterfront. We look forward to digging deeper on the details of the proposal and its implications today. Many Sunset Parkers and residents from across the city have raised their voices and feel passionately about the future of this property and the Sunset Park waterfront. We know this project has been a contentious one, but we ask that everyone remain respectful in their testimony. Due to the number of speakers we have signed up, we will be limiting testimony to two minutes per person. We will hear first from the applicant, then the public panels uh, of four speakers each. But first we will go to uh, my colleague, Council Member Menchaca uh, for a statement. Council Member Menchaca. Chair, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, Chair, I want to say thank you to you, uh, the land use team, and the entire city council, including Speaker Johnson, who have made today's hearing a new uh, engagement uh, opportunity. Uh, we know that there are many, uh, there are few rooms that are being translated. And so I just want to say thank you on behalf of my community who are now connecting in a new way. Uh, that couldn't happen without your leadership and I wanna say thank you, Chair. Uh, in 2014, a year after arriving in Sunset Park, the owners of Industry City announced plans for a rezoning. They argued the rezoning was necessary to develop their industrial property and attract thousands of jobs. It is 2020. Industry City has not been rezoned, but jobs have come. And if you visit, you can see firsthand the mix of jobs already allowed in the industrial zone. Restaurant workers and bartenders, furniture salespeople and architects, carpenters and chocolate makers. All of these jobs are allowed at Industry City without a rezoning. Today, 500 diverse businesses call Industry City home and 2.5 million square feet at Industry City remains underutilized, awaiting redevelopment and activation. Just months ago, in the middle of the pandemic and the worst economy in a century, their investors outbid the EDC to purchase more property on Sunset Park's industrial waterfront. For Industry City, cash and vacant space are not in short supply. Industry City can bring more jobs without a rezoning. For years, I worked to understand the nuance and complexity of this proposal. I listened to everyone who wanted to talk to me, and ultimately I felt compelled to try. To try to make a rezoning work. The current zoning is far from perfect. My community is suffering from overcrowded schools and underemployment and 70% of my neighbors have no housing protections. I thought that maybe, maybe a rezoning could address our existing challenges. Maybe we could use a rezoning to protect the IBZ and encourage green industrial jobs. Maybe we could finally secure substantial city investments for schools and housing. But I also know, like many of you, my colleagues on not just this committee, but at this council, that any rezoning comes with steep costs and impacts. Thousands of working class immigrant families would be displaced in Sunset Park. Thousands of car trips 
destined to industry city to their shopping mall would choke the BQE and exacerbate the deadly conditions on Third Avenue. And most insidious, Industry City's job promise actually threatens jobs. By adding a million square feet of retail, bars, restaurants, hotel, and even and event spaces, we put Sunset Park's current 14,000 industrial workers at risk. In other words, their proposal was not just an opportunity, it was also a threat. And without substantial changes, Industry City's promise of jobs would mean little. So for two years, I worked with Sunset Park neighbors to develop a framework to address these threats and ensure accountability. I have made those, uh, that framework very, very clear. Industry City had to change their application. The mayor and his agencies had to commit investments and Industry City had to sign an ironclad legally binding contract with the community so that they and any future owner would be accountable to the community. This framework was designed to ensure that the city would not benefit by sacrificing Sunset Park. To their credit, Industry City agreed to this framework in principle, but while they agreed to discussions, they declined to do it on the community's terms. When they initiated ULERP in October of 2019, before a community coalition had emerged and legally had representation, they made it clear that it wasn't about accountability. It was about expedience. The mayor has repeatedly shut down conversations about investing in our housing and workforce needs. And to this day, a community coalition does not even have a lawyer. In other words, the framework that I've set failed. Industry City promises opportunities for Sunset Park, for the city as a whole. And I urge you colleagues to remember that promises by major developers are broken every day. If we cannot protect current businesses and residents, what good is their promise? I have worked on this application for years and I have been driven by a principle that binds us, all of us as members of this council to create meaningful opportunities while protecting the most vulnerable in our communities. You will hear from 160 people today who have signed up to speak and there will be tension. And I ask you to remember at this point with less than two months to go that there's no way to reach a level of accountability my community both demands and deserves. Our residents are also not alone. Congressmember Nidia Velasquez, Congressmember Jerry Nadler, State Senator Zelnor Myrie, and the incoming Democratic primary winners, State Senator Jabari Brisport and Assemblymember Marcella Mitanis, are all opposed to this application. And so I say thank you for being here, for listening to our community, and to the community who has shown up today and has submitted testimony. I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Menchaca. Um, I'd like to mention that we've been joined by Council Member Cornegie. Um, and just one quick procedural note here. Uh, we are anticipating uh, taking a very short break of approximately five minutes uh, around 2 p.m. Um, and now I just want to uh, turn it over to our Council uh, to please call the first panel um, for this item. And also, I just want to remind our, our colleagues that we will be getting to questions um, that you may have uh, right after the panel uh, does its presentation. The applicant panel for this item will include Andrew Kimball of Industry City and Jesse Mazur and Ethan Goodman, Land Use Council, appearing on behalf of the sponsor. Applicant panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Council, if you could please uh, administer uh, the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, 
and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions. I do. I do. Thank you. Uh, we have a slideshow presentation that will be displayed once you're ready uh, to take us through it. And slides will be advanced uh, for you when you say the word next. Uh, please just state your name uh, and affirmation for the record. And with that, uh, you may begin. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Andrew Campbell, and I'm CEO of Industry City. I'm here today after almost seven years of listening, engaging, planning, investing, rebuilding, and opportunity generating to ask you to approve adjustments to outdated zoning regulations that will facilitate and expand the already unprecedented private sector rebirth of a massive, long dormant industrial campus on the Brooklyn waterfront. Your approval <clears throat> will generate real benefits for Sunset Park and the city of New York. More than 20,000 jobs, $1 billion in private investment, the largest private sector commitment to preserve manufacturing anytime, any place, and $100 million a year in annual tax revenue. Even as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to touch so many lives, devastating Sunset Park and other areas of the city, the economic impact is already clear. One in five New Yorkers have lost their jobs and the city faces the largest budget deficit in history. Approving this plan, the only viable job plan to come before the city council since the pandemic began, and the only plan of this magnitude that is likely to reach the council before this term expires, will send a clear message that business and investment are welcome in New York City. While unprecedented in many ways, the reactivation of Industry City mirrors other successful initiatives. Brooklyn is home to three massive industrial complexes on the waterfront. The city owned and managed Brooklyn Navy Yard, the Brooklyn Army Terminal, and the privately owned Industry City. <clears throat> For the last 15 years, I've devoted my career to reactivating two of these facilities. I'm proud to say that with teams of incredibly talented people, we've been able to achieve something remarkable an uptick in Brooklyn-based manufacturing for the first time in decades. And by working with mostly small businesses and dream-chasing entrepreneurs, the creation of tens of thousands of jobs. Prior to joining Industry City, I led the Navy Yard redevelopment for eight years, turning a long abandoned, underutilized eyesore into a national model for urban industrial adaptive reuse. By embracing the innovation economy, the broad range of businesses and jobs that go into making physical, digital, or engineered products. While relentlessly focusing on workforce development opportunities, we were able to track $250 million in public funding that in turn leveraged over a billion dollars in private funds. And now the city is doubling down on its success at the Navy Yard while also investing significantly in the Brooklyn Army Terminal. In 2013, I joined a new ownership group at Industry City who are committed to bringing the long, decrepit, underutilized complex back to life with a similar focus on the innovation economy, local engagement, and opportunity. While the Navy Yard and Industry City have similar histories and both are meant to accommodate the same segments of New York's economy, there is one big difference. As a private property, government funding cannot and should not be used to rebuild Industry City. But government did show what was possible at the Navy Yard and set the challenge to the private sector. Build an economic future for New York that is inclusive, community-centric, and achievable without the expenditure of public tax dollars. To achieve success was gonna take a private investment at truly unprecedented level. At Industry City, that started by pumping 20 million gallons of water left by Superstorm Sandy out of the building's basements while investing in infrastructure that had been allowed to crumble for generations. Rebuilding basic systems like plumbing, electrical, and elevators to make the campus resilient in the face of climate change. 
replacing broken windows with 15,000 energy efficient windows, adding 55 new loading docks and installing pedestrian friendly elevated sidewalks. The adaptive reuse of 16 buildings for their original industrial commercial purpose is now one of the largest and most environmentally sustainable projects in the country. I brought and applied to Industry City everything that I learned at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, including where to start by listening. At Industry City, before a single architect or planner was hired, before any design was drawn, and before we landed on a plan, we listened to the community, to tenants that were already in place, to neighborhood service providers and nonprofit organizations, to elected officials and agency representatives. I knew that nothing would be achieved unless real partnerships were forged and meaningful ways to gather and incorporate community input were not only developed, but actually used. We invited people to come tour our campus and asked if we could come visit them. We surveyed area businesses, went door to door to meet area residents, brainstormed and swapped ideas with dozens of organizations and studied existing data and plans to explore a way forward. What we found was remarkable. Historically, the economic vitality of Sunset Park and other surrounding neighborhoods has been tied to the activities within the 16 building campus. At peak activity levels in World War II through the early 1960s, more than 25,000 people worked at Industry City and Sunset Park flourished as a working class neighborhood with thriving retail strips and waterfront shipping. We also learned what many in the community already knew firsthand as World War II ended and manufacturing began its long decline, Sunset Park suffered, but people didn't give up. They had a vision for what the waterfront could become and how it would give the rest of the area the boost it needed. That vision became a plan, specifically the Community Board 7's 197A plan. And that plan became the foundation of our plan, the basis of how we would reactivate Industry City. In studying the 197A plan and in all of our conversations, the number one thing we heard, and I would say loud and clear, is that we, the private owners, should do everything we can to create opportunities for our neighbors. People needed jobs and local entrepreneurs wanted to be nurtured. So we launched the Innovation Lab, the first such facility to be started by a private landlord in New York City. The area's elected officials at every level stepped up to support it and community-based organizations and New York City colleges and universities became our partners. Now more than 5,000 area residents have been trained, served as interns, been placed in jobs, received support for new business or otherwise benefited from the Innovation Lab. Makers wanted places to make things and manufacturers needed room to grow. To meet this demand, we transformed wide open warehouse floors into small workshops where artists and innovators could make and sell their products. In fact, our range of businesses is so diverse, we literally have the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker on our campus. To help New York remain vi a viable option for manufacturers of all kind, we built spaces for garment companies, distilleries, jewelry makers, and many others. And now we're prepared to make the largest private commitment to the preservation of manufacturing in New York City's history. Nearby retailers, service providers, and contractors wanted to do business with us. And so we aggressively sought participation by local contractors with more than 100 million of the 400 million already invested spent at area businesses. And local residents wanted access to local events and amenities in their neighborhoods. And our tenants wanted to be engaged and not just with each other, but with the broader Sunset Park community. Hundreds of community events have taken place at Industry City, often in collaboration with our tenants. And when the COVID-19 pandemic devastated our communities, we collaborated with our tenants to produce PPE for local hospitals and provide food donations to local food pantries. All of this was done because we listened and because we know our future and that of the local community are fully linked. We only succeed if Sunset Park and the city of New York succeed. Moreover, between the time we originally shared the plan some six years ago and the start of Euler, substantial changes were made to reflect the input we'd received. For instance, our original plan included dormitories to serve the colleges and universities we'd like to bring here. 
but some community members and elected officials were concerned that was too strong a step towards residential development. So we eliminated them. And now, despite the important role that business hotels and conference space play in successful innovation districts across the country, we're prepared to drop that element of our plan as well. Industry City has come alive over the last six years, thanks to hundreds of local entrepreneurs and small businesses who have embraced our vision. Employment has grown from 1,900 to 8,000. New businesses have grown from 150 to over 500. $400 million have been invested. One in five people who live and work in Sunset Park are now working at Industry City. Key sectors of growth have mirrored those we counted on for the rebirth of the Navy Yard, design, engineering, film and media, tech and art. Over 80% of our companies have fewer than five employees and operate out of spaces smaller than 2,500 square feet. Many companies at Industry City utilize some element of production or light manufacturing. In fact, today we have more manufacturing at Industry City than at any point in 40 years. In the limited capacity in which we're allowed under current zoning, CUNY City Tech, NYU Tandem, RPI, St. Francis, and Parsons all have outposts at Industry City. Scores of partnerships and programs have been established with local high schools, as well as with middle and elementary schools. Other key elements to the success of Industry City to date and to other successful innovation districts across the country are first, proximity of innovation economy businesses, including manufacturing, to academic institutions and workforce development entities, resulting in internships, guest lectures, partnerships, and technology transfer. Second, common and open space, which encourages networking and community building. And third, retail, entertainment, and wellness amenities. So why is rezoning needed? Outdated land use rules created some 60 years ago for the days of the smokestack are restricting our ability to grow in ways that best support local small business, job creation, and academic pathways. We need a zoning framework that supports the industrial, manufacturing, and innovation economy companies competing in the economy of 2020, not 1960. For instance, because we can't have academic classrooms, we're only scratching the surface of what can be achieved by integrating colleges and universities into a campus to maximize the creation of on-ramps to the jobs of today and the future. This is already happening at similar campuses across the country. Innovation districts in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Boston have embedded elements of such schools as Penn State, Carnegie Mellon, Babson College, UMass, and Northeastern. Close to home, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, Brooklyn College opened the first school of cinema embedded in a working studio lot. Academic collaborations at Industry City have begun and will really flourish with the new zoning framework in key innovation economy industries, such as film and media, design, engineering, and green energy. For example, through a joint venture with Red Hook Container Terminal and in partnership with the city and state, we're working to bring the offshore wind industry to the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, just across the street from Industry City. Many of the companies operating at SBMT will also take space in our buildings for office, R&D, and support space. Local high schools, colleges, and universities will be key players in not only filling the hundreds of green jobs at SBMT, but also working on R&D and other initiatives that advance the offshore wind industry, pioneering the green jobs of the future. But that is far from the only reason this rezoning is needed. The inability to lease the larger retail tenants limits our ability to draw people to a location that does not have and will not have housing. Shoppers at larger stores on our campus will in turn support the scores of small businesses that are both maker and retail that have opened at Industry City under the existing zone. Finally, the inability to build on vacant and adjacent properties limits our ability to serve the broadest set of innovation economy tenants, particularly those that need high ceilings and column free space. The tremendous success of the new Building 77 at the Brooklyn Navy Yard has proven the incredible value of and demand for such space. The new zoning will allow us to lease faster, creating more jobs and providing the returns necessary to build out a commercial industrial campus that is 100% privately financed. The alternative, 
as of right strategy will create far fewer jobs and forfeit the dynamic academic collaborations we propose. It will also force us to look closer at the high, highest return opportunities available in a heavy manufacturing zone today, namely pure office and last mile warehouse distribution. While it has certainly not been our leasing strategy to date, last mile warehouse pays more and is growing faster than any other industrial use in the city right now. For all of us who love this city, these are challenging times. Unfortunately, overheated rhetoric and unfounded accusations that aren't supported by the facts continue to be offered about this project. Even by some people whose commitment to remain uninformed has included an absolute refusal to visit Industry City or engage in meaningful dialogue. Given what you may hear today, I'm gonna to take the opportunity to directly address some of what we've heard and what you may be hearing today from the people who oppose this plan. Gentrification is real and it needs real solution. It is in fact happening in Sunset Park and in many other areas of New York but there is no evidence linking the creation of jobs at Industry City to gentrification in the neighborhood. In fact, rents and housing prices and other objective measures of gentrification show that the rate of gentrification in Sunset Park is occurring at a similar pace to other neighborhoods and in the years after 2013, when we began to bring jobs and businesses to Industry City, as in the years before we began that revitalization. In other words, there was no spike in gentrification as a result of our investment. Regardless, the answer to gentrification is not to kill jobs, but to create jobs and ensure that local residents have access to them. The answer to gentrification is also to build affordable and workforce housing near to where jobs are being created. That will require local leadership that supports greater density on sites near industry city. And on jobs, we've heard that these, those openings, this plan in this, that created by this plan won't go to local folks, despite all evidence to the contrary. Today, if you live and work in Sunset Park, chances are you work at Industry City. That's because 20% of the people who live and work in the neighborhood work at Industry City more than anywhere else. 35% of the 8,000 jobs at Industry City are held by people from the surrounding neighborhoods and nearly 70% by people who live in Brooklyn. We've also heard the calls for preservation of the site for green jobs. And again, we're happy to say that Industry City and our partners directly across the street at SBMT are creating the city's largest hub of green manufacturing as we undertake one of the nation's most significant adaptive reuse projects centered on bringing historic but decrepit buildings back to life. We've heard that Industry City's vision is not compatible with the community's vision and that the true voice of the neighborhood is opposed to this plan. As I've already demonstrated, our plan mirrors the Community Board's 197A plan. We've also heard that a plan of this scale should be considered as a public application, that the city should devote resources to its fullest implementation. While we agree that the city should address the need to upgrade the area's infrastructure, I think it's worth reminding everybody that this is a private application and covers privately owned property. That is different from area-wide rezonings where the city puts forward a plan to rezone large sections of a neighborhood with properties owned by numerous private in interests and individuals and almost always includes public land. And we've heard that there is no way to lock in all these promises to ensure they come to pass. Our promises are real and our seven year track record has been proven. However, area stakeholders are right to be uncertain of what any entity will do in the future. That is why we are willing to lock in our commitments into an enforceable CBA that binds the property, no matter who owns it, to certain commitments. These include preserving manufacturing as we take advantage of retail and new buildings that we can't do today. It means not fully unlocking our ability to add new retail and new buildings until we've demonstrated the jobs are going to local residents. We know you'll hear criticisms like those I mentioned from many people waiting to testify today, but you're also gonna hear from manufacturers who came to Industry City so that New York City could have one final chance at keeping them and the jobs they create before they move to another state 
You'll hear from business owners who grew up in Sunset Park and still find it hard to believe that they're achieving their version of the American dream in the neighborhood they love and still call home. And from others who have been here for decades through the tough times and are a testament to the area's tenacity. From a curious passerby who noticed a banner on the side of a building where Innovation Lab is and now has a job as a senior manager at a company manufacturing eyeglasses. You'll hear from people who were born in Sunset Park, still live there and are counting on this plan to help the neighborhood become a place full of opportunity for their children. Where people have a chance to get the education they need, a waterfront they want, and a future that is not only full of hope, but provides real promise. And because New York City's economic future is on the line, you'll hear from civic leaders and people from organized labor and from community organizations who never gave up on New York. So many refused to give up in the 70s when we were on the brink of bankruptcy or in the 80s when crack and AIDS threatened our future or at any other crisis. They've refused to do so now when so many others has the, have declared New York has met its demise. They will tell you what is at stake and that your approval will help New York recover from the nightmarish situation that confronts us. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much um, for your testimony. Uh, before I get to questions, um, I just want to remind uh, the public um, that you can email your request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov if you need an accessible version of the presentation that was uh, shown today. Um, I also just want to make a quick reminder to uh, my colleagues that um, once we're I'm done and Council Member Menchaca, um, we will allow five minutes for members to do Q&A and I will remind everyone um, as we proceed as well. Uh, we've also been joined by uh, Council Member Powers. Um, and so, so before I open it up to questions, I just have a couple of questions of my own. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Kimball again. Um, the question of rezoning. So according to the information that you have provided here, uh, the economic activity at Industry City has grown by uh, hundreds of businesses and thousands of jobs since 2013, uh, as this ownership group invested over $400 million. If the development under the current uh, zoning and mix of use uh, has been so successful, why do you need uh, the changes to the zoning? Thank you for the uh, question, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it and I appreciate the time today. Um, look, what is clear is that we have a track record of success. Council Member Menchaca mentioned it, you just mentioned it. There is no doubt and we're proud of that. Um, what I would argue is that that is all the evidence you should need to figure out how to support that success and grow that success at a time when the city is facing massive unemployment, north of 20%, budget deficits we haven't seen since the 1970s that are historic. So what I would hope this council would be figuring out what to do is how to find projects like this and how to support them, number one. Number two, I would say that the things that the community has been eager uh, to achieve uh, pathways into good jobs that are career pathways can be enhanced by this zoning, by bringing more businesses here, by bringing colleges and universities here, by bringing a vocational high school, something that Council Member Menchaca, to his credit, has advocated for. There is one at the Brooklyn Navy Yard right now that is astonishingly impressive. We would love to bring a replica of that here. Now, we currently do scores of internships with the local schools, the high schools, um, but having schools embedded in our campus where they are next door to the businesses that are here will facilitate those internships, that kind of tech transfer, that kind of entrepreneurship would, will allow those individuals then to either join those companies or start their own business here. And we will need more space for that. There have been questions raised about uh, the amount of vacant space we have now. Sure, we have vacant space. 
Um, but we've also leased over 3 million square feet in the last six years. So we have shown that we can fill space. A significant portion of that vacant space today uh, cannot be leased. It is decrepit. It needs massive investment. This rezoning will create the economic resources that will allow us both to invest in that last portion and to build new for those kinds of companies that don't fit in to buildings that were built in the 1890s to 1910 that have 15 foot high ceilings. Many of innovation companies, modern businesses need high ceilings. They need more space. They need modern systems that can't be outfitted in old historic buildings. So we need more space to grow. So again, it is my hope that the council would recognize and we appreciate the recognition of the outstanding work we've done the last seven years. Let's build on that together and let's help New York City come back from this crisis. So uh, just staying on, on that um, topic as well, uh, what is the most likely uh, scenario for the future of Industry City uh, if the zoning remains the same? So kind of maybe walk us through what the as of right would be um, that you currently have. Right. We, we, we are all New Yorkers, I speak on behalf of myself and, and ownership here, um, who care deeply about this city. We're not gonna run away from the site. We're gonna keep investing, but it, comes, it becomes much harder to create the economics to allow us to grow at the same pace, even more so in an economic recession now, um, or an economic crisis, I should say. So sure, we will continue to try to attract small business, 100%. It costs a lot of money to cut up space into small units. We will continue to try to attract innovators here. But we're also gonna have to look at those things that are available to us under the heavy manufacturing zoning. So again, as I said in my testimony, if anybody looks, and I really hope the city council looks at this because to me, and I'm speaking as an individual here, this is a real crisis in New York City. These massive last mile distribution facilities, many of which are getting built in Red Hook and Sunset Park as we speak, but also MassPath, excuse me, MassPath in Queens, the South Bronx, where you take a tractor trailer, you drive into a 250,000 square foot building, you go up one floor, three floors, four floors with a tractor trailer. You pick up the electric toothbrush that somebody ordered at 10 a.m. and deliver it to their neighborhood by 2 p.m. just because we all need it the same day. That is not healthy economic development in my view. That puts more trucks on the street, that much more puts more pollution in our neighborhoods, it causes more traffic. So I would argue that the diversity of uses we have, the ecosystem of uses we have, which of course will include some e-commerce, but won't be overly dependent on it, is what we need to be incentivized to do. And to do that, you need to have an eclectic mixture of uses. You need to have more flexibility on academic and other things. So that is, that is one track. The other track is that under M3, and again, what we're talking about here is a zoning that was designed in 1950, 1960, for the days of the smokestacks, where you wanted to have things like tanneries, chemical plants, asphalt plants, nuclear waste storage, away from where people lived, away from other businesses. We don't live in 1950 or 1960, we live in 2020, okay? You can have those things near to each other in safe and environmentally sustainable ways. So that's the eclectic kind of ecosystem we're looking to build. But under the M3, you can also do pure office. So tomorrow, if somebody wanted to lease the whole place for an office complex, they could do it. Again, that's not our vision. We're proud that we have grown manufacturing here. That's part of why innovation companies that may look more like tech or design or office wanna be here also. They wanna be in that environment. I know that you may not have had, had too many projects come before you like this, but that is the reality of what is what is working for us and by the way, it's what worked for me at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Thank you. So you had brought up the um, question about gentrification and I wanna kind of get into that um, yep. a little bit right now. Uh, we know that this has been a growing concern throughout the city, um, but mostly the community 
uh, has concerns about gentrification uh, in general. And they're also concerned that uh, the new commercial businesses are going to attract a new workforce of uh, higher income workers who uh, will help drive up local housing costs. Uh, let's get into some of the numbers here. What's the current mix of uh, the types of business tenants at Industry City? And what are the current ranges of rents at Industry City? Sure. We have um, about a million square feet of warehouse distribution today. We have about a million square feet of manufacturing. We have about 900,000 square feet of office. We have about 400,000 square feet of art and design. And we have about 120,000 square feet of retail. So uh, that is a very eclectic and interesting mixture of spaces. And by the way, for any of the members on the phone who haven't visited, I would love to walk you through this campus. You certainly are allowed to do it on your own, but uh, I would love to take you through it. Um, the, rain, the rent range is incredibly broad. The bulk of the rents are between 15 and $30 a square foot, but they go as low as $12 a square foot and as high as 40. And by the way, those rents happen to be fairly in line with the rents in recently developed spaces at places like the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And do, that, do they vary um, based on the type of business? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, but th there's not a, there's not a straight rule. Um, typically you would think, um, that warehouse distribution would pay, uh, the least. Um, but today in industrial, as I just said, that's paying the most exponential increases in the last 10 years on last mile warehouse distribution, exponential, um, Certainly for spaces that are more design and engineering um, uh, that you walk into and people are on computers, but they're 3D printers or plotters in the corner, um, they're likely to be paying on the higher end. Absolutely. So you, you have a range. And so just going back to, to sort of the, the ongoing concern that, um, you know, this will sort of displace many of the businesses and, and uh, local communities. Do you think it's uh, fair to argue that the gentrification is part of the development vision proposed here? And kind of how do you respond to those arguments? Um, and I know you touched a little bit of, uh, 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 on that during your presentation, but maybe walk me through that one more time. Yeah. So. I will say this, and I've been saying this for a long time publicly, both at this position and when I was at the ABR. But to me, the answer to gentrification, which is very real, um, a concern for all of us who live in New York, and I'm a lifelong New Yorker, um, we need to maintain the diversity of our neighborhoods. But the way you do that is by creating, particularly in places like the Bronx and Queens and Brooklyn, particularly along the waterfront where you've seen growth, you need to build affordable and workforce housing near to where the jobs are being created. So there's been very little affordable and workforce housing built in the area near to industry city. I hope that going in the future, uh, there will be the commitment to do that, but that's gonna require density as well. And so that's gonna take real leadership and I, and I hope that that happens. But the answer to gentrification is not slowing down and killing jobs, particularly jobs that are accessible in the broadest possible way and create pathways to careers that will give people the incomes to give them more opportunity to choose where they live. It is certainly in our interest to have this property to remain a heavy walk to work property. That is in the business's interest. That is candidly a big reason that we set up the innovation lab so that we were pre-screening, placing, in some cases, training folks from the surrounding zip codes to come to work. All of our tenants love the fact that they're hiring locally, but they're not just doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it because it's really smart business. If you're hiring somebody local who has a small, a short commute, particularly a walk to work, 
They're much more likely to stay in their job more than six months. That helps the business, that helps the landlord. So uh, the city has invested hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in industrial economic development uh, on the Sunset Park waterfront. Uh, how do you see the future uh, of Industry City in relation to this public investments um, at sites like the Brooklyn Army Terminal, Bush Terminal, uh, mm -hmm. SDMT, uh, and many of the public and community plans that call for this waterfront to remain focused uh, just on industrial uses? Yeah, um, I am obviously a huge fan of what happened at the Navy Yard, but it hasn't just happened there. It's also happened at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, and now it's happening at Bush Terminal just south of Industry City, where government, our tax dollars, are invested heavily, heavily, and cross-subsidizing, keeping industry, industrial businesses, manufacturing local and creating local pathways. That is fantastic. That's good public policy. I wish we had another 10 or 15 Brooklyn Navy Yards and Brooklyn Army terminals in New York City. That would be a great thing for New York. And I would encourage the city to identify other public sites where you can do that. Some of it's happening at Hunts Point. I wish it was happening in more locations. But New York is not going to address its issues of equity and opportunity and really tackle uh, the gentrification issue unless the private sector also invests in this space. There's not enough public money to go around and there is zero public money today, as we all know. Um, so I would argue that this kind of project is exactly what the city should be supporting directly or indirectly, both here and in other locations. I would also say that some of the success that um, the city is seeing at a place like Bush Terminal, where they recently announced uh, a huge movie studio coming there and thousands of new jobs, that's directly related to the investment that we're making in this property. People now see Sunset Park is a fantastic place to grow a business. Great local workforce, uh, great space, place where people can walk to work, a park down on the waterfront. Um, so I think these things are creative and connected. And I think the Sunset Park waterfront is one of the most exciting commercial industrial districts anywhere in the city of New York. So just going back to sort of the, you talked about density um, why the additional density, um, the ability to construct new ground uh, up buildings or rooftop additions, important to your vision, but also uh, the application states that half of the current buildings are vacant or storage. So why is any of this uh, new space needed? Sure. So the, the, the application was made many, many years ago, in part because we've deferred it uh, several times at the council member's request before deciding to go forward in the fall. Um, when I got to Industry City, we were about 70% um, occupied. 40% of that was static storage because that was the leasing strategy of, of previous ownership because they couldn't figure out how to attract the dynamism, the high employment, um, businesses of today and the future. So the easy thing to do was fill it up with boxes and take a low rent, but don't put any money in the building, let the buildings continue to, to decay. Okay, so here we are now seven years in, we've taken that 40% static warehouse, no jobs, and we've cut it in half. So that's very significant. We've leased that space to businesses that are actually creating jobs. And we've also cut into the vacancy by about 5%. So overall, the total amount of leasing we've done is about three and a half million square feet of space. That's extraordinary. And again, what I would say is that's, that is an example of what we can do. And so we are asking the city council to recognize that and say, wow, at this moment of massive unemployment and budget deficits, we need projects like this to lift not only the community, but the city 
out of this economic crisis. So let's give them the flexibility in the future that when a company or an academic institution may come along and say, hey, it doesn't work for us to be in a building that was built in, in uh, 1890. We'd like to be in a modern building, a green building, um, that we have the opportunity to build that building and, and create more jobs as a result of it. So I'm gonna get to the jobs in a second, but um, another big concern and issue that we've seen just uh, across the city is sort of big, big box uh, retail taking over, uh, displacing uh, mom and pop shops uh, throughout. Uh, here, uh, in addition to the added density, uh, the application would remove existing restrictions on the size and types of retail use. So my question is, how many square feet of retail is at Industry City today? And what's wrong with the existing zoning restrictions in your view? Um, because of the, what are the types of retails that are not allowed today that you might want to see in Industry City in the future? I know that's a Great. lot. Uh, Great question. No, I appreciate that. So we're, we're at about 120,000 square feet today. We are very restricted in the types of retail we can use, limited to under 20, uh, excuse me, under 10,000 square feet in many instances. And there's certain categories that we can't do today. So for instance, a middle market home goods uh, retailer, like a TJ Maxx, if they wanted to lease over 10,000 square feet today, uh, a broadly accessible store, I will note, they can't lease here. Uh, if we wanted to do a sporting goods store, underneath where the Brooklyn Nets has their practice facility, right? And that didn't come up in my testimony, but we're thrilled to have them here. And they have about 70,000 square feet of office space and practice facility. But if a sporting goods store came to the base of that building, they couldn't today because under the 1950s designed M3, they could sell a baseball bat, but they couldn't sell a baseball glove because a hard good would be okay in a noxious environment, but not a soft good. Okay, so these are the kinds of challenges we face. Big box retail has changed radically over the last 10 years, and that's only accelerated over the last five years. Um, so there is no danger of a massive big box investment here. And by the way, most of those stores that people might call big box, like take a target, most of them, most of any new targets that are getting built anywhere are 25,000 square feet or under. So we would be delighted in the course of this process because the council member has raised this as one of his 10 concerns that he wrote to us in September and we immediately wrote back that we can work with him on all 10 of his concerns. We are open to reducing the overall amount of retail and exploring uh, location. The overall um, goal for retail and some people have um, you know, they, they think they're very clever at describing this as a luxury mall. Well, please, please come down and take a tour with me. I think that will disabuse uh, that notion. But we are talking about overall in our plan at full build out 14% being retail. And we'd be willing to reduce that as part of this process, because that's something the council member has said is important to him. Thank you. Um, let's get to 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 the jobs here um, and kind of let's, let's clear up the numbers on that. Uh, there are currently how many jobs at Industry City? About 8,000 jobs. Okay. And how many are projected if the proposal presented today was fully um, yeah. built out? We're projecting a little over 15,000 on site and then another 8,000 off site because of all of the economic activity that is generated here. So the future with action, uh, the scenario presented today represents an addition of um, how many jobs compared to what we have today? What, what, what's that? I'm trying to do the math here. Oh, it's, so. it's the, the, the math is an additional uh, 15,000 jobs overall. 15 in total. Correct, because it goes from eight on site to 15 on site and an additional eight offsite, total of 15. So as you know, much of the argument um, that uh, people have said in favor of this proposal um, <clears throat> is based on job creations. Uh, 
but industry city, uh, you, the applicant, the property owner, um, say that the jobs would uh, provide indirectly uh, by tenants. So how are you calculating uh, the job creation estimates? And since uh, these are not jobs directly generated by industry city, uh, you can't truly guarantee that these jobs will exist, correct? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, you're saying that uh, if we get approved for this rezoning and we don't invest anything or build any new buildings, maybe the jobs won't grow. Is that what you're, no, is that so it, again? Based on, right. So uh, the jobs that are being provided are indirect by the tenants that you bring in, right? Uh -huh. So yep. therefore the tenants that are coming in, you're not providing those jobs directly. They Correct. are. Okay. That's so right. how are you calculating uh, your job creation estimates? How are we calculating the job creation estimates? Got it. So um, they were based on track record, right? So when we, when we filed this application, we had a blend of jobs that was not dissimilar. There were lower numbers, but the numbers that I just gave you, the mixture of manufacturing, office, design, art, and we projected out into the future using a RIMS model. This is very common. This is part of our EIS and done by uh, HRNA for us. And that's something we were required to do uh, within the EIS. Um, and that's how we came up with those projections for the future, because we expect the blend of uses to come. So a few things there. Somebody might say, well, um, what, what prevents you from just eliminating all of the manufacturing, right? Manufacturing has changed radically in the last 15 years. What happens in 10 years when everything is AI or, or uh, robotics? Well, we hear that. And we believe that manufacturing is a key part of our ecosystem, but we're willing to put skin in the game here. So what we're saying and what we're prepared to sign, part of this would, could be in the zoning, part of it could be in a legally binding uh, CBA, but as we add new retail that we can't do today, as we add new buildings that we can't do today, through a formula, we would preserve <laughs> manufacturing space, right? Going forward. On top of that, we would provide space for a local not for profit to operate at Industry City, similar to what GMDC has done. If you guys have been to GM, GMDC spaces, it's extraordinary. They're a mission-driven not-for-profit that leases to primarily manufacturers and makers. So we would have that outpost here. If for some reason in the future, we fell below the overall amount that we're prepared to commit to, which is in the many hundreds of thousands for manufacturing space, that we couldn't lease it for a year, then the not-for-profit could come in and take over that space and try to lease it for the next year. If they could lease it, fantastic, it stays. If they can't lease it, I think that suggests that manufacturing is possibly gone. So then that space will come back to us. So that's one scenario that ensures the diversity of uses going forward. So let's talk about jobs and how it's related to the future. So I think our numbers are pretty extraordinary of what we've done to date. But as I said in my testimony, okay, you need more proof and you need more commitments to ensure that in the future for us or any future owner, there will continue to be that mix of walk to work and local folks getting jobs across every sector, not just retail, but innovation jobs, manufacturing jobs, every sector we have. I hear you, Andrew. I just, I, I guess what I'm, 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 I'm trying to get at is like, since these jobs uh, are not uh, directly generated by an industry yep. city, yeah. You can't truly guarantee that these jobs will exist, correct? I don't know that anybody can make that guarantee. Yeah, any, any, any landlord that's leasing commercial space could make the guarantee that they will, that they will lease every single space. I, I don't. Well, I guess it's, you know, how are we going to achieve this 15,000 uh, new jobs that are coming in here? Right. I guess considering that, that like, how can... Uh, the city hold uh, industry city accountable 
for the economic benefits that are being promised. Um, and also with that, would you be willing to work with a third party, perhaps a city agency, EDC, SBS to monitor and publish uh, jobs data? 100%. And I, I apologize for going on too long and not answering it. The, 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 the finish, the, just to finish my point before, because I think it's important, uh, Mr. Chair, is that on the jobs, and this is something we announced yesterday, that in the future, we will not be able to fully utilize the things we get out of this rezone. We will not be able to fully utilize the, the retail that we can't do today. We'll not be able to fully utilize the new buildable unless we can demonstrate through a third party, and it could be a city agency or wherever the city or community decides um, along with us as an independent arbiter of this, that the jobs are continuing to go local across all um, job type. Um, so I'm gonna just stick to this for, for, for just a couple more minutes. Um, so the, the question we ask about sort of the economic development proposal, um, according to the information that you have provided, 35% of the people uh, who work at Industry City uh, come from the surrounding uh, neighborhoods. Um, and one in five Sunset Parkers who live and work in Sunset Park work at Industry City. Um, my question is, what is the source of this information? Um, and sort of how much of, uh, well, one, just tell me what the source of that information is first. Sure. We did an extensive survey toward the end of 2017. So after four and a half years of heavy investment and job growth, I think we're at about 6,500 jobs then. We're now at 8,000. Um, it was a statistically relevant survey and went across every sector. So proportionally, again, as I laid out what we have today, we got a certain number of warehouse distribution companies, a certain amount of manufacturing companies, a certain amount of, of what might be called office or, or art and tech. Um, and we surveyed them. Um, and we did that again with uh, our colleagues at HRNA and we got individuals to fill out data. And then we also got zip code data from those companies. And so the analysis of that data showed that about 35% came up from the surrounding zip codes. Now that's South Brooklyn, that includes Red Hook, includes Sunset Park, includes the other um, zips surrounding Sunset Park. Um, and I will say at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, we had a very similar statistical um, set of data going to the neighborhoods around the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's just the reality of these big industrial campuses that it's really smart to recruit and hire locally from the local community. Um, so much of Industry City's uh, branding um, has been focused on uh, the innovation economy. Um, but people of color remain highly underrepresented uh, in both the technology and creative sector, uh, like arts and design. Um, while uh, only 35% of the total uh, New York City workforce uh, is non-Hispanic, white, 51% uh, of computer engineering, science occupations, and 65% of the arts and design, entertainment, and media occupation are held by uh, white New Yorkers, according to the most recent available census data. So how do you see your role as a landlord of millions of square feet in working class majority minority neighborhoods in addressing this disparity? Yep. It's a, it's a really great question. I appreciate it. Um, that same survey, by the way, showed that over 60% of the folks uh, who work here are people of color. 70% come from Brooklyn. And nearly- Andrew, Can I ask you to pause real quick? That yeah. we are, we're just having some technical difficulties right now. I'm sorry, sure. just gonna take a quick pause until we able to fix this.
So we, we've paused for a moment uh, just to ensure that our closed captioning uh, is working. Great. So should I proceed? G g give me one second before I get okay. the green light and then. Got it. So while we're waiting to um, get our closed captioning up, I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, we know that a lot of members uh, of the public have signed up uh, to speak and we're eager to hear from all of you. So we really appreciate your patience, um, but we understand if you are not uh, able to uh, uh, stay on, uh, we ask that you please email your testimony uh, to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, and uh, we'll come back to you as soon as we get the clearance. So uh, our meeting will now stand at ease until we figure out uh, this problem. Um, and then we will come back um, momentarily. Thank you. Okay, um, we're now gonna uh, proceed. We're, we're able to resume. Uh, we have our closed captioning um, issue solved. And so, uh, Andrew, I, I don't know if you want me to ask you the question again, or if you, you're, I, I, I know you might've lost. Uh, some... I, I, uh, I heard the question and I really appreciate the question. It's something I feel like I've 
dedicated the last 15 years of my life to. Um, so I feel strongly about it. Um, so this issue of making sure that a diverse pipeline is coming into the sectors that are relevant to New York City's economy today and in the future could not be more important. Um, so I agree 100% on that. So uh, there, is no, there is no silver bullet here. It is gonna be really hard work on a lot of different fronts and a lot of different programs. Um, some of the programs I've worked on included at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, where we set up with Brooklyn Workforce Innovations, a not-for-profit that works in Brooklyn, both at the Navy Yard and now with me at Industry City, that would do um, production training assistant programs to get folks with limited educational backgrounds into union pathways in the film and television industry. That's one example. Also at the Brooklyn Navy Yard through the uh, through the new vocational high school there. Again, if you go there, some of it is traditional manufacturing, but there's a space where young people learn about uh, design. There's a space where people learn about post-production uh, and innovation. There's a space where people learn about coding. And then there's a space where people learn about culinary careers, all vocational, all working, all experiential. And again, we hope to replicate that school at Industry City. And again, all credit to... Councilmember Manchaka, who's pushed that concept, and, and we fully agree. Other programs here that we have run through the Innovation Lab include um, cloud computing training done by Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, a cybersecurity training program working with young women at Sunset Park High School, an engineering internship that's been working with about 25 Sunset Park students, high school students, over multiple years to train them to get into uh, the engineering sector. These are the real challenges. Getting into those sectors needs to start very early on in education, even before high school, but we can accelerate that by embedding these schools in industry city, high schools and colleges and universities, particularly schools like CUNY, to create the pathways for the diverse set of New Yorkers that we all want to see succeed there. Um, I would say entrepreneurship is another key area uh, among folks of color to support them, nurture them. It's something we've tried to do through the Innovation Lab. We would love to do more of, and I am all ears for folks who have really successful programs in their districts to see where we can learn there, but we're working very hard on that issue. Thanks. And now on, on the other hand, uh, the workforce, sort of the more traditional industrial jobs, manufacturing, construction, transportation, maintenance, repair, et cetera, uh, is over 80% people of color. And again, this just brings me uh, back to the question, um, how can we ensure that uh, that industrial business uh, will have a place long term uh, at Industry City. Yeah, and I'll, I'll highlight again the two key areas there because they're very unique. But one is we don't get to benefit from this rezoning unless we're also setting aside manufacturing space. So those two things are going to be linked. So again, some of, the, some of those manufacturing businesses will be higher end manufacturing. Some of them will be much more accessible assembly line where folks who just have a GED or a high school degree can get access. And we have a blend of both. And again, we're prepared to embed a not-for-profit like a GMDC in our campus to ensure uh, that they also have the opportunity to bring companies like that here. And sticking with the, 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 the job from here, are you committed to providing good paying jobs at this site? And what have you done to secure uh, those? Uh, we're very committed to that. And I would say you're going to hear later today, um, both from the building trades and from 32BJ about their strong support uh, for this project. So I think nothing speaks louder than that in terms of creating good paying union jobs. Uh, secondly, I would say that, you know, the kinds of sectors that we are developing here, not all, but a considerable portion of them do pay more than $50,000 a year entry level with career pathways. 
And so again, to go back to your preceding question, the, the, the key challenge, the key metric is how do we make sure local folks and a diverse set of folks are accessing those jobs? And that's something we're prepared uh, to work on together. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I just got one, uh, I got two more questions and then I'll, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague. Um, we've noted that the development um, will undertake, the development uh, will be undertaken without the expenditure of public funds. Uh, but I just wanna clear up some things here. So if you could just bear with me and, and we'll walk through this. Um, there are tax exemptions, uh, tax breaks that Industry City is receiving, correct? That we, we receive ICAP, that is correct. Um, almost always in economic development projects like this, um, particularly if it involves public land, there are direct expenditures of public money, meaning public capital money, over a billion dollars at the Navy Yard, same at, at Brooklyn Army Terminal. There is no money of that sort going into this project. We are benefiting from ICAP, which any business that is adaptively reusing old buildings um, is likely to be benefiting from, particularly if they're building and creating jobs in the outer boroughs. Right, so the only uh, tax exemption that you're currently receiving is ICAP. Correct, we benefit from energy cost savings program as well, which is an energy cost saving program directly uh, targeting industrial and, and manufacturing businesses. Would you know what the estimated value of that is? I can't. I have that. Uh, yeah, I don't have that off the top of my head, but, but this is, let me try to explain this in the most simple terms and why these programs are, are valuable. So um, private investment wouldn't be made in these buildings if there wasn't some certainty about uh, property tax rate going forward. So what ICAP does is incentivizes your investment that then benefit the businesses that are brought in because it creates the space that can be used by that business. And then those businesses pay taxes, right? As well as the landlord. So the overall tax impact to the city uh, far exceeds um, any increased property tax that might have happened uh, due to those investments because the investments wouldn't have happened without them. Okay, so in our case, we're talking about a situation where as a result of being able to lock in taxes, we're investing $400 million. That's creating lots of jobs and businesses. Those businesses pay taxes and ultimately this is gonna create $100 million a year in annual tax revenue for the city. And lastly, are those exemptions important to the economic success uh, of the complex? 100%, and, and I think many of you have heard um, broadly the business community, chambers of commerce across the city coming together every few years when these programs are up for renewal, saying how critical they are, as well as the businesses that actually benefit from them that wouldn't otherwise have been able to move here if it wasn't for those incentives. Okay. Um, and just uh, lastly, as in, in prior testimony um, and comments, Industry City has stated the willingness to remove the hotel aspect of the development. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And uh, also CUNY has expressed an interest in locating uh, an academic use at Industry City. Uh, is there any uh, conversations happening there? What I can say is pre-COVID, we were having very positive conversations that had gone on for several years. Um, we were very optimistic. Obviously they are facing a major budget crisis like every other entity is, economic crisis. Um, so those are on hold for the moment, but I am quite confident um, that they will restart um, particularly once the economy restarts. And, you know, we all hope that is relatively soon, but let's assume there's a vaccine in the next six months. And maybe by this time next year, things are starting to move back to normal, but we're very optimistic uh, that there will be an opportunity to partner 
with CUNY. And it's for the same reason I, that I said, all of these schools that have approached us over the years, their students want the experiential learning that comes being bed, embedded in a innovation district like this. And this is my last question. Um, the borough president, the community board recommended modifying uh, zoning to ensure that the finger uh, buildings that are privately owned but uh, publicly accessible, uh, the streets, the courtyards, uh, remain open to the public in perpetuity. Uh, are you willing to support this? Uh, the commitment we've made is to keep the streets open. Those are privately owned streets. Uh, the courtyards we've invested enormously in and creating open green space for the community and we expect it to stay that way. I, I believe the borough president had a request that if we were to build over them at some point that it be at a certain height so that the open public space um, could remain in place. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Kimball. Uh, I um, now want to acknowledge that we have been joined by uh, Chair Salamanca. Um, and I want to see if uh, the chair has any questions. Moya, uh, Chair Salamanca has no questions at this time. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, for joining us. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Kimball. I want to now uh, turn it over to uh, Council Member Menchaca, and I just want to, again, uh, remind everyone, my colleagues, uh, Council Member Menchaca will have uh, 10 minutes, but everyone else uh, will have a five-minute uh, uh, time limit. Um, and uh, I appreciate your patience um, and all those that uh, are waiting as well to testify. So thank you. And I now turn it over uh, to my colleague, uh, Council Member Menchaca for questions. Time begins now. Thank you, Chair, for those questions. I think have highlighted uh, a lot of the, not just concerns, but ideas that we've been uh, going back and forth on. And so I'm gonna use my time just to kind of pin down couple more pieces in the areas around jobs, uh, the Community Benefits uh, Coalition, and a couple other items. Uh, Andrew, Ethan, and Jesse, good to see you all. It's been a while since we've been in the room again. And so I want to say thank you for being here today. Uh, specifically, uh, you, um, Andrew, uh, you have done an incredible work uh, in Brooklyn. To, to do great by the community and manufacturing. And so I, I just wanna start by saying, I know that you come with a lot, of, a lot of good work and I not only appreciate that, but I've seen that. Um, the conversation that's, that's happening today uh, in some ways respects that, but will confront uh, the place that you're in right now, a private, a private application. And so I'm glad that we're gonna be having this discussion. Um, you've talked a lot about jobs. Uh, in fact, I think your whole presentation really uh, asks us to give you what you want because of these jobs. And so I want to get a better sense about some of those pieces as we understand the future that you're painting for us. Um, how many people directly work for Industry City today? Directly. Uh, Chair Moya really spoke about the fact that you're a landlord, and so it's hard to really count right. those. But the people that you send a check to, uh, right now, I will. I will. Um, I, I'm gonna. I, I. I believe that today, we have about 80 people under our employ, and that's a mixture of folks who do leasing, design, development, folks who run the elevators, folks who do uh, demo. That's the, the general range, or folks who work on electrical systems. Um, but that's about 80 today. I will follow up in writing just to confirm that, uh, but I believe that's the number today. Wonderful. So really the bulk of the jobs are the, uh, the, the kind of expansion and on top of what you've already brought today. So the 15,000 includes the 8,000 that you have currently on campus. Correct. 7,000 more on campus, another 8,000 that comes because of the investment and the business growth here. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're really talking about 7,000 jobs on site that you are leasing. 
Let's talk about the lease really quick. I know that we've had a lot of conversations about how do you how do you create accountability? That's the that's the major issue here for me. Uh, we asked you to put items on the lease to require anyone that you're leasing local hiring measures. What prevented you from doing that? We are very open to a conversation about putting in leases, um, commercially reasonable uh, efforts to work with us. Um, let me just talk a little bit about that because I think this is a key point. Um, I'll just remind you that I'm on, on clock, so. Um, okay, I'll be very, very quick, I'm sorry. But just, I wanna say, both the Navy Yard and here, it's the same story. The way you are successful with workforce development and with on-site employment centers is by making it an amenity for the tenants, not a penalty. The minute a small business, you show up in a small business's space and say, you have to sign all these legally binding things or we're not gonna lease the space to you. That's the moment they say goodbye, we'll go somewhere else. Got so I think, both, I think that's, that's okay. pretty clear. So thank you for that. Okay, uh, okay. Talk about job quality and wages, uh, but my understanding is that we will be hearing from workers today, uh, later, on that have been working for over 15 years at the complex who are making $15 an hour. Um, and so I just wanna make sure that, that we understand that discrepancy and that panel will be here soon. But um, those are the kind of conversations that we need to have here and members need to understand about what's actually going on at Industry City with workers that you are directly supervising and paying. Um, I think the support of organized labor is gonna speak for itself. Great, thank you, we'll get, and we'll get to that. Um, you've talked about union agreements and so um, but if you don't employ most of the people how can we make the promises about the quality jobs and and commitment to those jobs and so uh if you can kind of just give us a quick picture about about the organized labor and the conversations you're having with them so as it relates to to the building trades and i can't go very far you're certainly welcome to ask gary LaBarbera about it uh, but they're enthusiastically supporting this because of the opportunity to build new here, which is really where um, organized labor always benefits the most. Uh, we've certainly had projects uh, that have been both union and non-union. For instance, we've spent $50 million on electrical upgrades here. That's mostly been union work. We've also spent $10 million rebuilding our streets, which was all done by a non-union minority owned MWBE from the community. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. Um, and just uh, on a date, when do you expect the construction to actually begin for all those jobs? Uh, I think it's very hard to tell you in a pandemic and an economic crisis, but even if we weren't there, I still would probably have a hard time telling you because, um, that will be at some date in the future. I can't tell you whether that's two years or five years from now. Um, but this will create the conditions, this rezoning, that when we come out of this economic crisis, we will be ready to go. It gives us the opportunity when we're talking to colleges, for instance, that maybe they don't want to be in low ceiling uh, historic buildings. They'd like modern new structures that okay. are green Thank and you. the wood plane. Thank you. Thank you for that. So um, do you believe that the 900 square feet of destination retail is supportive of an industrial district? that is designed to support industrial manufacturing businesses. You're someone that has championed this for a long time. Do you sure. think it makes sense to put together? Destination retail is uh, not an appropriate uh, description. Uh, much of this will be locally accessible retail that's not available to the community today, where in fact, folks in the community are getting in their car and driving somewhere else to make use of. So that's number one. We expect a lot of people will be coming on foot. Um, retail has changed radically. We'll continue to have lots of the small and maker retail. Uh, but again, the retail we're talking about, and I just want to emphasize this point for everybody on this Zoom. Today, and we've agreed to reduce it, working with you and, and the community, it's 14% of the overall plan. It is not a destination mall. But number it comes... First, right. We've, we've invested in 55 new loading docks throughout the campus that serve our industrial manufacturing tenants. You and I walked those. They will have separate loading for retail when that comes, uh, and there'll be no conflict. So I, I believe that the two, in fact, live very well together. Well, I think that's where we differ. 
Um, let's let's move. I only have two more minutes, so let's talk about the community benefits agreement and the framework that I laid out a very long time ago. Uh, goalposts have not moved. In fact, you've known what we've been wanting for a very long time, and and you were with those us in those conversations. So, do you believe that it's possible for this condition, the legally binding condition, to be met before November third, when the council's fifty day ULR clocks, you know, that's when it expires? Do you think that that's that's possible from your point of view? It's 100% possible. And of the 10 commitments you gave us, we remain committed to all 10 of them. Um, some of those can be accomplished through the rezoning, working with you and your colleagues. Uh, some of them can be achieved through the CBA. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I guess my next question is, have you been in contact with that coalition to begin discussions about that component? I can't comment on any conversations that are taking place um, at this point. Right now, I, am, I am optimistic that uh, people of goodwill will emerge who believe that it is better to have a rezoning than not have a rezoning for all of the community benefits that can result from it. So you're not going to be able to answer my colleagues today that you've had conversations or not have conversations, but you believe that an emer there will be an emergence of people that will come and sign a legally binding document. I am optimistic, yes. Okay, second is, you know if they have legal representation at this point? Can't comment on that. Got it, okay, so there's a lot of unknowns here, colleagues, uh, that are making us nervous and have made us a lot, uh, a lot of people nervous in the community. Transparency has been pretty big in this accountability question. Um, you said, okay, so here's the last question because I only have 15 more seconds. Um, you, you said it a couple times that because of your success in the past, that is the thing that we should just take for granted and give you what you need to build a flexibility to be able to do the future, uh, to, to kind of bring the future of the working world. I'm right? inspired. And so I just, I just want to go back to that framework. This framework has three pieces, the mayor's commitment, the CBA, and your commitment with days ticking to the end. How is it that you can ask us to just trust you at this point when we've known every single time when developers are in this in this position, the weakness of the final agreement leaves communities vulnerable, period. I just wanted you to be able I have put forward historic commitments uh, that will ensure that we can't fully use the things we're gonna get out of this rezoning unless we are reaching the goals that you have laid out for us and that we expect folks in a CBA would lay out for us. And without the mayor and his agencies coming in with research. I can't speak for the mayor. Okay. Well, that's it for me. Uh, I don't know if there's a second round, but uh, I just want to say thank you, Chair, for this time. Uh, and I look forward to hearing my colleagues' thank questions. As well. Thank you, Carlos. And Carlos, you can come back if you want for a second round. Or if you have a quick question now, I'll let you ask one quick question now and then we'll come back. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right. Um, I just want to um, quickly acknowledge that we have been joined by uh, council member uh, Rosenthal. And I now uh, will turn it over to um, our committee council. Ramoya, council member Rivera has a question who would be followed by council member Richards, who would be followed by council member Reynoso, who would be followed by council member Cornegy. Thank you. Council member Rivera. I begins. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you for answering all of these questions. I appreciated the brief history of Sunset Park that you gave. My grandmother actually worked in one of those factories, many, many long hours in a cosmetics factory, inhaling nail polish. Um, but she was able to provide for us. So um, I wanna ask a, a, a few questions. I'll try to breeze through it, because again, we don't have a lot of time. So I'm not trying to be short, I'm just, actually trying to be efficient. 
So since the, you mentioned in your testimony that estimates are hard considering the pandemic, but since the job projection you cite are estimates from 2017 based on pre-COVID-19 market conditions, do you still expect the jobs originally estimated to be fully created? And, and let me just like expand on that a little bit. How many companies at Industry City are fully or majority work from home at this point? And how many have committed to fully return to in-office work when COVID ends? Have any of your tenants uh, negotiated or looking to negotiate for smaller spaces or sublease based on a permanent work from home future for their company? Great, thank, thank you so much, Council Member Rivera. I appreciate your introduction. And one of the most satisfying things for me is that a number of the children of people who worked here in the 70s and 80s and some of those noxious conditions have come back after years of decay to start their own businesses here. And you'll hear from some of them later in the testimony. So in terms of what today looks like versus before COVID, you know, we've all heard about some of these midtown office buildings, you know, emptying out and maybe being at 10% of the activity they had. Uh, we're at about 40% today um, in terms of uh, people who are physically coming to the site versus working remotely. But that seems to go up every week as people get more comfortable uh, coming back in. One of the great benefits of this site and one of the reasons we turned all these old courtyards into open spaces is that people very, feel very comfortable here. We have wide open staircases, industrial staircases that go up. So you don't feel like you're getting in an elevator and going up 50 stories and not having good air circulation. So really yes, I the numbers there. Well, it's about it's about 40 percent of 8,000. So, you know, somewhere between three and 4,000 of the 8,000 are back on campus. Um, but we expect we will get back up there. There is no doubt we are going to lose some businesses. Um, but we have to go to your question about accommodating the companies. Um, and and some of the folks on the call know this well, but um, I spent almost all of my time uh, during the crisis working with the companies to first help them access PPP. Um, then as they came out of that, uh, we've had a team of, I think, 10 people working with each and every one of our companies to figure out how to help them uh, survive. And that's included a broad range. There's no cookie cutter approach, but- I, I, understand. Is I just want, I'm so sorry to do this. I, I tried sure, to- Sure, no give problem. The disclaimer. I, we're just curious as to uh, whether you have data on that and have you have any of them tried to sublease or subdivide and we'd appreciate if you would just show us the data. So do you believe that as one, if not the largest commercial landlord in Sunset Park, that you owe a responsibility to address the impacts of your presence in the community? And does that responsibility extend beyond just jobs themselves? Did you ever lo lobby the de Blasio administration to take a more active role in this rezoning around things like affordable housing or education and climate resiliency, particularly as it was a key part of Council Mem Member Menchaca's framework for negotiations? Um, yes, I have had numerous conversations with the Deputy Mayor for Economic Development. Actually, um, let, me I just add, let me just add one more thing that's, that's related. Earlier this year, Mayor de Blasio pledged to invest 57 million in the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal to help support nearby offshore wind production at the facility. Mm -hmm. Given the climate crisis and the need for a massive amount of offshore wind development in our region, we've seen a lot of coastal and river-based communities begin to produce plans to hopefully or already secure these kinds of facilities, including from Cortland, New York, Port Jefferson, New York, New London, Connecticut, and from several communities in South Jersey along the Delaware River and in Rhode Island. Why shouldn't this be a part of the South Brooklyn industrial waterfront? And do you believe heavy industry is over and cannot return to New York City? So five years ago, I put together a joint venture with Red Hook Container Terminals to bid on the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. On the cover of our proposal was the offshore wind turbines that had gone in off of Rhode Island, which were the first in the country. It took five years, we won the selection. So we now have a long-term lease for that site. We are currently in negotiations with a number of international offshore wind developers. This is coming, it will happen. We are delighted it'll be heavy industry right across the street. And there's gonna be spillover into our buildings in terms of office and R&D 
and all sorts of workforce development opportunities through our innovation lab and colleges and universities and high schools, we are thrilled. And it absolutely is compatible with what we are doing at Industry City. And can you just answer the question on, on lobbying the de Blasio administration into taking a more active role in the rezoning around affordable housing, education, and climate resiliency, particularly as it was a key part of council well, member Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. The answer is yes. <laughs> thank you. Arthur, um, who's our next? Uh... Next council member with questions is council member Richards who will be followed by council member Reynoso followed by council member Cornegie. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, chair. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and let me just start by saying, of course, you know, I'm supportive of bringing jobs uh, during a time when we're seeing unprecedented unemployment in our city. Um, but one of the challenges I also find as we talk about economic development, and I like to always talk about it in the framework of community development, and I do find that the Blasio administration not being at the table to be very disappointing during this moment when there are some legitimate concerns that we've heard from um, communities like Sunset Park around housing pressures. And I do uh, just want to frankly put out there that I believe that the de Blasio administration should be at the table to make sure that this plan is more comprehensive. So I'm hoping that as the days count down, uh, that the administration will be at the table um, working with Carlos and the community on some strategies that could strengthen um, this plan. Uh, with that being said, I, I wanted to just hop directly into um, questions around um, jobs and tracking mechanisms. Um, Andrew, I'd be interested in hearing, um, is, your, is your specific team committed to reporting mechanisms to the community on um, demographics and job information, um, perhaps on a monthly basis, biannual basis? I don't know what that looks like. I would leave that up to the coalition to figure out. But what mechanisms are you putting in place to make sure that you're transparent in where these jobs are going to? So we, we are 100% committed to that um, and are eager to work out those details with the coalition and whether it's on a monthly or an, an annual, we can leave but to, to the coalition, but we are 100% committed to that transparency and that reporting under a legally binding agreement. Right, and then the, the other thing, right, and, and, and that's important for several reasons because you know we, and, and there, there's always going to be um, some discontent when we hear from developers that jobs are for our communities. We figured out how to do, um, create this sort of framework in the Rockaways and always having an independent organization, whether it's a coalition or someone to be um, a part of this is, is, is definitely critical in, in, in ensuring that that framework and transparency is there. Um, I know that uh, Carlos did bring up some of the um, uh, the CBA stuff, when do you expect for there to be much more movement on some of the terms of agreement? So I think you did allude to um, on 10 of the 10 things, I believe that the CBA requested that you're, you're in alignment with those things. I think I, think I heard today, um, when do you anticipate more movement on those things? Uh, I am hopeful that in the not too distant future, um, but I can't give you an exact day. Okay, but I'm assuming the clock is ticking now, so you're going to be back at the table. We, we are well aware <laughs> with, with everyone, and and, and we're we'll, 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 we'll be done by the time the the council votes. <laughs> okay, and then the the other thing is in the administration, uh, EDC SBS has not been at the table currently. Is that what I heard today on on some of the machinations around um, the job strategy? Uh, we are totally open to that conversation. We do work closely with EDC on the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. Um, we're delighted with their redevelopment of the Bush Terminal. But, you know, who is the independent auditor that comes in, whether it's EDC or some other entity? Um, we're really looking to hear from um, a CBA group what they would like to see. Um, but I also think that Councilmember Member Menchaca's voice is critical here in terms of what he would like to see. 
And then on the green jobs front, um, just just go into that a little bit more because I know that there is a counter proposal on creating much more, you know, green jobs. Um, what are you thinking about in terms there? Is there room to um, have conversations with some of those folks who want to see um, more green jobs opportunities at the site? Um, and is there a willingness to also have that conversation? Anybody who's worked with me over the last 15 years knows that I'm willing to sit down and have a conversation at any time, any place, as it relates to creating uh, commercial manufacturing, industrial jobs, particularly green jobs. The definition of what a green job is has evolved radically on the, over the 15 years. So, you know, I'm proud that the Navy Yard is a national model for that. The truth is a lot of companies who have incorporated triple bottom line or sustainable goals do not define themselves as green manufacturers anymore. That's a bit of a vestige of, you know, 10 years ago. However, this offshore wind thing is real and extraordinary and something that, that he's going to hear more about. And so we are deeply committed to that. Um, and anybody who can bring us a green job, please come and meet with me. I'm delighted to lease to any company that will do that or any not-for-profit that can help leverage that. Well, thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. We look forward to continuing the work ahead uh, with you and Carlos and other folks to make sure we we really, during this time, when we need to see some movement um, in economic development, that that's happening. So look forward to continued conversation. Thank you. And working alongside everybody. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, um, I now call up Council Member Reynoso for questions. Time begins now. Good afternoon, Andrew. I hope you're doing well. Thank you. You too. Uh, so, Andrew, I think you know my resume when it comes to manufacturing, probably more than a lot of people uh, on this call right now, um, on this Zoom call right now. So, um, you know, I'm going to uh, stay, stay away from, I guess, the, the resume situation here. Um, and let's just get to like brass tacks. Um, and I think that uh, the jobs, you said it's 15,000 now. It went from 20,000, now it's 15,000. And of those, I wanted to ask, are you gonna lose the jobs that you currently have if you don't rezone industry city? That's uh, a great question. Um, it is hard to know, but you will hear uh, some of the manufacturers who decided to keep their facilities at industry city and in Sunset Park um, and keep them at, at industry city um, because they bought into the vision um, that we have pushed and been executing on for seven years. And a key part of that vision um, is the rezoning. So I, I can't tell you, I can't look into a magic ball, um, but uh, the rezoning is the best way to ensure that a robust manufacturing sector. State. Right, right, Andrew, I, I, trust, I trust in the, your leadership and the work that you do um, that uh, you're either gonna retain these 7,000 jobs um, to, to some degree, or you're looking to retain them, but I just don't know that, uh, you know, adding them to the projected 8,000 jobs that you're going to be getting as like this cumulative total um, that we would get from this rezoning is, uh, is honest. I think it's misleading, I guess. I'm not saying anyone's lying. I just think it's misleading. We're talking about 7,000 jobs. Um, and I want to be clear that 7,000 jobs is, is a serious number already uh, in and alone of itself. But everyone's throwing out this 20,000 number and it's just not true. So, you know, I, other council members are going to get on this call and talk about 20,000 jobs. Just don't do it. It's 7,000 jobs projected. And given the time that we're in right now, there's no one that can say that you're going to get those 7,000 or 8,000 jobs added um, year after. We don't know what industry is going to look like. The economy could be changing significantly and the needs of, 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 of businesses are going to change. And you're going to have to have some flexibility as to how you like how you work through that. But this eight thousand, the jobs number is just something that is just so. Uh, I think it would be naive for any council member to think that a number that's thrown out projections, specifically by the applicant, is something that we should trust solely in itself. But Andrew, I don't blame you. I, I think you're trying. I actually do think you're trying to figure this out. I just don't like when people mislead, and I'm not saying you're doing that. I think uh, people are trying to make this argument um, with malintentions are misleading. But I would say that your biggest problem, Andrew, is Mayor de Blasio. Um, it's sad that a community is going to have to suffer at the interests of a private applicant 
um, to, to solve many of the issues that Sunset Park is going through, specifically resilience. Resiliency. Resiliency is a big problem. And the city not entering here is actually going to put your investment in jeopardy and is going to and is moving away from uh, the needs that the city is going to have long term. So I think that it would be unwise for the city council to move on a, pli a private application that is going to leave out the opportunity for investment on city infrastructure or city infrastructure work. It's just not happening here. And, and I think that's to your loss, but it's the truth, Andrew. Um, you are in a floodplain. Sunset Park has huge issues when it comes to resiliency and none of them have been addressed. But one thing that is going to be addressed is your application gets to fly through. And I just don't think that that's equitable and fair. So for me, it's just like, be careful with these job numbers. We've seen them thrown around all over the place. Um, usually the statistics and the data comes from the applicants themselves. Um, and uh, I think the biggest failure we have here is our planning process that is not comprehensive and that's gonna let Sunset Park down. I mean, either way, because nothing is happening um, under this administration. So I guess that was more of a statement, Andrew. Um, and as of now, it would, I would be hard pressed to vote on this application unless I see significant in investment and um, uh, entrance of city agencies um, into this process. Thank you. And Andrew, you can take the rest of my time to, to, to speak to my statement, I guess, if you want to. Okay, thank you, council member. And, and I have a lot of respect for the advocacy you've done in your district around manufacturing. But let me address resiliency first. This is private property. We have to make it resilient. So a huge portion of the $400 million we've spent has been related to resiliency. We've moved the electrical out of the basements, the basements that were flooded with 20 million gallons of uh, water during Storm Sandy. At $50 million, we've moved all of that to the roofs. We're replacing 15,000 windows with energy efficient windows. We replaced all the boiler systems with low impact energy efficient systems. We are doing the largest adaptive reuse project of this kind for an industrial commercial use anywhere in the country. The most sustainable, environmentally friendly thing you can do is adaptively reuse a building. Any new building will be built out of the floodplain. And on top of that, we're helping to bring green offshore wind jobs across the street. As it relates to jobs, the fact of the matter is that an EIS requires you to give a 10 year projection of where you're gonna be by the time you have full built. That's based partly on your track record to date and par partly on economic modeling going forward. I think that the jobs we've created to date is not something to be scoffed at, but something to be looked at and said, how can we help that business create more jobs? And that's what we're asking the council to do at this time of economic crisis. Thank you, uh, Council Member Reynoso. Um, I now uh, call on Council Member Cornegy. Time begins now. Thanks, Chair Moyer and the members of the subcommittee for allowing me to offer my perspective on the industry, industry city's land use items before the subcommittee this morning. The severity of the crisis we're in shows up plainly in the Labor Department job figures. In the New York City region, we've suffered staggering job losses resulting in 19.8 percent unemployment rate uh, in, in just general, but in black and brown communities, almost 50% uh, unemployment for black and brown uh, men. Um, our region suffered 13,000 job losses in manufacturing, 35,800 job losses in other services, and 110,000 job losses in professional and business services. And that's only a sampling of the sectors the Labor Department reports, with the other sectors faring no better. A sampling of the hundreds of thousands of severely, severely impacted by the dual COVID and economic crises we face. Those crises are part of the frame I urge my colleagues to consider when examining these industry city land use items before us today. We as a council are in a position to drive the hardest bargain we can on behalf of the constituents we represent, including and not limited to those of Sunset Park. And at the same time, we as a council are in a position to be a catalyst for job creation now. Now the numbers, uh, I was never naive. I understood that the numbers were uh, 
upwards of seven to 8,000 literally on the campus, but I'm also aware of the ancillary impact of job creation on the immediate community. So I don't know what those numbers are, and these are projections, so I was never um, naive about that. Moreover, Industry City offers us the opportunity to use the success of the STEAM program or the STEAM Center as a model for providing on-ramps into science, tech, engineering, and arts careers. Let's help ensure our community residents and our young people receive the education and training that mean that they are a part of making industry cities a success. Um, I, I'm, I'm really, I wanted to ask, I wanted to make a statement and ask a question, but I was given five minutes, so I'll stop my statement there and ask a question. In light of the uh, need to change the zoning to bring SUNY and our CUNY campuses onto the campus at Industry City, can you tell me, Andrew, what is your um, what is your commitment there, and what's your vision for having that educational uh, on ramp for local residents of the Sunset Park community? Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, this is what I call the the ideal intersection of good public policy and good real estate. We have a lot of space we need to lease. Colleges and universities can take a lot of space. Um, it's good po public policy because we are committed to embedding those campuses in the overall ecosystem, which means connecting it to the companies here, whether through internships, guest lectures, tech transfer, creating economic pathways for young people in the neighborhood. Uh, I really appreciated what you said about the STEAM Center. And again, that is something we're fully committed to do. So you have both high school level and college, potentially community college and full four year um, and very high level uh, R&D, all going on in the same place. Um, it is smart for us as a landlord to make these kinds of um, commitments. We saw the success at the Navy Yard, but we also have seen it in Pittsburgh, in Philadelphia, in Baltimore, in other innovation districts across the country. This synergy between innovation companies, colleges and universities and high schools, most of them, by the way, that have a local hotel right there, a business hotel, which we're prepared to give up. So we are fully committed to that. And by the way, council member, we're willing to put those commitments into a legally binding um, uh, CBA with part of the annual reporting, the transparency being what steps have you taken with that high school or with those colleges and universities to connect them to young people in the community and create pathways. For Andrew, uh, in my last 54 seconds, what I'd like to say is I've been committed to making it into cities of success as I was formerly the chair of small business and now currently the chair of housing and build buildings. I believe that success as a site for entrepreneurship, success as a site for education, success as a site for providing greater opportunities in all our shared communities. And we can look out for the residents of Sunset Park, the residents of bed -Stuy and Crown Heights, and all the communities we collectively represent. That's why I believe that this is the right project to support in these challenging times. Thank you. And I just want to change the narrative that I'm against my colleague and friend, Carlos Machaca. I am for progress and promoting building capacity in these industrial parks that we have to provide jobs and pathways to good jobs, which is why I support uh, the labor movement in this. And you will hear from some labor leaders later. So thank you. Thank you. I'm expired. Thank you, uh, Council Member Carnegie. Um, before I let you go, uh, Council, are there any other members uh, with questions for the applicant panel? Uh, if so, please raise your hand. Moya, checking right now. Chair Moya, Council Member Menchaca has uh, raised his hand for a question, uh, followed by Council Member Rivera. And I'll turn it over to you, Council Member Menchaca. Thank you uh, for the second round. And uh, Andrew, what has what has failed in your ability to gain support from the local elected officials, the congressional members? State Senator Zellner Myrie, uh, the incoming elected officials that were just elected, what has what has caused your failure in gaining support of the district leaders in our community? 
So I would argue actually that we have very strong support at the community level. You and I have talked about this in the past. I think that for uh, average folks, they're concerned about their economic future. They want a place to go to work and they want the jobs of the future for their kids. I just want to, I just want to. And so I'm very proud that Senator Montgomery uh, will be testifying today. Um, I understand that we're at a moment in time when it is very hard for any elected official to support a private development project. That is the moment we're in. Um, so I get it, the bar is high. Um, I, this kind of project actually sets the bar high for any future developer for exactly the kinds of things that you care about. Well, I, I just, I, I just want to let everybody know that the bar was set high by me and the local elected officials and the community, not necessarily by you who are trying to meet that, but that's failed. And I just want to let everybody know that the bar was set high, but we did not reach it with all the different entities that needed to come in to ensure accountability. And that's what's failed. And there are many people who are going to be testifying today. And I hope you stay around to listen to everybody because it's an important piece of this larger conversation. Now, let's talk about one of those pieces because the accountability is not just coming from you. We spread that accountability to the community and the mayor's office. How do you stand here and talk about a school blossoming on the campus if the DOE, the SCA, the mayor have yet to and have rejected, and I'll be suspect if they come and say we want to do something now on the school itself? How does that how does that happen? And how can anyone stand with credibility? I'm not gonna speak for any of them. But what I will say is that we're prepared to put in a legally binding CBA that we will remain committed to having that DOE no, school when the resources become available and we come out of an economic crisis. And so we keep hearing a lot about that, but not a lot of there there when you're talking about not being able to speak on the coalition, a coalition where we have been demanding transparency from the very beginning and ensuring that they were talking to community. So now you're, you're, you're kind of speaking to this back room that will emerge without any communication with me about that or the community. This is- I'm suspect. always available to sit down, Carlos, 24 seven. Andrew, I'm asking you right now to tell us, but you can't. This is, this is the nature and the breaking point of this entire application. My, mem my, my, my colleagues are asking questions that you can't answer. My colleagues are asking for things that they want to see as well, but it is the community that will hold you accountable. And that, that's, the, that's the nature of the breaking point that we're trying to expose right now. Um, and so I think that's going to be my, my, um, uh, my kind of continued conversation with members about, about that nature. Now, if you can, I'll give you another opportunity. How is this going to come together? And what are your conversations with the local community coalition that you see, you see as emerging? There's plenty of time between now and when the council votes to come I mean, up with a legally binding CBA if I mean, people of goodwill step up, including yourself, to try to make that happen. And the unfortunate nature of that is that I, that's, this is what I did not want. Members uh, across time and council have waited for that last 12 hours to compile everything. This is a massive application. And, and my, my whole point is that we do not want to have these last 12 hours dictate 90% of the things that the community is gonna want. This is why we started with the framework from the very beginning. And so it's hard for me to hear you talk about how you're moving forward, you're pressuring this forward without those other pillars that you agreed to. The mayor's not here, we don't know when that's gonna happen and, or, and, and the suspect to that in the nature of this budget. And then the community uh, coalition that is working so hard that asked you to stop this re uh, the rezoning. And in October, you said, sorry, I think we're going to have to move forward. Can you deny that? That myself and the coalition and many community members are saying, we're not ready to engage. We need more time to build a legally binding structure to be able to have something. And you decided to move forward instead. We've been having this conversation since... 2013, uh, leading up to certification in February of 19. Um, 
Community Board 7 sponsored town halls in the community on July 23rd, August 13th, September 17th, and October 1st. We then delayed the application at your request. So then the next year, town halls were July 17th, July 22nd, July 29th, September 16th, and October 3rd. You sent me a letter on September 19th with 10 requirements. I responded within 48 hours that we this, can meet all those requirements. This is what accountability, accountability looks like. And the moment that it gets tough and the moment that your investors are getting nervous, you went in another direction. You are correct. In 2013, we started having conversations before I even was um, uh, inaugurated to become the council member. We sat down and started talking about this vision, a vision that was already cooked and was already being presented to the community. And, and that began your uh, your communications plan to the community and you have yet to gain the confidence of the people who are representing this community and the community board that was split with tension and insane amounts of changes to the application and city investment. We are presenting to you the plan and I want my colleagues to understand that that we have been working so hard to try to figure out how we keep accountability at the top of this entire process and that has failed. And so anything that gets constructed in the next few days, as we lead to the Euler clock, will have failed. And accountability is what we can go back to our community and bring jobs and all the promises that you're talking about. And so it is not enough, Andrew, that you're coming with your history and this idea that the success of the last few years is enough. It is not enough. It is not enough and it cannot continue to be enough. The 1970s and the financial crisis that we saw in the city offered opportunities for private corporations to come in and get us out. That's only created more divide between the people who have and who have not. And so I just hope that we can continue to be honest with each other here. And I think you're failing to do that as you speak to conversations that you cannot reveal today with transparency about what's gonna happen. And that should, that should raise flags for all my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Menchaca. Uh, I now am going to turn it over to uh, Council Member <clears throat> Rivera uh, for some questions. Time begins now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for answering our questions. Earlier, you responded to a question uh, from Chair Moya regarding how much you've leased at the current industry city buildings. You said the council should be proud to hear you've leased 300 million square feet of space, but that's only half of the total space, right? No, we've leased about three and a half million square feet. Um, that's of 5.3 million square feet leasable today, a substantial portion of that 1.8 million square feet left cannot be leased today because it's decrepit and falling down. So that's gonna require enormous investment, um, which is part of the rationale for the rezoning. And considering the size and scope of the project and earlier in your presentation, you did mention trying to address the community's concerns on gentrification, do you believe you should be developing affordable housing alongside the project or at the very least, strongly advocating for public investment in affordable housing? I absolutely have been advocating for that. And I've been speaking at every single one of the town halls about the importance of leadership around uh, affordable and workforce housing near to industry city. And I would make the same argument for every other commercial center outside of Manhattan, that that's exactly what we need right near where the jobs are. But I haven't seen that yet. Um, and I'll continue to advocate for that. I am not an affordable housing developer. My partners are not affordable housing developers, but I, there are a lot of very good ones in New York City. Agreed, and the collaboration, I'm sure, is something that you could both benefit from in terms of just perception and real investment. So just to get a, a clear definition of, of local hiring requirement, I know we've talked about this a bit at length today, but there have obviously been thousands of New Yorkers who have moved into this neighborhood over the past decade, plus as part of a wave of gentrification that's partially due to the kind of current iteration of industry city. So are local jobs for residents who grew up in the area? And I just ask because of people that have recently moved in 
if you've only lived there for a couple months, do you qualify as a local hire? Can you just define it for all of us? We're happy to have the conversation about however anybody wants to define it, whether it's demographics, how long they've lived in the neighborhood, what zip code they're in, all of those things could be part of an annual uh, reporting mechanism. Well, I think we are trying to have the conversation on how to define local hiring. That's why I'm asking you because you're the one writing up the contracts. Uh, I'm, I, I, I am open to all of those things. Um, I can tell you that one of the things that's uh, made me most proud is the folks who have grown up in Sunset Park who are now entrepreneurs here and they see it about them and their kids to have the opportunities that a development like Industry City is providing. All right, well, uh, for the local hiring that, that is going to occur or has occurred, again, we'd love that data and the data that I requested earlier uh, it would certainly be welcomed in our decision-making process. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to ask another question. Thank you, Council Member Rivera. Um, thank you for your testimony. Um, if there's any other council members uh, who have questions for the applicant panel at this time, uh, please uh, so indicate by using the raise hand button. Ramoya, uh, Council Member Gordenchik. Uh, has raised his hand for a question. I'd now I'd like to turn it over to Starting time. Member uh, Kretenchik for some questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Starting and, time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all uh, for being here um, today. Uh, I don't know if I missed it. It's been a busy morning. Can you tell me what the total investment uh, that you plan uh, under the current package would be? So the investment to date is $400 million. We believe the ecosystem that will be created through this rezoning will take that investment to a billion dollars. So, okay. So it'll be another 600 million if my math is correct. Yeah. And what percentage of that investment would be private? A hundred percent. Okay. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's that satisfies my curiosity right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council member. Are there any other council members uh, who have any questions? Mayor Moya, Council Member Rosenthal has raised her hand with a question. Uh, who will be followed by Council Member Reynoso. Thank you. I now turn to Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair. Really appreciate uh, this hearing and the opportunity to hear from everyone. Um, I'm wondering will the developer agree to a legally binding community benefits agreement? Otherwise, yes. how will the developer's job creation projections be properly tracked and assessed? Um, you know, the truth is the city's own workforce development programs have difficulty tracking the actual number of jobs created by various projects, including um, retention rates, so, um, as well as salary levels. <clears throat> so um, we wanna understand how you plan on doing this and what mechanism of accountability will there be? Uh, thank you for the question. We absolutely will agree to a legally binding community benefits agreement. Uh, we have also already laid out um, that much of what we would get out of this rezoning uh, will be directly linked to two things. One is uh, setting aside space for manufacturing at an historic level. Uh, and number two, um, putting a cap on how much we can build without demonstrating on an annual basis, which we'll have to do, uh, that jobs are going to the local community in certain dip zip codes. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of your colleagues have talked about demographics associated with that, how long people have lived in the community. We're open to all of those things. Uh, being put into a CBA and being put into a very transparent process where we would report on it regularly. So is there a way to tie that job progress to the, I guess, sort of automatic, uh, I forget, 
you just said the name of it, the um, ICA, ICD, sorry, I forget the acronyms. Um, those public dollars that will go to the developer, is there a way to tie those two things together? ICAP is directly tied ICAP. to an investment. So you have to invest 50% of the assessed value of the property at the time. That's a massive amount of money. That's what a substantial portion of the $400 million we've spent so far has done. And as a result, um, over time, you have this tax benefit that any tax benefit there is exponentially um, uh, uh, superseded um, by the additional taxes paid by the businesses that come and benefit from the investment. Yeah. That made in that no, I understand that. But theory. there's no connection um, with the jobs. That's just the way the law is written. And as you know, the law comes up every two or three years and uh, there's a big discussion about it and the council's involved and Albany's involved and then a decision well, is made. Uh, so, hey, hey. <laughs> yes, I'm aware. And in fact, uh, was able to put, change the law so that ICAP had to now prove that uh, anyone who gets ICAP funding now has to really prove that they spend a certain portion on minority and women-owned businesses. So no need to lecture the council. I appreciate on, that. Um, our you. understanding of ICAP. But um, regardless of what the law requires, are you willing to tie uh, the, any government funding that you get to actual job numbers? So would you be willing to go above and beyond what the law requires you to do? Yesterday, we made a historic commitment that is above and beyond any private development project that has no public capital, public expenditure coming into it, um, which is that we cannot fully benefit from the retail and the new building that we would get under this rezoning unless we are showing that jobs are coming locally. So similar mechanism to yours, but we've already committed to it. Okay, I'm not, I would love to see that in writing. I would defer to Council Member Menchaca or Moya for understanding uh, the details of that better. But it strikes me that particularly uh, where we are economically um, right now and how communities are suffering that the implications of gentrification, the Time implications expired. for uh, low wage insecure jobs uh, now might not be the exact time we should be investing city dollars like this. But I appreciate your coming before this committee and starting to answer questions. I really do. Thank you, um, Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, I now turn it over to Council Member Reynoso. Starting time. Thank you. Um, Andrew, I wanted to ask, uh, Council Member Menchaca was talking about two things. Your CBA, um, is Council Member Menchaca not a part of the group overseeing the development of the CBA? I can't comment on Council Member Menchaca's role. You can, you can ask him uh, directly. Um, we are optimistic that a group will emerge that's committed to a legally binding CBA. That's all I can say at this point. A legally binding CBA in which the council member is not uh, a, a party to the to the agreement. Uh, my understanding is that it is not allowed by law for the council member to be a party to a CBA. But I'm well, yeah. you, you can you can correct I mean, me on that if if. If uh, uh, yeah, he can, I'm not he a lawyer, can. but that's what I've been told. Yeah, we can't sue you, but th that's different. Now, the council member doesn't want, to, doesn't need to be a part of it, but he needs to know what this, I guess, what the agreement is. He needs to be in, involved with the information of what is in the agreement. And from what I understand is that you you can't say necessarily what agreements you've, what what agreements, if any, have been agreed to, I guess. He's given me 10 requirements. Um, and I have agreed to all of them and those that aren't addressed through the council because they're related to zoning 
will be addressed in the CBA. Okay, and then Andrew, the, the last thing is, are one of those CBA uh, agreements a school? Uh, he has written as one of the 10 that he'd like to see a vocational high school similar to the one at the Navy Yard. And we have agreed uh, that we will provide that space, whether it's tomorrow or in the future, when the DOE is ready to build that space at the, Brooklyn, but, at the but, at industry setting. Andrew, you know, you know that like in innovative districts across the country, um, the way when they do it right, that these schools are extremely important. Um, but if the Department of Education and the mayor's office doesn't uh, has not, nothing, it hasn't been brought to the table here, um, you know, as we're closing the deadline here, that is an important part of of this agreement, and you can't guarantee that because the city has said that they're not going to be investing in this in this in industry city. So, so it's like an important part of the agreement that you can't guarantee. I can't speak for the mayor. But, right, but okay, has the mayor told you that he's going to build you a school, Andrew? I can't, I can't speak for the administration. Uh, they can speak have for you, the school. Have you received notice from the Department of Education or anyone in this administration that they will build you a school? You don't need right. to speak for you them. They to you about that? A strong interest in all of those things that the council Andrew, member has highlighted. Have, um, Angie, I, happening have you received the administration. any notice from the administration that they will no, go to a school? I have not. Have you, have you heard that? Okay, that's that's it. Uh, um, and that's very important okay. because you could commit to everything. Um, I could I could commit, I'm going to build a 2,000 acre park in Williamsburg uh, pending uh, administration approval. It's just never going to happen. It's not it's how it's pretty work. substantial that a private developer would welcome, in fact, covet having a vocational high school embedded in their commercial campus. Yeah, and you could it? welcome, you could welcome everything, all the bells and whistles. If a big part of welcoming is an administrative an administration that's engaged, that's different. You have a unengaged administration. Um, and we're asking for a lot of things that the administration would be a part of. They have to be partners of the CBA with you in understanding how they're building it out. And if you're not doing that, then a lot of these commitments that you're making that are dependent upon the administration, you, you can invite them all. Uh, but you're just not going to get them all. And, this, and, the, and, and you know that. And the community knows that. So I guess that's a, a big problem here is that you have a lot of commitments that you're willing to make on behalf of the administration or you're open to them if the administration engages you. And to this point, at the tail end of the ULA process, they've yet to do that. So I think that I like for, for my colleagues as well is like we know how this stuff works. It's always last minute, but the administration is engaged long before this moment if they're actually going to do any of this thing, these things. And that hasn't happened here. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Reynoso. Um, Council, uh, can you confirm if there's any uh, other council members uh, present who have uh, additional questions? Mayor Moya, I see no additional members with questions at this time for the panel. Uh, there being no more questions for this panel, uh, the panel is now excused. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrew, for your time. Uh, um, really appreciate uh, you being here. And uh, council, if are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the industry city proposal? Thank you, Andrew. Yes, Chair Moya, there are approximately 200 public witnesses who have signed up to speak in total. For members of the public who are here to testify, Please note that these panels will be called in groups of four names per panel. We understand that there are very many people signed up to testify and waiting for their turn to do so. We want to hear from all of you and we appreciate your patience uh, working through this hearing. To that end, I will announce each incoming panel as well as the following panel so as to provide some semblance of notice for the speakers in the upcoming panel. If you are a member of the public who has signed up to testify on LUs 674 through 677 for Industry City, and as you hear your name being called, please stand by 
and prepare to speak when the chair recognizes you to do so. As a technical matter, I would ask to remind those waiting to testify to please make sure that the name that you used to access this Zoom meeting is the same name that you used during your registration process. And also for those people waiting to testify, again, we apologize that we cannot inform you of the exact order in which you will be called. If you are unable to wait for the remainder of this hearing, you may always email your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. For witnesses who have previously requested or need at this time to request translation services, please indicate this first when you are recognized by the chair to speak. The meeting will pause briefly as a translator is made available to translate your testimony for the subcommittee. Translation will be provided as you make your testimony and you will be given additional time to make your statement for a total of four minutes and 15 seconds. As a reminder for persons who have signed up to testify and have requested translation services, we ask that you continue to watch this hearing using the language channel of your choice at the council's main website. Lastly, please note that once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed as a group from the meeting and the next group of speakers will be introduced. After you have completed your testimony and once your group has been removed, public participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing at the council's website. We will now hear from the first panel, who will be Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez. Starting time. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hear you. Thank you. Uh, well, Chairman Moya and members of the City Council, thank you for having me. Uh, since the beginning of this process, my priority has always been ensuring that any process is community driven and the needs of local residents and businesses are put first. Unfortunately, the proposal now before you fails to meet th that test. I understand that proponents of this deal have made promise after promise related to job creation. And given the current economic downturn, those promises may sound appealing. And uh, I just would like for the members of the city council to request from the uh, Andrew Kimball uh, to present to you an economic analysis as to the impact of COVID-19 in terms of uh, uh, small businesses and um, future tenants that will be moving in. If there is a lesson that we learned during this pandemic is that a lot of businesses are discovering that they could do business uh, remotely. So where are that data? Where is that economic analysis? The other part of this is that without enforceable mechanisms to hold the developer, developer accountable, there's good reason to be skeptical of this speculative job creation numbers. Show me one rezoning that has taken place in New York City in the last 10, 15 years that has proven that those promises that were made were kept. Let's go to Williamsburg, or let's go to Atlantic Yard. If anything, the only thing that we know, an end result of those rezoning has been displacement of brown and black people. In fact, if other previous development deals are any guide, 
we can expect those rosy projections will not materialize. What we do know is that deals like this supercharge gentrification and displacement. At a time when the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected working people and immigrants communities like Sunset Park, it will be the height of irresponsibility for the council to bring light a rush process that will benefit a developer while harming those already suffering enormous economic hardship. We should also be clear, this rezoning application is not needed for job creation in Sunset Park. Today, Industry City can continue uses such as office, manufacturing, film, photography studio, and large retail that has an industrial component. Industry City can perform interior renovation using 2.5 million square feet of space. It currently has vacant or for storage in existing buildings and bring thousands more jobs without a single, single zoning change. So let's be clear, this rezoning proposal has never been about maximizing jobs. It has been about maximizing profits. Without a rezoning, the owner has less access to financing slowing redevelopment and preventing speculation on industrial or residential properties nearby. This agenda is reflected in the imbalance, unfair process that brought us to where we are to date. Council Member Manchaca has been clear about minimum standards and preconditions for even considering a rezoning at Industry City. He outlined them publicly in September 2019. There would need to be a legitimate agreement that addresses jobs and workforce, minimum industrial space, and area affordable housing stabilization that is legally binding with a cross-section of community stakeholders. This will need to be negotiated and agreed to before EULAR not at the end of the Euler process. None of these conditions have been met. A coalition was not given the resources or time to fully form, let alone even get to a negotiation. Outside counsel was never retained. The end result is this, the, decks, the deck is being stacked in favor of this application and the working people who live in Sunset Park are at risk of being left behind. We have been hearing from people that job creation will be needed because of the hardships of the pandemic. Well, what I'm hearing from my constituents is the last thing we need in the midst of this pandemic is to intensify gentrification and displacement. The local city council member who represents the interest of this community has voiced his opposition. Certainly, member deference is a consideration. However, the well-being and livelihood of the residents and small businesses in the area should be paramount. Today, we have no meaningful assurances. Our neighbors will benefit from this plan, but we have good reason for them to worry about how this proposal might harm them and change their neighborhood forever. For all this reason, I implore the council, please do not forge ahead with this rezoning. The people who live in Sunset Park are counting us to protect them and the public interest. And by the way, if there is a point where I agree with uh, Andrew Kimball is this. Yes, you're right. We don't live in the 1950s or 60s or the 80s. No, sir, we live in 2020, overwhelmed by COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. This application submitted by Industry City doesn't live up to that reality. In an age of change, when our city and region must mobilize 
for a just transition to a, a sustainable future, our working waterfront is a precious resource we cannot afford to squander heedlessly. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Congresswoman, for your uh, testimony. Always great to see you as well. Um, now I turn it over to our council. Chair Moya, I see no members with hands raised. Excuse me. Council member Menchaca has his hand raised for a question for the panel. Turn it over to council member Menchaca. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, Congressmember Velasquez, uh, for your for your words and for bringing us into the severity of this moment and connecting us to the COVID pandemic and the economy that we're in right now. Um, I just want to say thank you. I know you're in Washington right now and that you're taking some time be between votes to be here with us. My only final question is is this: uh, You have been connected to this conversation since 2013 since it first started. And I guess I just wanna ask about the voices that you're hearing from across all of Sunset Park. What has been for you the strongest voice that you're hearing from the people that is motivating you today and speaking on their behalf as the well, members you are representing? Thank, thank you for that question and for your leadership. So I implore the city council to understand that in the midst of a pandemic, this is not the, the right way to proceed. We must respect the fear and the desperation that communities are living today. And for us or the city council to rush through this rezoning without giving ample participation for stakeholders and communities that are going to be most impacted by this is a disgrace. We need to show compassion and empathy. And, and, and what is the rush? There are millions of square feet that is vacant today in this, uh, in this development. I, I, I just, there's no argument uh, to try to rush this through without giving the opportunity for a process that is so complex for people to really understand without empowering those people with technical assistance, with the lawyer, please, you, not, you need to do better and you can. Council, do we have uh, any other uh, members um, who wish to ask uh, the Congresswoman a question? Moya, I see no members with further questions at this time. Great. Thank you, Congresswoman, for your testimony today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, the next panel here to testify will include Eddie Bautista, Tamara Tolls O'Loughlin, Elizabeth Diampierre, and Anthony Rogers Wright. As noted before, I will also announce the upcoming panel uh, so as to provide those waiting some form of notice that they will be coming up. The following panel will include David Cohen and Ruben Colon. So members of the public, um, you will be given two minutes to speak. Please do not begin uh, until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. And I will remind my colleagues that uh, we are going to have everyone on the panel testify and we will uh, then take member questions uh, at the end. Chair Moya, the first speaker will be Eddie Bautista. Starting time. So Bautista, you may begin. Mr. Batista, you need to unmute yourself. Apologies.
apologies. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair uh, Moya. Um, I, I need to depart from my prepared remarks for a second, and I feel okay about that because I'll be submitting the testimony. Um, I just have to react. Um, I spent uh, the first couple of hours of this hearing listening closely to uh, uh, Andrew Kimball, and I was pretty stunned to not hear the words COVID uh, leave his mouth until it was in reaction to a question from uh, one of the council members about, uh, about uh, uh, negotiations with CUNY. Um, when, we, when we're anticipating only about a third of the city's workforce to return by year's end, according to the business tabloid Cranes and the Partnership for New York, uh, it's pretty stunning that Industry City um, is continuing to promote this fantasy of 15 to 20,000 jobs um, with no change in the analysis from the final environmental impact statement from 2017. There was a telling moment in his testimony when he indicated that only e-commerce has grown, um, which of course uh, begs the question, what potentially uh, is the long run or the long-term uh, proposal for this rezoning if in fact Industry City uh, decides at some point to sell off its interests? Um, you know, the, uh, the CEO mentioned his long-term commitment to Sunset Park. One wonders what that commitment was when Industry City was uh, affirmatively marketing its properties to Amazon uh, last year when Amazon was looking to uh, looking for locations in New York. Um, so it's, I, I beg the council and this committee to use your common sense. Um, there is uh, all indicators show that the kind of uses that Industry City is proposing uh, is not where the city is right now. Um, and let me just read one or two lines from my testimony. Industry City's rezoning application, a gentrification and displacement plan that's couched as an economic propo development proposal, is the latest in a long I'm expired. Line. I'll submit the rest of it in writing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Batista. Thank you for your testimony today. Jeremiah, the next speaker is Tamara Tolls O'Loughlin. Starting time. Hello. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to address this body remotely. My name is Tamara Tolzo Laughlin, and I'm the North America Director of 350.org, a global grassroots organization dedicated to the fast and just transition to 100 renewable energy and ending all fossil fuels. The reason that we are involved in this conversation today is because we want to show up and support and solidarity with the community members who have demanded to be heard on these matters specifically uh, raising the idea that uh, in all of this planning, there's very little meaningful um, engagement with community members who have opinions well after the listening tour has started uh, along a very uh, defined line by people who are not interested in the outcomes and well-being of those community members. Uh, this rezoning proposes a disservice to the community, shrouded in lots of really great numbers, uh, metrics, uh, really great photos and beautiful graphics, recognizing that the long-term interest of community involves engaging them from start to finish, not uh, dispensing with them as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, it is our position that this proposal is inconsistent with the Sunset Park BOA, the Waterfront Revitalization Plan, the Climate Mobilization Act, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, along with many, many, many other efforts uh, driven by community members to have meaningful engagement in this um, kind of development. As an African-American who was born and raised in a different part of Brooklyn, I can assure you that we are all community. This kind of activity, no matter how dressed up, no matter what kinds of things are on the horizon and potential, has to involve people who are impacted from start to finish. And it is our position that until the community is satisfied, this matter cannot be closed. I yield my time to the people who've been waiting. Chair Moya, the next speaker will be Elizabeth Yampierre. Elizabeth. Starting time. Okay. Um, one, one of, one, can, you me? can you hear me? Okay. Uh, buenos dias. I'm Elizabeth Yampierre, the executive director of Uprose, Brooklyn's oldest Latino community based organization and a national grassroots leader in the climate justice movement. Today, we face multiple crises climate change, racial violence, and the global COVID 19 pandemic. These crises are created and exacerbated by the extractive economy that currently governs us and proves time and time again to prioritize the agendas of private developers over years of comprehensive community planning. We hope this hearing is not a testament to that 
or that the city is more concerned with developers' wants than community needs. I'm here to testify against the industry city rezoning and urge you to uplift our community-led alternative, the Green Resilient Industrial District, a comprehensive waterfront development plan. It's a plan that builds on years of community-based planning and organizing in Sunset Park to target climate adaptation, mitigation, and recovery. On the other hand, Industry City's rezoning application is built on false job claims and unchanged proposals since 2017, an outdated analysis based on pre-COVID market conditions. There's nothing innovative about hotels, destination retail, and offices in an already failing market. Economic development must be different. It's vital to take lessons learned from these crises to build and invest in developments that not only benefit frontline communities, but are led by them. As one of New York City's last remaining and largest significant maritime industrial areas, Sunset Park is uniquely positioned to be the place where we build for New York and the region's economic resilience and climate needs. As we continue to design and implement a Green New Deal, the entire nation will move to transition as well. We can't afford to allow dated thinking developers to continue to displace industrial businesses in space, sacrificing our city's infrastructure and industrial capacity to produce. If industry, industry city wants to develop in Sunset Park, they must do so in context. They must withdraw their application immediately and incorporate all the amendments and restrictions outlined in the grid. And, and New York City Council must say no to their proposal. Industry City had many chances since 2017 to change their application, but they didn't. They didn't I'm listen expired. to the Sunset Park community. Thank you, and please read the testimony that will be online. The next speaker will be Anthony Rogers Wright. Starting time. Anthony, you need to unmute yourself. Excuse me. No, you may be in. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Anthony Karifa Rogers Wright. I have the honor of serving as the policy coordinator and Green New Deal Policy Lead for the Climate Justice Alliance, a network of grassroots organizations in all regions of the United States, including Indian Country and the U.S. colonies of Guam and Puerto Rico. I'm here with standing with two of our members, Uprose and New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and as a proud son of Brooklyn, which will always be my home in the community. In 1991, the founders of the environmental and climate justice movements gave the world the 17 principles of environmental justice. Among the principles include demands for public policy to be based on mutual respect and justice for all people, free from any form of discrimination or bias, the right to ethical, balanced, and responsible uses of land and renewable resources that affirms a fundamental right to political, economic, and cultural environmental self-determination of all peoples. Unfortunately, it doesn't take a savant or a wonder kind to conclude that Industry City is antithetical to these principles and ipso facto in direct conflict with landmark legislation like the Climate Mobilization Act of New York City and the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act of New York State. It's important to state that the climate justice movement and our grassroots organizations don't just come to the table with problems, we also bring community-led wisdom and solutions rooted in just transition and energy to democracy. To this end, the Green Resilient Industrial District Proposal, or GRID, a community-led uh, plan to address climate adaptation, mitigation, and economic recovery for Sunset Park, BK, the city, the state, and the entire region, should be an axiomatic choice in an effort to foster real solutions as the solutions multiplier instead of exacerbating, exacerbating existing interleague crises rooted in, rooted in greed, hypercapitalism, and environmental racism. The EIS for this project doesn't even include an analysis of how the environmental justice impacts of the industrial city would assault communities like Sunset Park, nor does it include a side-by-side -side comparison of the grid proposal. We must cease um, solely operating from a lens of dollars and cents, um, especially when it comes to projects like Industry City, which makes no sense at all economically or environmentally, if we're really honest about our proclamations of operating from a lens of justice. Industry City represents nothing more than a continuation of anthropogenic activities. Okay, I will uh, support, uh, 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 definitely uh, submit the rest of this proposal online. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the last speaker on this panel. Okay. Uh, just uh, one quick question, um, uh, Arthur. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, just a quick question. Um, you know, you, I know you're with, with Uprose. Uh, so if, if Industry City, uh, the zoning proposal is rejected, uh, it would realistically take numerous years uh, to advance uh, an alternative city-led proposal uh, like the grid and the existing M31 uh, zoning, it would remain in place in the meantime. Uh, has Uprose 
consider the potential uh, results of impacts of Industry City continuing to develop under the existing zoning framework? And also, is there any modifications to the proposal uh, that for Industry City's rezoning that Uprose would consider favorable in comparison to the existing zoning uh, currently? Uh, thank you for that question. Unfortunately, the application as it stands is fatally flawed. Um, but I think that uh, there are several council members that are really interested in looking at what a comprehensive waterfront plan would look like for Sunset Park and for the rest of the industrial sectors throughout New York City. We are, you know, that Puerto Rico went through Hurricane Maria, that California is burning, that we've had tornadoes, that we are in the midst of climate change, and that we really need to retain our industrial waterfront so that we can start building for climate mitigation. Uh, industrial uses that address adaptation and resiliency. Uh, any other use for an industrial waterfront, that's what it was created for, to build for things and to make the kinds of things that we need. Uh, and so we're hoping that those of you who are in this uh, in this meeting today, in this hearing today, uh, will join us and look at that as a template that can be used to start addressing those really complex and timely problems. Um, and the plan really through the legislation that has been mentioned generates uh, a conservative 26,000 climate jobs that would benefit not just Sunset Park, but the region. Um, so what you're saying is absolutely true. It is a concern, but I'm hoping that there is the political will uh, and the goodwill to work together to try to address what is really a crisis that is going to have a disparate impact on low-income people and people of color. Uh, and so we're happy to do that. And we have bought a number of people, 350, Sierra Club, NRDC, um, the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, CJA, and all of the national organizations are standing with us because they're saying that economic development can no longer look like this. Economic development really needs to stimulate the local economy and look at food security, look at renewable energy, and look at the materials that the industrial waterfront is providing so that we can start building carbon neutral. You also know, sir, that from Superstorm Sandy, um, that the subway was basically ineffective, that we couldn't use it, and that we need to be able to get those materials somewhere and that our very businesses have to be made climate adaptable so that they can survive the next extreme climate event. So this, this rezoning is unlike any other and this industrial sector provides us with a vehicle, an economic engine to address uh, climate justice locally and regionally. Right. Okay, you, you didn't answer my question, but um, look in the, in the uh, just for time purposes, uh, do you have any information? I mean, you've been talking about the green industrial business. Do you have any information or analysis as to whether there is a demand uh, for space in Sunset Park by the green industrial businesses? We have to create the market for that. In the same way that Industry City promoted a market for retail and office space and uses that are inconsistent with the need of the industrial sector, we have to create the market to bring in that, that those kinds of businesses. We've reached out to EDC and had several conversations with them, and they certainly have an interest. We've just launched the first community-owned solar cooperative in the state of New York, and so that is growing, and there is a demand for that. Uh, but unless we are able to get past this, we won't be in a position to even create the market for that. So, I don't know if any of my co-panelists want to address that. But is there any data, any hard information or analysis on whether there is that demand that has led you to this conclusion? Uh, Can I respond? So it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Andrew Kimball himself said that the, uh, there's a big competition for offshore wind in the site right next across the street from Industry City. And what was telling in his testimony was what he said that there's going to be spillover of uses from the offshore wind that's being uh, marketed and considered for the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, which implies that there isn't enough room right now, yet these guys want another million and a half square feet. And I, I just gotta say, Chair, that we come from a discipline where you finish eating what's on your plate before you ask for seconds. I know I'm not the best person yeah, to deliver I, that message, my, but you my, understand what I'm saying. My, right. my, my question is just a very basic one. Uh, do you have yes. any information, any analysis that you can share? So that Andrew Kimball's own testimony. As the, I'm, I'm asking you if any of you who have been talking about this have actual analysis 
uh, or information that you can give the committee for us to look at as you're making this point about the demand for the green industrial businesses. That's what I'm asking. And if you don't have it now, that's okay. We just uh, expressed just it, but we'll send know, it again. I just want to know uh, if it's if you do have it, it would yeah. be great uh, to share with us. That's that's what I wanted. wanted. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know Council Member Menchaca has a question. Council Member. Hi, yeah, sorry that I was getting unmuted there. Uh, thank you to this panel. Uh, your work, not just in Sunset Park, but nationally has been uh, just incredible in keeping us rooted in our future and that just and that just transition. Um, I want to talk a little bit about SBMT. Uh, uh, many members of this panel partnered with my office in the first term uh, in early 2015 to really restructure the reactivation of SBMT. And that was that was a little bit of a struggle with the mayor, if we remember, but we partnered and really brought in community voices to shape the RFP and that activation plan. And now Industry City is saying that they want to partner to bring that offshore wind. Um, is this something that you support the offshore, offshore wind? And how does the rezoning impact that activation? Talk to us a little bit about that. And this is for anybody. I, I can begin and, and, and turn it over to Elizabeth. Um, I, I, this is what I was trying to respond to uh, the chair's question earlier. Um, there is uh, the, the offshore wind that's being proposed. South Brooklyn Marine Terminal is a solid candidate for that, right? Uh, and, and this predates um, the, the idea of marketing that South Brooklyn Marine Terminal for these kinds of jobs like green jobs. And by the way, I also think it was telling the snarkiness with which the CEO talked about green jobs, uh, act, said he was a vestige of the past. I would challenge the CEO to look at Speaker Johnson's climate plan that he issued this year. There's a whole section on green jobs, as well as Joe Biden. So the, the issue of wanting South Brook Marine Terminal to be retained for these kinds of uses, and again, Council Member Menchaca, we have to thank your leadership for assuring that that happens by the by the ceo's own testimony when he says there's going to be spillover into industry city if any of the offshore wind enterprises land in south Brook marine terminal implies that there's going to be a need for more room right so again we're looking to reward industry city by adding another million and a half square feet of precious heavy manufacturing zone land that we are every decade losing more and more of in New York City. What that means then is if we don't retain these the, the, the dwindling amount of heavy manufacturing, those jobs will have will go to Jersey. We have to be able to build towards our climate adaptation resiliency needs. So whether New York does it or New Jersey and Long Island, trust that those jobs are there. There's a reason why the Biden and the Senate Democratic Climate Caucus has put forward massive calls for investment to generate the kind of green jobs that the vision that you you and you helped carve for South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, I think, at, you know, more than adequately reflects. Uh, Elizabeth, I don't know if you, yeah, that's right. Uh, no, thank you, Eddie. Um, no, you know the truth is that um, the space that addressing uh, climate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience requires is more um, than, um, and we would lose that industrial space. We won't be able to have. That's the only real estate that we have in New York City to build for our climate future. And if we use it for offices and retail and things that can happen anywhere else, uh, we won't be able to address those challenges that are here now. The other thing that I think is really important, council member, is that only 41% of the Sunset Park community has a high school degree. And that climate jobs pay an average of 60 to $70,000 a year. And that um, the Innovation Lab, for example, a hub, uh, only hired 40 people from Sunset Park. And so the, the community is actually not even qualified for the jobs, that job carried that keeps getting pulled in front of us. But climate jobs, those are jobs like, uh, and, and, the, and the market is, is unstable. And so we know climate change is actually here and that there's stability with that. Uh, 
the other important thing is that the CLCPA that was mentioned by the Climate Justice Alliance and by 350 and the Climate Mobilization Act, that's the kind of legislation that provides the funding and the support to make sure that we actually are able to make these, that we can operationalize this kind of industry. And then, of course, on a national level, we're fighting for a Green New Deal, right? This is the very personification of a frontline Green New Deal. Um, and it would benefit the region, not just Sunset Park. So, um, so those things are really important. There's legislation that has been passed on a statewide level. New York Renews is a coalition of over 200 members uh, and legislation that makes it possible for us to be able to fund this vision. And this community vision uh, literally comes out of a lot of different community planning processes for over the last 10 years. Thank you. And, uh, and I know I only have a few more minutes, but I think the the attention that I want to bring moving out of SBMT and what we've been able to do with city owned property uh, and moving over to the 32 acre campus that is industry city, a private, a, a, a private space. What makes it so important, this space, the 32 acres and critically important for the climate recovery that you're speaking to, that the grid speaks to, that uh, this entire panel speaks to, connecting it to the city and state legislation. I wanna just get specific as possible in the last few minutes about what makes it so important that this conversation really impacts the development of this private space. Uh, and I just kind of, this is my last question I'll, I'll leave to the panel, uh, Elizabeth or Eddie or anybody else. Um, I, I guess I could begin. I, I think there were um, some of the estimates, and this is some of the information that we will gladly share with, with uh, as the chair requested. Um, based on uh, the Cuomo administration's job projections, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act for New York State, which is a mandate to bring New York State to 100% net zero emissions reductions by 2050, is expected to generate on the order of 150,000 jobs in the coming decade. Um, and with the New York City Council's Climate Mobilization Act, that there's also, um, I believe, a 40,000 uh, job projection that the city's mandate, that the city council uh, uh, effectively passed last year. Um, so between the city and the state emissions mandates, there are literally tens of thousands of jobs that are going to be generated. And this is what we've been saying all along, is that there, there aren't a whole lot of crises you can build your way out of. We're talking about building our way out of the climate crisis, right? And this is the point that I believe uprose the grid and Sunset Park residents have been saying all along. We're not anti-job. We are pro-economic development. And what we're looking for is 21st century development, not pre-COVID old style developer projections that he could not, that uh, CEO Kimball could not defend ba uh, based on any of the council member questions that were raised this morning. Thank you. Thank you to this panel um, and looking forward to continuing this conversation. I know this is just a, uh, one, one more step towards the end, but this is a very critical step and really listening to your both rooted Sunset Park and national conversation. I think this is going to be really important and impactful for council members to think about what is what are, what are we leaving out of the plan? What are we leaving out for possibilities for the Sunset Park community, the demographics and that opportunity that just does not play a massive and critical role in this current plan that we just heard, uh, saw and heard today. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. Um, thank you to the panel. Thank you for, for being here. We really appreciate your patience and your testimony here today. Uh, thank you so much. Chair Moya, the next panel to testify will be David Cohen, Ruben Colon, Edward Perez, Gary La Barbera, and Martin Tuazo. This next panel will be followed by Humberto Rodriguez, who will be testifying with the assistance of a Spanish interpreter. The first speaker on this panel is David Cohen. Starting time. David, you may begin. David, just before anything, get to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for your 
time today and thank you to uh, everyone who's testified and previous panels. Um, I will move quickly because the time is brief. Good morning, I'm David Cohen, Deputy Political Director at 32BJ. And I'm here today to talk about jobs and particularly how this rezoning stands to impact building service workers. 32BJ is the largest property service work uh, union in the country. We represent more than 85,000 workers in New York City, 21,000 in Brooklyn, 1,132 BJ members who live or work in Sunset Park. Uh, and we represent approximately 100 cleaners, elevator operators, demolition specialists employed at Industry City. We support a responsible rezoning of Industry City that will create a path to raise standards for existing workers and create good new jobs. Um, they're desperately needed. Um, 32 BJ has more than 20,000 members in commercial buildings throughout New York City, and we know the challenges they're facing. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit our industry hard. Thousands of our members are laid off, and these workers are, backbone, are the backbone of their communities. So we're hoping that the council can do all it can to create and preserve good jobs like, like theirs and the ones that we expect to be created. Um, the proposed rezoning will allow new uses in industry city site and activate spaces that are currently sitting vacant and that will cre uh, create investment to maintain the existing building service jobs and create an opportunity to raise standards for those current workers over the long term and again create uh, more good building service jobs. Um, these jobs can be life changing for members of the Sunset Park community uh, and we would do everything we could to ensure that those jobs support those residents and we support local plans for hiring and workforce development. Um, furthermore, and I'm just rushing before the time clock hits me, as we, as we face you know, the harsh realities of the COVID-19 pandemic, and again, thousands of our commercial members are still laid off, it's crucial to advance projects that will create good paying jobs, bring employment opportunities to communities of color, and generate hundreds I'm of- expired. In taxes. Thank you all so much for, for your time, and we hope that you'll approve this rezoning. Thank you, David. The next witness, Jeremiah, is Ruben Colon. Starting time. Ruben, you may begin. Honorable members of the subcommittee, I am Ruben Colon, the Brooklyn Area Standards Representative for hundreds of New York City and vicinity District Council of Carpenters members who live in the area of the proposed rezoning. Thousands more live in Brooklyn. I myself was raised in Sunset Park and live in, in an adjoining neighborhood where I sit on my community board. I also have close familial ties to the area as do many of the members I represent. Having grown up in Sunset Park, let me first make one thing clear. Contrary to opinions of a vocal few, I love my own neighborhood. It is because of this that I today speak out. I and many I grew up with remember the rapid economic deterioration of Sunset Park back in the 70s and 80s. Many left for greener pastures. Others like myself held, held steadfast. We are proud of what Sunset Park has become and recognize how much more can be done in the way of progress. But to do this, we cannot mire ourselves in fear. It's okay to be cautious about change, but we cannot allow ourselves to be paralyzed by it especially so at a time when due to the ongoing pandemic, we face economic hardships, the extent and ramifications of which have yet to be determined. Indicators of long-term consequences will be devastating to our communities, especially Sunset Park. Now is not the time to second guess ourselves. We look to our leaders at the New York City Council to do the greater good for the greater number of people. These are not traditional times. We must think outside the box. The council must act in the best interest of all New Yorkers, in spite of the local councilman's objections. New York City cannot afford to cater to the few while forsaking the many. Working men and women are counting on you. On behalf of those I speak for, I pray the council will render a vote in favor of the proposed industry city rezoning with no further restrictions or delay. Thank you. The next speaker, Chair Moya, is Martin Tuazo. Starting time. Martin? Yes, hi. My name is Martin Tuzo. I'm the president of the Brooklyn Local 926. I have a membership of approximately 2,000 members, <clears throat> Brooklyn Union Carpenters, many of which live in Brooklyn, have families or close ties to it. I was born in Sunset Park on 49th Street and 8th Avenue. I was raised in a neighboring Park Slope. I wish to emphasize what rezoning of Industry City means for my members. A vote in favor of rezoning means potentially hundreds of union jobs. 
lasting for years. Our Carpenter members, such jobs provide wages, good benefits on which our families can be raised, rents, mortgages can be met, local purchases can be made. We could shop in our small business. A favorable vote can bring much needed comfort in a time of uncertainty given the ramifications of this health crisis that we face today. The well being of thousands of families, many from Brooklyn, lays in your hands. Our very livelihood depends on your decision. On behalf of my members, these families, I must therefore urge the subcommittee to recommend a vote in favor of the industry city's rezoning law with no further delay. Thank you very much. Edward Perez and Gary LaBarbera, who were earlier uh, indicated uh, on this panel, if you are available to testify later, we will. So I have um, uh, one one quick question. Oh, uh, we're gonna just briefly uh, pause for one second. Please stand by. The meeting will stand at ease for a moment.
Please admit the witness labeled Santos Rodriguez, and we understand that that is actually the witness, Gary LaBarbera. Okay. Counselor, are we ready? Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. <laughs> One second, Santos. Okay. Okay, you may begin, sorry. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity, council member. Uh, my name is Santos Rodriguez and I am testifying today on behalf of Gary LaBarbera, president of the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York and vicinity. I'm here to testify in support of the industry city rezoning. The Building and Construction Trades Council is an organization of local building construction trade unions that are affiliated with 15 international unions in North America's building trades union. Our local union affiliates represent approximately 100,000 union construction workers. The building trades mission is to raise the standard of living for all workers to advocate for safe work conditions and to collectively advance working conditions for our affiliates members, as well as the workers in New York City. New York City is unique resiliency and its ability to adapt and move forward into the future. Industry City has been a long time industrial and manufacturing hub for the Brooklyn waterfront. Rezoning Industry City sends a message to New York City that New York City remains an invest invested in progress. Now is the right time for this message to be sent. Rezoning Industry City would allow the certain of excuse me, allow for the certain of more than 20,000 jobs. Many of these jobs will provide wages and benefits that will support middle-class lifestyles for workers and their families with over a million workers out of work. Now is the right time to take action and lead, the, lead to job creation. Rezoning the industry, industry city could be much more welcome boost to the city's economy. A rezoning of industry city provides an opportunity to inject $1 billion in private investment into New York City and to create $100 million a year in tax revenue. With the, with the city of New York very much struggling with economic impact of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, now is the right time to take advantage of opportunities to pr promote investment and generate revenue in, the, in New York City. Thank you very much. We've submitted our testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Santos, for your uh, testimony today. <clears throat> what other, do we have anyone else? Edward Perez was scheduled to be on this panel. Edward Perez, if you are uh, attempting to log in, we will reach you later in this hearing. That is the final speaker for this panel. Great. Um, just uh, two quick questions. Uh, is David Cohen still on? I see David Cohen. Great. Um, so, David, just a, just a quick question. Um, we heard today uh, about the jobs projected at Industry City um, are not long term and they're low wage. Uh, what are the wage standards and how long does the average 32BJ member stay in a position, maintain their benefits uh, uh, from your union? And kind of what are the conversations that have been 
uh, happening on this project to, to secure those jobs, if you can just talk to us a little bit well, about that. The, the path to the, the, to answer the question, um, is that the path to the kind of commercial standard jobs that I discussed in my testimony is the rezoning. So to get, and I'm happy to speak to it, like to get to these jobs, which we consider good middle-class jobs that pay, um, that pay $27.95 an hour with $13.70 and towards uh, benefits, which include full family health care, access to the training fund, uh, and many other benefits as well. Um, that is sort of what the, the cleaners in the heart of the commercial business districts make. In order to get to that standard, we need this rezoning so that the various investments happen in industry city and that the, you know, the project owners can, can bring those workers to that standard. I mean, as I mentioned before, obviously the challenges of COVID are hitting the commercial business sector hard. We know that only 10% of office workers have gone back. We know that there's still 6,032 BJ members who are laid off. Uh, in, in this universe and we fight for them every day and we'll keep fighting to create more jobs at that standard um, when, and the benefit. So that's like, and just to answer your question, like long-term, I mean, our members work until they retire. I mean, if they, if they, if they can. So 20, 30 years, people stay 32 BJ union cleaners. Um, yeah, and as, as I mentioned, in the, especially in the commercial and residential section, which is our, our strongest and largest sector. We also represent 15,000 security officers and airport workers, um, but those folks you know, will work for over 20 years. Those jobs. Great, thank, thank you, David. I appreciate uh, you answering the question. Um, just one, one more question. I um, just wanted to ask uh, Santos uh, one quick question. Can you explain, um, how even if, if the construction jobs are temporary, uh, how, how, how does the union, how can the union uh, provide long-term entry to good paying jobs uh, through the apprenticeships? So thank you very much for the question, uh, Council Member Moya. So this is uh, really uh, near to my heart, right? Uh, look, I was born and raised in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I came in through a program called Construction Skills. Uh, 22 years ago. And just to show you uh, uh, just a little bit of, of my, my, my career within itself in the industry, uh, when we say temporary job, we, we're only as good as our last jobs uh, because these jobs get completed, right? The, the object of construction or the purpose of construction a project is to, to have an end date and we move on to the next job. But in 22 years, I've only been out of work for, for two weeks that I wanted to go to work and there was a slow, a slow time, uh, right? And within, within my industry where, with, where I couldn't get uh, work for that two week period. But when you think about 22 years in an industry uh, and only being out of work for two weeks, being able to provide for my kids, being able to provide for my, my family, uh, my wife and, and, and being a part of, of this economic growth there's really a true pathway to the middle class when you come in to the unionized industry. So, you know, we can all do our part. The more union jobs that we can create within the new, within New York City council member, uh, the more growth we can have in entering more kids. More, and I say kids, but you know, uh, the young youth and even older people that are looking to, to, for career change within the industry, right? We work with four different organizations. We work with construction skills, right? The Edward J. Malloy Initiative for Construction Skills. We work with How Much to Hard Hat that works with veterans that are coming back home from serving our country and bringing them into the unionized construction industry. Uh, we work with non-traditional employment for women, helping women get into the industry. We work with pathways to apprenticeship that are helping inner city people, inner city uh, 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 people come into the industry and, and to think of one of the industries that really looks for economic justice within justice involved people is the, is the building trades. We do not look at your prior history. A person gets a second shot, sometimes a third shot and their last shots, right? When they come into the industry, but they're able to work and provide and provide for their family with healthcare and benefits 
and and retire with with a pension annuity and and, and dignity, right? So I think these things all come together with projects like such and future projects that are built union. Thank you um, for that, Santos. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to, uh, I know, turn it over to uh, Council Member Menchaca, um, who has uh, a question as well. Thank you, Chair. And I want to say thank you to the panel, uh, to Ruben and David and on Martin and Santos, uh, our work together has been pretty amazing and strong, and I look forward to more of that uh, in the future. Um, bringing it down to, Suns uh, to Sunset Park and Industry City, let me start with uh, David over at 32BJ. When did you start, when did 32BJ start organizing workers at Industry City? Um, so, let me think. In my role, I don't do the worker organizing, but I want to say, and I remember the mo. I remember around the time because I, I want to say like a year, uh, it would have been a year and a half ago, and even two years ago. It was like right. You might remember. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was the summer. It was last summer. Uh, even a little before, right? Like, because yeah. it must have been even. It might have been right, like April two thousand and. 19. That's right. So, and there was a vote, correct, for all the workers that came together and said, we want to we want to move into contract with 32BJ. Yeah. Uh, so again, I don't do the internal union elections. I do other elections, uh, but the workers organized and there was a vote. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a quick update on where you are with the workers right now in terms of organizing them and uh, where they are in the process? Yeah. So Again, it's not my day to day, but I have been briefed on it for the moment. And I know we're talking to you and other interested council members about it in more detail tomorrow. Uh, there are two groups of workers there. There's the, my understanding, there's the in-house employees, and then there's a good, there's a Collins, currently contracted workers who do cleaning uh, with a responsible union signatory, Collins Building Service. Collins Building Services, actually Industry City in the past year or so has replaced a non-union signatory with that union signatory. Uh, so that's sort of the one group, Collins Building Service. And then the other group are the direct employees who, you know, I was at a meeting with you and those workers at the Dunkin' Donuts in the district uh, sometime when it was cold, maybe last yeah, November. It's winter. Uh, and the, the conversations have kept going. I mean, as I mentioned in my testimony and conversations that uh, I've had with our vice president who oversees those, that division, like uh, during the COVID pandemic, some of the sort of organizing and, and worker outreach uh, has sort of been triaged as so many members are suffering and facing other consequences. But it's my understanding that after kind of a recent call with that vice president, that the workers are kind of, the in-house workers are moving forward with like a productive, what will be a hopefully a productive round of bargaining to create good jobs. And I also know that when we, whenever we've started representing those workers, which was, a year ago, right? So organizing election, uh, they all got the health care, the same health care that I have, the 32 BJ plan, which is a substantial cost to employers. Um, and I know they all continue to have their health care, and it's something that we will continue to fight for. I believe that. Thank you for that. And I, I just there's deep appreciation for the work that 32 BJ does across. And I know that Industry City has a big opportunity to bring in union workers. Uh, many of these workers have been working for 15 years at $15 an hour. Uh, there's clearly an opportunity here. Um, do you need the rezoning to get to the final piece? Uh, I understand there's a contract that has been presented. Do you need the rezoning to bring union jobs to Industry City? Technically. Uh, you might be on mute. Yeah, so they unmuted me. Okay. So uh, I I can't speak to that as not someone who leads like the bargaining and our legal analysis of what like is necessary for our contract. I think, as I was clear in my testimony, that the path towards the next round of good building service jobs, once there is the redevelopment, the good construction jobs that Santos spoke to, um, and new buildings, then... I'm, we're hoping that all the jobs will be raised up to the commercial standard where, you know, in the outer boroughs, you don't see it that much. You have, we have a little bit in Metro Tech, 
maybe a few now at Barclays, which was mentioned in previous testimony, but to really build a uh, good job growth throughout the city, we need it in the outer borough. So uh, I'm happy to confer back with the lawyers who do the bargaining and the vice presidents who make that decision. Um, and I'll get back to you about that tomorrow, Carlos. I think for us to raise all the jobs up to the standard, um, we need the reason. Okay, so this is gonna be a really important thing and it'd be good for us to talk through because um, I, I don't believe we need the rezoning to get union jobs at Industry City as you are really just uh, outlining that the workers wanted it, the vote happened, you're at the end of this process with a contract and your negotiations, all without a rezoning. Um, and this is for the whole panel, 400 million out of the billion in promised renovation and expansion in, in um, investment. Uh, half, almost half of it has already been injected into Industry City, which means that we've been moving this forward without union representation and union jobs. And I think that's a critical component to how I'm thinking about labor and how labor can be here right now without a rezoning. And then maybe I can talk to, um, we could kind of bring in Santos and, and send my best to Gary, by the way. Uh, we've been on the ground working with uh, Chair Moya and Jamani Williams, public advocate on construction safety. Construction safety is an issue even here in, in Sunset Park at Industry City. And I hope you stay long enough to hear some of the workers talk about th those issues. But my question to the, the building trades is, we only have another 6 million. They've already spent 400 million without labor. What can we do right now to protect workers at Industry City without a rezoning? And then maybe I can I can put a more a more specific question. There might I, I heard that there are conversations, and I think we're going to have a conversation later this week about a PLA citywide that or uh, companies like Industry City who are landlords can agree to. Could they agree to it without a rezoning and the investment that they're planning to make after already making almost half of the investment that they are telling us they're going to make? And if you look at the jobs. They've already created 8,000 jobs. They're only gonna give us another 7,000. And then there's a whole bunch of other outside kind of uh, in the orbit of Industry City that will be created. So the 20,000 jobs quickly becomes just 7,000 jobs. How can we work with you to bring union jobs to Industry City without a rezoning? And is the PLA the way? I'm sorry. I would... I was trying to unmute myself. I couldn't. I wasn't. I wasn't being allowed to speak. <laughs> That's been happening. To I'm, you. I'm sorry. So look, I, I can't. I, I. I. can only speak to, to what we know as of right now. And I do know that Industry City Andrew Campbell and, and Gary LaBarbera uh have been speaking uh, uh, frequently about Industry Cities and how and how do we get there with, with more union jobs and construction jobs for our members for new membership right. Uh, our affiliates have to do, uh, or are they are doing their due diligence as well? You know, our members are from the community. Uh, uh, I've said this uh, to you in person, and by the way, thank you very much with with all the work that we've done on construction safety, which is really important. You know, that's always near and dear to our hearts, uh, specifically because we want to make sure that everyone gets home safely, right? Uh, uh, with all their limbs and, and, and alive. <laughs> but uh, all, I said all, right? Yeah, all. Exactly. No, so, that's so yeah yeah so for us to raise the bar across the board it, it's it's monumental right through that through through local law 186 now when it comes to ensuring uh union union construction jobs on a private development is the answer project labor agreement yeah we we have several project labor agreements right we have a lot of intent at the moment with with uh, industry city what that what comes out of that is still to be discussed in between the two principles, right? So I, I can't speak to what comes out of that at the moment, but the hopes are, and I think the reality is that we will likely be uh, on on the job, moving hopefully moving forward, right? Uh, we'll see we'll see what comes out of everything and the rezoning. For us, rezoning is important. I know you asked David that, but for us, rezoning is important because we build. Uh, uh, 
and we construct. That's how we keep, you know, economic development going in the city, especially in lieu of COVID. We know that construction jobs has come to a halt. We know that MTA is hurting. We know that LaGuardia, I mean, well, LaGuardia, we know that the Port Authority is hurting, right? These are all construction jobs that might be paused, might be delayed, might not happen. Uh, uh, so these th these rezonings are very important to to our membership and to our folks that live in our communities. Yeah, awesome. So you know, I think we're aligned on 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 everything. Um, the question here is the rezoning, and I just want to say that I want to I want to hear more about the PLA citywide. I want to figure out how to bring both accountability and growth and mesh them so that we're moving because we're representing, you're representing workers, I'm representing Sunset Park uh, constituency. And I think this could really be an interesting and new way of bringing accountability to the growth that is coming into, uh, into our neighborhoods. And, and this, is, this is a question for all the unions, not just at Industry City, but if you look at what's happening with the Teamsters over at Sims across the street, the, the, the real question is how do we bring more protections to workers when this, when this economy is unstable. When I asked Andrew Kimball earlier today when he was gonna expect construction, he said, I can't tell you that. No one can tell you that. Maybe two, maybe five, maybe something down the line, but he's already spent 400 million in demolition and reconstruction without unions. These are the players that need to be held accountable and accountability and growth have to come together in times of COVID. You heard that from the Congress member and all the elected officials that are gonna be speaking today. And so let's let's work together to make that happen. Thank, 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 thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, you um, Council Member Michaka. Um, thank you very much to um, our panel um, for coming here and testifying uh, here today. Um, we appreciate it. Uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, Chair Salamanca, uh, Chair Chair, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, the chair will take over for just a, a brief couple of minutes. Uh, I appreciate it uh, very much. Uh, I'm gonna excuse myself. Um, I hand it over to you chair and to uh, our council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Moya. Um, so just, uh, uh, just, uh, just to feedback, I'm just coming in uh, briefly uh, to, uh, as an acting uh, chair of the subcommittee for Chair Moya. Uh, and um, just some ground rules again, members of the public will be given two minutes uh, to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant of Arms has stated, uh, st has started the clock. I remind my colleagues that we will hear from the full panel and then take member questions afterwards. Uh, and so uh, council, please uh, call in the next panel. Chair Salamata, the next witness panel will include Cesar Zuniga, Edeline Jacquet on behalf of State Senator Zelnor Myrie, John Fontillas, Marcella Matanes, and Jabari Brisport. The panel after that will consist of Randy Peers, Tom Gresh, Regina Meyer, Jessica Walker, and Catherine Wild for those speakers' information. Thank you. Um, they may begin. The first speaker is Cesar Zuniga. Time begins now. Cesar, you may begin. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Cesar Suniga and I chair Community Board 7. cb 7s land use chair uh, submitted for the record our report that summarizes our process, vote, and most importantly, the over 80 recommendations we made on this application. And I urge you to read that document. Since 2009, our community has been on the record about what we value and aspire to in our community. Specifically, our 197A plan recognized the value of manufacturing and industrial business is on the waterfront. In 2018, I initiated a comprehensive review process for this application. Well in anticipation of certification, we hold 35 workshops, speak out meetings in three different languages and efforts to educate on waterfront issues over 22 months. Thousands of Sunset Park residents participated 
and their input is documented in our report. Read that report. Some of the flaws in the application in its current form include housing. The most critical issue in our district is the lack of affordable housing and displacement of long-term residents due to explosive rent increases. This application does nothing to address this issue. The displacement of one of our last true manufacturing zones in the city. Bus businesses in this sector have historically provided good paying jobs for local residents, many with only a high school education and families to support. Traffic, unmitigated um, development will increase traffic overall and specifically truck traffic. COVID-19 has laid bare the many structural inequalities that have long faced our communities from weaknesses in our education system and access to healthcare to lack of affordable housing and living wage jobs. And now it seems clear that the voices of communities of color don't matter in decision making around the transformation of their own communities. We took it in good faith that our efforts were important, our community's many voices would be respected, and that we had a say in our, in our district's future. But here we are today with nearly the entire Euler process behind us and with the council about to weigh in, one of our recommendations has been considered, stop the blatant disrespect and disregard of our community. Thank you, um, thank you. Um, sure, the next. The next speaker is Adeline Jaquette on behalf of State Senator Zelnor Myrie. Time begins now. Thank you. Um, I'm appearing on behalf of Senator Myrie because he's sick and not able to um, attend himself. Um, my name is Zelnor Y. Myrie and I have the honor of representing the 20th Senatorial District, including Sunset Park. I speak to you today in opposition to the industry city uh, rezoning proposal. In March 2019, I, along with colleagues in government who represent Sunset Park, wrote to the City Planning Commission to share our concerns about this large private rezoning application that would further exacerbate real estate pressures, displacement, rising rents, and forever shift the nature of the waterfront away from manufacturing to commercial tourism and the service economy. This would counter our efforts to restore Brooklyn's industrial position and would supercharge the displacement and gentrification that is undermining Sunset Park's affordability and blue collar job base. Since that time, the council member representing Sunset Park, Carlos Menchaca, backed by a coalition of residents and community groups has undertaken a robust and comprehensive approach to reviewing the proposal and building consensus, consensus for equitable standards of development at Industry City. The standards include a more limited scope for the rezoning, additional investment in neighborhood needs like housing, workforce development, and climate resilience, and most notably, a legally binding community benefits agreement that would address workforce, industrial waterfront, and other community concerns. The CBA is critical. As you know, a real community-based engagement and development is not what ULIP was designed to effectuate. Moreover, Industry City does, does not need a rezoning to bring jobs. In 2013, Industry City said they could only bring 5,000 jobs with private investment alone. Today, they're touting the over 8,000 jobs without rezoning. With 1 million square feet of property still undeveloped, they can bring thousands more jobs without public accommodation. In normal times, coalitions of residents and community groups are at a distinct power advantage, disadvantage when attempting to negotiate terms with a major developer black by, backed by billionaire global investors. When the pandemic struck, the ability of the community to obtain legal counsel and commerce and, and commence negotiations with the developer went from limited mm -hmm. to virtual non-existent. Thank you so much. I will submit my testimony, uh, my full testimony um, to the committee. Thank you. And please send my regards to the Senator. Thank you so much. Chair, the next speaker will be John Fontilles. I will take this moment to just remind all participants that until the chair recognizes you, you, your microphone will be unmuted. And for everyone, the unmuting process will take some slight delay. All right. Thank you, Council. Uh, the next panelist may begin. Hi, can, can you, you hear me? me? Yes. yes. Right. My name is John Fontillis, and I chair the Land Use Committee of Brooklyn Community Board 7. In 2009, our 197A plan recognized the value of manufacturing and industrial businesses on Sunset Park's waterfront. In 2018, we began a comprehensive review process for this application, emphasizing the importance of these industries to the neighborhood. Sunset Park residents participated, and their input is documented in our report that I've issued as part of our testimony. Of the four land use actions before you, the board voted no on the special permit and the 40th street demapping. Transforming Industry City into another waterfront retail mall and office complex will displace one of the tr last true manufacturing zones in the city, whose businesses provided good paying jobs for local residents, 
many with only a high school education and families to support. support. We have already seen displacement of businesses and residents due to rising rents. Formula Big Box Retail at Industry City will displace local family-owned businesses, and hotels that started out as national brands are now homeless shelters, or worse, centers for human trafficking. Increased traffic to retail and office uses will endanger children who use these streets to school. These changes threaten Sunset Park's character as a proud, hardworking, family-oriented, live-work community, especially for immigrants and people of color. Since COVID-19, the council may want a silver bullet plan that promises jobs and growth, but this plan will further the risks of housing insecurity, unemployment, lack of childcare and educational opportunity that community members are facing right now. The special permit actions do not address these core neighborhood issues. We urge the council to revise the special permit so an agreement with the community towards partnership and benefits can be forged. I yield my time. Thank you. The next, the next speaker is Marcella Mateens. All right, time begins. Okay. My name is. Hi, my name is Marcella Matenas. Sorry, I'm just having difficulty here. <sighs> Sunset Park is a diverse neighborhood. It is one of the last real New York City communities. I moved to Sunset Park in 1978 when I was five years old, part of an immigrant family who migrated from Peru to New York for a better life. But Sunset Park is very different in the late 70s than it is today. My family and I moved here because it's an affordable, at a time it's not particularly desirable. We, along with our neighbors, set roots here. We attended the local schools, patronized the local stores, attended the local places of worship, and helped make Sunset Park a vibrant, flourishing community. To claim there will be no impact on residential housing stock because there is no housing being built is just false. The rezoning has the potential to wipe out the immigrant population as we know it. We are already seeing and feeling the impact as residential and commercial tenants displacement pressures have risen since 2013 when Industry City took ownership. Their draft EIS claimed there would be no primary or secondary displacement and they were not building affordable housing. After they conducted the study, the developer has finally acknowledged that there are approximately 26 families that will be directly impacted as they are currently in the area where they want to build one of the hotels. Industry City went on further to claim that because the 26 families are less than 1% of the population, that they're insignificant. This proposal is flawed because it lacks a comprehensive look at how this rezoning will impact the neighborhood. There's more details in my public testimony, but we are here as residents to say that we have spoken and we have tried to have a conversation with Andrew Kimball. The problem is, is in order to have a discussion, a real honest discussion about mitigating their negative impacts they first have to admit that there are negative impacts into the community. And we are not in favor of a community benefits agreement. That ship has sailed. We are now saying that we do not time need this expired. rezoning. I am an incoming elected official. Woo! I am not yielding my time. Woo! Sunset Park! Sunset Park! Sunset Park! All right, thank you very much for your statement. Sunset Park! This is not... Those are the speakers present and available for this panel. However, at this time, I would ask Jabari Brisport, if you are available to please raise your hand. If Jabari Brisport is unavailable or uh, not present at this time, we can attempt to pick them up later. And I remind everyone that they can email testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. All right. Thank you very much for your statements. Um, I will hand it off to uh, Councilmember Menchaca for your questions. Councilmember? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome, thank you. And thank you, Chair, good to see you. And thank you for being here uh, for this really important hearing. And my, my first question is to the community board and uh, you've heard from three members of the community board uh, talk about the process that they, take, they took. 
much of that process yielded mayoral investment to the community. Uh, could you all speak about how hard it has been to get any commitment from the mayor about the long-term impacts to development in general for housing and, and, and how you feel about that relationship with the mayor's office uh, as the community board has spoken. Um, and, and this also includes uh, incoming assembly member, uh, Marcella Matanis. Sure. Um, I, I mean, it's been, it's been beyond frustrating. Um, and it's been, it's been a real slap in the face uh, because of, you know, the, the, uh, a mayor and an administration that came in with very lofty, lofty goals around affordable housing, and um, and their cookie cutter approach has been an utter disaster. And and in specifically with this application, you know, it, he didn't even his 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 office didn't even deem it important enough to respond directly to a letter that we wrote him in collaboration with your office. And and so it's it's um it's the height of of. A, a sl slapping a community in the face and sending them a message that uh, he's too busy, he's got other priorities. Um, and again, it's super ironic given the promises that he made as, a, as, a, as an incoming mayor. Thank you. And so, and, and for that, you are urging the council to, to do what? Ask, so, so, yeah, let me be clear about that, right? Because I urge the council to vote no on the application because of its current form and and because of the fact that here we are down the line without a single a single um you know uh suggestion or or recommendation being incorporated into this application and it's and and there have been opportunities along the process to make that happen and here we are you guys are about to vote for this without a single uh recommendation that we took so much time to come up with and here we are uh, Marcella? Uh, Got it. They unmuted me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as somebody who had their own displacement pressures and turned that into um, a, new, a new job, and I've been doing that since, it's important to understand that we are already under pressure. There's already the displacement pressure that's being felt. There's currently a building on 23rd Street, three buildings. The owner passed away five years ago. And the, the children have been collecting the rent in cash and have not been paying the property taxes. They are waiting for somebody to come in and purchase up those buildings and those tenants are vulnerable. There's another building on 42nd Street who hasn't had any cooking gas since, no, since February, during all the pandemic. This isn't an accident, this isn't a coincidence. This is a rippling effect of the existence of Industry City already in our community. We're not expecting them to go away, they're here, but we don't see a need for them to expand. We are under tremendous pressure. Um, providing advocacy and organizing is something that our funding has been hit hardly because of this pandemic. And so we don't have enough resources. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcella. I want to say thank you to Adeline as well for being here and representing State Senator uh, Zellner Myrie. Um, and I, I want to maybe ask the land use chair to talk a little bit about the intricate nature of the, of the final result of the community board process and the confidence that you might have in any of those things coming to fruition. And do we even have time to really go through all those pieces that were outlined by the community board? And is that fair and accountable and transparent? Uh, thank you, Councilmember Chaka. I would just say that when two years ago, three years ago, when uh, Industry City uh, put forth their scoping document, we on the community board uh, had to respond. And under uh, uh, Chair Zuniga's uh, leadership, we developed a, a significant plan that uh, focused and, and made primary community participation as uh, part of the, the process of review. And this was very long before the Euler uh, process even began, before we even got a sense of, of what the actual application was going to be. Uh, I would just say- um, Time has expired. I'll, I'll allow him to finish his statement, please. 
Right. I, I would just say we have uh, uh, the document that we put together that we're submitting as part of our testimony uh, is supported by hundreds of people who uh, came out at all our town halls, public meetings. We had seven standing community board uh, committees review parts of the uh, application, and they each came up with significant number of issues and, and thoughts on the uh, on the plan. Uh, we have close to 70 specific issues that we would like the plan to address, uh, that the applicant would address. And in addition to that, 40 uh, specific uh, recommendations for city and city agencies to address. Uh, we believe it's a very comprehensive view by neighborhood experts uh, who really know this neighborhood and its needs. Uh, and I would hope that the council does take a, a very close view of what these uh, thousands of uh, Sunset Park residents have provided uh, you as uh, uh, data uh, uh, to review. Thank you to this panel, uh, a representative panel and a unanimous uh, no for this application. Back to you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman Menchaca. Are there on any other council members that wish to ask any questions that are on this panel? All right, seeing none. Um, council, may you call up the next panel, please? Chris Salamanca, the next panel will include Randy Piers, Tom Gresh, Regina Meyer, Jessica Walker, and Catherine Wild. The panel after that will include Eric Goldstein, Lou Daly, Peter Iwanowitz, and Shay O'Reilly. The first speaker on this panel will be Randy Piers. Mr. Piers, you may begin. Starting time. You're muted, Mr. Piers. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Uh, Randy Piers, Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, uh, one of the largest uh, business associations in New York State and a champion for small businesses throughout the entire borough. Um, for us, this application is about jobs and opportunity, not just for Sunset Park, but for Brooklyn and New York City as a whole. But my insights into Industry City go well beyond my current role as Chamber President. As the former chairman of Sunset Park's Community Board 7 and past CEO of New York City's largest youth workforce organization headquartered in Sunset Park, I've devoted my professional life to empowering members of our community. From this unique vantage point, I want to use my time to address two very important points that are often overlooked in the zoning, rezoning debate. First, the Industry City rezoning plan is consistent and furthers the goals of Community Board 7's 197A Waterfront Development Plan adopted over a decade ago. Number one, convert vacant or underutilized property into job intensive industrial uses and create affordable rental space, check. Number two, explore the possibility of developing a vocational training center on the waterfront, potentially through a partnership with an academic institution. This can only be done with, uh, with the zoning change. Number three, develop transportation and urban design solutions to improve conditions for both pedestrians and cyclists and facilitate waterfront access. All of their infrastructure improvements to date has been with those interests in mind. And number four, preserve manufacturing and discourage residential development. Two very clear mandates Industry City has consistently adhered to by agreeing to community requests for manufacturing set-asides and by agreeing to remove hotels from the plan. Second, job creation will in fact benefit Sunset Park, including its youth. Opponents of the plan are being disingenuous by suggesting that the residents of Sunset Park, including its youth, won't or can't benefit from the jobs created at Industry City. The youth of Sunset Park are some of the brightest, most tech savvy young adults in New York City. Saying they can't benefit from the jobs in the creative economy is just plain wrong and frankly sells these youth short. The nature of manufacturing has changed and old industrial jobs have moved on, but industry city companies still create things from food, food products I'm to expired. digital arts. You have my written testimony. We support this uh, rezoning enthusiastically. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next panelist. The next speaker is Tom Gresh. So Gresh, starting time, you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Moyer and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Tom Gretsch. I'm the President and CEO of the Queens Chamber of Commerce. It is truly my pleasure to join you today to speak in support of the Industry City Rezoning. You may be asking yourself, why is the guy from Queens, the Queens Chamber President, testifying in favor of a project in Brooklyn? I felt it was very important to speak today because I believe that the rezoning of Industry City is truly a game changer that can help kickstart our regional economy and have an impact that extends far beyond Sunset Park. 
The last several months, as we all know, have taken a tremendous toll on our economy. Over 20% unemployment, a level not seen since the Great Depression. Thanks to our frontline workers and heroes and the leadership of our elected officials, the curve has been flattened and New York is finally winning the battle against COVID-19. But our small businesses are in a world of hurt. Now it's time to get all New Yorkers back to work. The rezoning of Industry City will create and retain more than 20,000 jobs, spur a billion dollars in private investment and generate $100 million in annual tax revenue. This pandemic highlighted the need to have manufacturing space in New York City. Nationwide, America has experienced a shortage of both PPE for hospital workers and ventilators for the most critical COVID-19 cases. As companies rethink supply chains, as we are in Queens, having a manufacturing space like Industry City will be a tremendous asset to the entire city. Additionally, we need to ensure that our economic recovery reaches neighborhoods in all five boroughs, not just in traditional business districts. Since the reactivation of Industry City started, more than $400 million of private money has been spent to procure goods and services from area businesses. 35% of Industry City's workforce lives in nearby neighborhoods. At a time when nearly one in five New Yorkers are out of work and our city faces a multi-billion dollar deficit, when small businesses are struggling every single day to survive, we cannot afford to say no to a project that creates jobs. I'm expired. I urge you to support the industry sitting rezoning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair, the next speaker is Regina Meyer. Ms. Myers, you may begin. Starting time. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Regina Meyer, and I'm president of the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, the organization that manages the three business improvement districts in downtown Brooklyn. Previously, I led the De Brooklyn Department of City Planning and the development of Brooklyn Bridge Park. It's a privilege to testify on behalf of Industry City's zoning proposal. I've dedicated my career to Brooklyn's revitalization, and it has never needed your support more than it does right now. I remember well the decades of decline and disinvestment in industry city that mirrored the borough wide collapse of traditional manufacturing. And I have watched in amazement and admiration at the revitalization that's taken place on the massive campus over the last six years. In my view, we should be doing everything we can as a city to support this transformation and seek to re replicate it elsewhere. A recent study by the Center for Urban Future highlighted the incredible growth of the economy in Brooklyn. Startup businesses are being created at a faster pace in Brooklyn than any other borough. And if Brooklyn was its own city, faster than any other city in the country except for San Francisco. The report also shows that these businesses are implying a far more diverse workforce in Brooklyn than in most other cities. The study also recommended the following strategies that are key to the continued growth of the, in, of the economy in Brooklyn, all of which will be facilitated by industry cities rezoning. First, we must continue to create affordable space for small business. Industry city has grown from 190 businesses to, to over 550 in just six years. The rezoning can facilitate doubling, doubling that number to over 1,000 businesses. Second, we must focus additional workforce development initiatives at the local level embedded in growing commercial campuses. Andrew Kimball and his team have achieved immense success with this model at the Navy Yard and repeated this um, with the Innovation Lab at Industry City. We must grow these initiatives. Third, colleges and universities need to directly connect with businesses in the innovation economy. Thank you so much. I support this rezoning and I um, thank you for the time. Thank you. Chair, those are the available speakers for this panel. At this time, to those uh, waiting and listening, I would ask that if your name is Jessica Walker or Catherine Wild, to please raise your hand. Jessica Walker and Catherine Wild, if you are listening, please raise your hand. All right, at that time, um, I will um, hand it over to Councilman Menchaca for questions. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I wanna say thank you to all of you. Um, we, we know each other and all the work that we're doing in, uh, minus Tom, who's in Queens, uh, all the work we're doing together in Brooklyn. I just have one question and that's accountability. Uh, you're all touting the transformation and the work and the jobs 
Uh, I'm glad I, I didn't hear 20,000 jobs because I think we clarified that we were talking about 7,000 new jobs. But how are we going to hold this whole thing accountable? And that's my only question to, to this panel. Wh whomever is um, inspired to speak on that, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, in inspired, that's, a, that's an interesting concept, uh, council member, but thank you um, for posing it. I mean, I think, I think a community benefits agreement was the hope uh, for almost everybody in the community. And um, it's not even clear to me exactly how it fell apart. And maybe you can shed some light on that because there was a group that was working towards a CBA, a group that you selected the members of, uh, a group that you preempted with your coming out against the project before they were able to even report out in terms of what, uh, what the uh, recommendations were to be. Uh, and now it's my understanding that if that group is still meeting, and once again, I'm not privy to any of that, but if, uh, if they are still meeting, uh, there are people on the group who are not even working towards a community benefits agreement, but rather uh, simply there so that they could reaffirm your opposition to the project. So, I, I mean, I would love to see a community benefits agreement that was truly a community benefits agreement that we all could work together on, really, truly all of us, including the issue of displacement, because I think that is something we all agree on. And we look forward to working on that with whomever really does want to step up and, and work on it. And, and I would echo this um, in the in projects that I've worked on throughout the throughout the borough. The it's the longstanding commitment on a CBA that all people bring to the table, and that's something that the city council and Jamestown should be together. Excuse me, Industry City should be together on. And those are the kind of things that can become embedded in meetings in within the community board or some other group. I mean, I, I, as somebody who's not an expert like Randy is on the machinations of Board Seven, I, I, I won't be so presumptuous. But but really, there, there is the space here to devise a process after a CBA where everybody is accountable. And, that, and, and, and I'll admit it, it's work. It's tedious work at times. It's a lot of meetings. So now we know we could do it remotely, but it's a, that kind of commitment that could give you the assurance that month by month commitments are being made and that issues arise. I mean, issues that we've heard even in this hearing today, those are the kind of things that need airing constantly to make sure we get this right. Council member, may I respond as well? Absolutely. So um, I think I'm an honorary Brooklynite. I married a woman from Greenpoint, so I hope that counts. <laughs> okay. um, but in all seriousness, you know, I, I just think we're about the halfway mark of this pandemic. I don't think we've seen the worst yet uh, of the ongoing job crisis. Lots of us are focused on things like restaurants. There's 6,000 restaurants in Queens County. We expect half to never open again. So we're going to see a lot worse losses, uh, I believe, uh, over the course of the next six to nine months, um, unless things drastically change for lots of reasons in lots of areas. But the job functions, whether it's 7,000, 20,000, I think the, the, the advent of something like this is a pebble in the pond. It's, the ripple effects are going to be huge, like many other projects out there. And I do think that it will spur lots of other investments in other areas not only in Brooklyn, but hopefully in places like Queens and the other boroughs as well. Awesome, thank you to this panel. All right, thank you. Are there any other council members that are on the panel that wish to ask questions? All right, seeing none, council, um, can you please call in the next panel? Chair, the next panel will include Eric Goldstein, Lou Daly, Peter Iwanowitz, and Shay O'Reilly. The following panel will include Pat Whalen, Jacqueline Capriles, Eric Ailman, Chris Taylor, and Shalini Norman. Excuse me, Chair. Uh, if if uh, Jessica Jessica Walker and Catherine Wild, we ask them to raise their hands. That that concludes this panel. Eric Goldstein will be the next speaker. All right, so we're calling Mr. Eric Goldstein, correct, Council? Yes. All right, Mr. Goldstein, you may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Eric Goldstein, New York City Environment Director at the Natural Resources Defense Council. I'm gonna summarize my testimony and identify three issues of concern from our review of the final environmental impact statement. First, does the project's plan for significant new office space construction makes sense in a post-COVID-19 world 
where demand for workplace office space is likely to be significantly reduced for years. The project envisions hundreds of thousands of square feet of new office space, but these changed circumstances uh, are significant and the bottom is dropping out of the New York office market. Change circumstances are significant enough to warrant an update to the environmental an analysis prior to council action on the proposed rezoning. And uh, the council needs to ask itself, does this plan make sense in today's world? A second concern involves the dangers from the project's precarious location along the Brooklyn waterfront. In an era of climate change, when new construction is expected to last 80 or even 100 years, city officials should look very skeptically at major new proposed construction in flood zones. But the final environmental impact statement fails to spell out detailed measures to ensure that all necessary steps will be taken to minimize flooding and storm surge impacts on the project site and the surrounding community. Finally, the proposal is inconsistent with various government resiliency and coastal planning goals and objectives. Mayor de Blasio's one NYC 2050 plan commits the city to refine and strengthen climate resiliency design guidelines to propose updates to the city's building code and to advance citywide zoning amendments to advance resiliency protection for all New Yorkers. The speaker's Securing Our Future Climate Change Plan, which we really like, calls for the development of the Five Borough Resiliency Plan. But these enhancements haven't yet been in, in implemented yet. Advancing one of New York's largest waterfront development projects in years without the benefit of such needed reforms is unwise. We spell out these and other concerns in our written statements and I thank you. I'm inspired. Thank you. Okay, the next witness is Lou Daly. All right, Ms. Daly, you may begin. Starting time. Mr. Daly? Yes, hi. All right, you may begin. I was having trouble getting, getting unmuted, sorry. Uh, thank you to council members for this opportunity to comment on Industry City's rezoning application. Um, I am Lou Daly, I'm a senior policy analyst with Demos, a public policy think tank focusing on racial and economic justice and based here in New York City. The application in question should be denied. I will focus on the central questions of jobs and climate change in my remarks. First, to my knowledge, as we've heard today, Industry City's projection of supporting 15,000 or 20,000 jobs or maybe only 7,000 new jobs um, has not been fully explained or subject to public scrutiny or peer review and should be viewed with great skepticism. Among other questions, is this projection a jobs ceiling, assuming an overinflated occupancy rate by employers, even by pre-COVID standards, let alone post-COVID standards? And how much of this employment will be comprised of permanent good paying full-time jobs for local residents? Almost certainly the answer is a small fraction. Overpromising on jobs numbers and underperforming on job quality for local residents is a hallmark of this kind of commercial development in many cities. The rezoning will further lock Sunset Park into a pattern of retail and office jobs replacing industrial jobs and average wages for local residents will fall as retail employment expands at the expense of manufacturing. Moreover, local small businesses will be put in harmful competition with new vendors catering to the more affluent consumption of transplanted innovation economy workers. Green jobs to supply our communities with climate solutions are the future of our economy and the future of Sunset Park. But this is at most an afterthought in the industry city proposal. Sunset Park is poised to become a major regional hub of the clean energy transition with sufficient public investment as will be necessary to achieve the mandates of state I'm and inspired. municipal climate laws. Uh, I will submit the rest of my um, testimony by email. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you. Chair, sure, the next speaker is Peter Iwanowicz. So Iwanowicz, you may begin. Good afternoon, thank you very much. Last year, New York State enacted the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. The New York Times actually called this law one of the world's most ambitious climate plans. And I gotta be honest, um, I represent environmental advocates in New York. We're Albany based and I've been working on environmental policy in Albany for nearly 30 years. And I have to say that it was really breathtaking to see the legislature and the governor heed calls and indeed follow the lead of communities that are on the front lines of the climate crisis. 
the climate law that they adopted was written by those on the front lines for the front lines. This law shifts the entire economy, all of it, all buildings, all vehicles, all homes, everything will be powered by 100% clean renewables in less than 30 years. It is indeed a bold response to the climate crisis and our economic crisis. And it requires deep and sustained engagement with communities, especially those that are on the front lines of the climate crisis, our black and brown communities. The people who live, work and play in these communities bear the brunt of climate impacts. We all know that, there's no denying it. The state law also goes actually further than the New York City Climate Mobilization Act in several key ways. Along with the pollution reduction goals I stated above, the law requires that all state government decisions be screened to ensure that projects are consistent with meeting the pollution reduction mandates of the law. That's why you saw the recent rejection of the, the pipeline by New York State. The law also requires that all government decisions do not burden disadvantaged communities. And finally, the law requires new projects to be reviewed for climate impact risks and resiliency. And it's not just the site, but in the adjoining community, these impacts have to be taken into account. So we think the EIS needs to be improved to look at those as well. To finish up, the grid plan, like our new climate law, is the community-led plan that is consistent with the state climate law. It's the plan that makes sense for the community, the city, the state, and indeed the world. And I asked the New York City Council to do as your colleagues in the state Thanks, capital did, follow the lead of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Here, the next speaker is Shay O'Reilly. O'Reilly, you may begin. Thank you very much. Starting time. Good, af good afternoon, Council. My name is Shay O'Reilly and I am a senior organizing representative for the Sierra Club. I am proud to be here in solidarity with the people of Sunset Park. The Sierra Club has organized for years to support our state's clean energy goals. We were a ma major supporters of offshore wind long before our state's first commitment, and we continue to advocate alongside our community partners for strong community benefits and labor standards as these projects move forward. New York City has been vocal in acknowledging that our climate is changing due to human activity. We know that our power plants, automobiles, and boilers are leading to a destabilizing of our planet's weather and patterns. In this pressing crisis, I am calling upon the city council to reject industry city's rezoning application. There is a model of development based on luxury real estate with the general notion that as property values rise, the city's coffers swell. This model of development has failed. It has resulted in the displacement of our city's people, the conversion of neighborhoods into corporate monoculture and a particular fiscal vulnerability to natural disasters like COVID-19. As the crisis of climate change worsens, this model will only fail more wretchedly the yawning gap between rich and poor in gentrified neighborhoods tears the social fabric that allows people to weather disasters. It leads to individual lifeboat politics instead of the mustering of shared resources. This failed model also decimates our ability to maintain the industrial facilities that can build the technologies we need for our energy transition. Sunset Park's working waterfront is a crucial resource for our city and state and perhaps even our region. Uprose's Green Resilient Industrial District rightly identifies that the state and city's climate goals necessitate an expansion of the state's industrial sector. And it lays out a roadmap from Sunset Park's own residents, those most hard hit by COVID and most in danger of displacement to put their neighborhood resources to work. Critical here is the ability to expand offshore wind jobs beyond simply the operations and maintenance jobs mentioned by Industry City to allow for local supply chain manufacturing as the industry comes to fruition. There is no more time for failed development that creates new playgrounds for the rich and low level service jobs for everyone else. We are on the cusp I'm of expired economy. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, that's the last speaker for this panel. Okay. Uh, so I, um, Councilman Menchaca, do you uh, have any questions? No questions for me. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so um, I guess, Council, you can uh, bring in the next panel. And I will be handing this off to the chair of the subcommittee, Council Member uh, Moya. You can call in the next panel, Council. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Thank you for uh, stepping in. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just a quick announcement. We're going to take a brief break um, for five minutes, and then we will uh, 
be back. Thank you everyone for your patience. The meeting will now stand at ease.
All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are ready to reconvene the zoning meeting. Thank you. Chair Moya, the next panel will be Pat Whalen, Jacqueline Capriles, Eric Ailman, Chris Taylor, Shalini Norman, and Catherine Wild. And the panel after that will be Ben Margolis, Liliana Polo McKenna, Julio Pena Pena III, and Cynthia Felix. The first speaker on this panel will be Pat Whalen. Time begins now. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am completely dumbfounded that during this time of historic economic crisis, we are still debating the merits of the industry city rezoning. Any and all debates should be over now. We are losing jobs and the businesses that provide them faster than anything I've witnessed in my life. During this very long extended process, I have watched group, small groups that supposedly represent our community try to hijack this process. I'm disgusted how outright lies and personal attacks replaced healthy collaboration and common sense. I am dismayed with those who have privately supported this huge opportunity for our community, but publicly lack the courage to stand up. I am most disgusted with the narrative that our residents are only able to work last century factory jobs. I run one of those factories and have for over 30 years. I'm a long-term part of this industrial waterfront a hell of a lot longer than some of the others you will hear today. Our local leaders have had decades to activate this waterfront and this property, decades of lost opportunity. We absolutely cannot let a narrative of fear and local politics harm our city's comeback and our children's future. Eric Adams stood up to this narrative. City planning saw right through the posturing. And now it is the city council's time to have the wisdom and courage to stand up. Not for me not for my team who is relying on this project, not even for Industry City. Stand up for the opportunities for our youth. Stand up for the many that cannot speak today. There is an outlined path to get this done. The City Council must take this plan and make it the beginning of our comeback, not just a Sunset Park comeback, but a resounding New York City comeback. We need a vote of confidence for the future of New York City at a time we desperately need hope. Thank you. Chair, the next speaker will be Jacqueline Capriles. Thank you. Time begins. Hello. Hi. I grew up in Sunset Park and I have seen the transformation of our neighborhood and the evolution of what Industry City is today. Growing up, we considered Third Avenue a bad neighborhood. The buildings were detapulated. We saw rats and rodents run up and down those alleys while drug addicts and prostitutes hung out there. Today, Industry City is a far cry from what we had. Not only did they clean up the buildings, but they cleaned up the neighborhood. The changes they made were impactful. They came in with a vision of innovation, job creation, and overall economic development. The Innovation Lab provides job training, including immigration classes for our community and paid internships to our high school students. They created local events for the community and gave us a positive place to gather. The investment that Industry City has made in Sunset Park is evident in what they have already done and continue to do. They have done this all without public funding. The rents are indeed going up, but so are property taxes, utilities, and health insurance. This is a city-wide problem, not just in Sunset Park. So why are we blaming Industry City for this? I live and work in Sunset Park, and I see opportunities being created every day. I want the council to know that this is not only about business, but it's about our children's future. I want our children to thrive here as well. I want a sustainable future for them through the growth of this neighborhood. And this is why I support the industry city rezoning. Thank you. Chair, the next speaker will be Eric Ailman. Time begins. Hi everybody. Name is Eric Aleman. Born, raised in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, New York. Been having my business for nine years now, three years here at Industry City. Growing up, opportunity and career paying jobs seem to just be found in Manhattan skyline. We would have to take filthy long train rides just to look for a job. 
now Industry City has offers a new option for career work, just walking distance. Um, Industry City has invested so much of its own money to fix in the streets and this, this barbershop where I'm at now, growing up, it was chained up and was and it act as a backdrop to prostitution, crack being sold, just feet away from where my shop is now. I see families shopping. I see families um, coming in here on days off just to take a stroll. I see people in the neighborhood working, despite the lack of efforts being made by our, our leadership into bridging the opportunity with the necessity of the job. I hear, I hear our leadership talking about how they can hold Industry City accountable and that the years that they've been investing private money and we've seen actual change that we could put our finger on. We're saying that that is not enough, but I would question, how can we hold them accountable? This was in their hands for so many decades and they did absolutely nothing. No career jobs, have absolutely nothing to offer. We have people holding signs right in front of me of the, of the, the people opposing what it is. But they, um, they expect that I youth to hold signs, but they can't bring them here to get jobs. They're getting paid for it, but they're taking advantage. You can hear them now. They're taking advantage of young artists in their 20s. I'm sorry? Sergeant at Arms, we have a. We have some background noise there. Is there someone else who's coming in there? That's uproads trying to make noise. They're right in front of my shop right now. They don't want me to talk because they exploit our youth. They don't want the jobs to reach here. And they don't want me to speak. See, this is opportunity. This is the best opportunity we have. Our leaders don't have anything to offer but fear, but anger. Industry City has been offering jobs and with the rezoning, this could just multiply what, what it already does. Local entrepreneurs, we're royalty in the neighborhood. Local entrepreneurs could open up new businesses. Our youth coming back with college degrees could get jobs as, and avoid being exploited by these opposing people that they're, they're, they fall guilty of the very thing that they claim to be against. They're taking advantage of our youth. Tiny percent of people are trying to dictate and keep away the opportunity that can best lift up our people. We need these jobs before the rezoning, and we need as much effort being made um, and quick. support and support Industry City. Councilman, we must support Industry City and create jobs. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Thank you, Eric. Chair, the next speaker will be Shalini Norman, if Shalini Norman is available. Time begins. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shalini, and I'm coming to you from my small business at Industry City, Taza Market. Came here six years ago, and I saw the place, and I never imagined that a year and a half I would be here owning this business. Without Industry City, mm. I would not be able to have had the opportunity to showcase the food that I grew up eating and the culture that I have. The two things that Industry City asked us to do when we came here was one, to hire local, which we did. We hired this amazing girl who was a graphic, wanted to be a graphic designer. And the support that she got from this community here from helping to apply to the college, which classes to take was immense. Not only that, her boyfriend also took coding classes at Innovation Lab. Anyone walking through Industry City can tell you and see that I am surrounded by small businesses. I am one of them. We would not be here today, pre-pandemic or even post-pandemic without the support that we have received from Industry City. To say that they want large businesses only is a false statement. We the amount of small businesses and the makers and the innovators that I see every day coming to eat, to be a part of this community is immense and it only grows. We need this to be able to grow our business, to hire more people, to offer the opportunities to the local communities. We wouldn't be able to do that if Industry City was not here. It's just, the community that has been built, it is amazing to see how um, people right. come together. 
Chair, the next speaker will be Catherine Wild. Thank you. Time begins. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you see me? We can't see you, but you can begin. Cannot? Now, can. okay, now. So I'm a 50-year uh, resident of Southwest Brooklyn, much of that time spent living and working in Sunset Park, now in Bay Ridge. I have a deep personal understanding of the tremendous benefit that Industry City has brought to the surrounding, uh, to the redevelopment of the sites around the Brooklyn waterfront and of the and the benefits to the community. And I believe that the rezoning and the planned expansion of the project is essential to continuing the positive impact that this has had on our on our local community. There are no alternate proposals, climate or otherwise, to the rezoning that are realistic, that can happen in the near term, and that can advance the kind of positive agenda for jobs and small business that Industry City provides. This is not a choice between two visions for the Sunset Park waterfront. It's a choice between something and nothing. Opposition to the project before the pandemic was driven by fear of gentrification and displacement. Certainly, as, as was opposition to many projects throughout the city as people felt that their concerns, the community concerns were not being addressed. And I will say appropriately felt that. Certainly, we all recognize that the primary threat to Sunset Park today, post COVID and with what we face in terms of the economic consequences of the pandemic, we are no longer threatened by gentrification but rather the big threat is unemployment, poverty, lack of access to quality education, deteriorating city services. People without jobs or without viable businesses cannot pay the rent, cannot pay their mortgages, cannot care for their families. That's the danger that faces us today. That's the solution that Industry City will help provide to Sunset Park and the surrounding area. Uh, the needs of our communities have changed dramatically in the past seven months, and the developers of Industry City are prepared to adjust their plans to reflect those needs, jobs, business opportunity, and growth. Thank you. Those are the witnesses, Chair, available for this panel. However, at this time, I would ask that if Chris Taylor is available and listening, and able to raise your hand, please do so. Chris Taylor. And uh, Chair, uh, Councilmember Machaca has his hand raised for a question. Councilmember Machaca. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to all the businesses. I know we've been in many rooms uh, talking about this application and uh, your incredible work in the community to bring jobs to the neighborhood. Um, I want to ask about the industry city application itself and the rezoning, which is the topic of this panel and this decision at the city council. What are specific proposed uses out of that application that will benefit your business? And if I can get a one or two to kind of talk a little bit about that, I have a couple more, more questions to the businesses directly. Uh, either Pat or Jacqueline. Pat, you have your hand up? I don't know what to do here. How do I do this? Well, look, I can start with saying that it'll help my business because I am an electrical contractor and uh, we do want to work with Industry City in the development of, of Sunset Park. So it would help us. And, uh, and, and being able to do that is, is important. I also want to be able to contribute to the vocational schools because not everybody can go to college. I know that because here in this neighborhood, most of the people that live here are tradespeople. And so I am looking for electricians to work with, but I need them to be uh, you know, trained the proper way. And so not everybody can jump into uh, doing that type of work. So that it would help my business this way. Okay, and would you, uh, and Pat, before you go, the, the kind of follow up is, would you be okay in signing a lease with Industry City? Uh, they're the landlord that would require you to do local hiring uh, at a certain rate that would be somehow negotiated with the community about, um, about the rates of local hiring. Okay. 
I know this is eating up my clock, but I just want to see if we can. Sorry, am I on or is Jacqueline on? Uh, that was a follow up for Jacqueline, but okay. um... I was trying to unmute. Uh, they allowed me to do that now. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, we we would we would sign something because we have to do that now in the city. We do prevailing wage work, and uh, we're required to pay prevailing wage to our electricians. And that is specific to what we have to pay. And these are jobs that are significantly higher in pay. Uh, so the city is what mandates what we have to pay. And then and we, we sign up for that. We actually pay the employees that rate. So we would do that. We do that Thank anyway. You. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for that. And Pat, you want to talk a little bit about the rezoning and how it would help your business? Uh, oh, absolutely. You would be able to uh, engage in a lease that really uh, uh, kept you accountable to local hiring. Yeah, well, you addressed this at one of the community board meetings. And um, I said that you don't really need something in a lease to encourage local hiring. It's been part of my policy for 30 plus years. I want people from the community. You know, I want people from the community. I know that. You know, the, the uh, part of me wanting to get involved here, and I said this in my testimony, it's not about me. It's about the future for my kids and the future for the people in Sunset Park and offering them opportunities that weren't available to me 40, 50 years ago. Um, well, and, and frankly, so good. Well, just so I could get to the, the, the bit of, the, of, of what you bring to this conversation, uh, mm -hmm. you've expressed often in our conversations mm -hmm. about the conflicts between pedestrian cyclists <laughs> um, and trucks that are critical to your specific business uh, yeah. and industrial businesses. And as an owner of a legacy food manufacturing uh, company, a brand, Sahadi's, like, what are you, uh, how are you thinking about all of this as Industry City starts to activate a very kind well, of retail component? Uh, frankly, I, I think you know this, is that I was very hesitant when they when they took over and, and I talked to Andrew right in the beginning because I was very concerned as an industrial business in Sunset Park not being able to operate. Um, and very quickly, I changed my tune as they expanded and uh, I realized that for me to continue to operate and run giant tractor trailers in and out of New York City to ship to the rest of the country, I was not going to be able to do that for much longer. The opportunity Andrew City presented to me was to get into the retail and expand the retail part of our business with enough breadth and depth to use the factory and the people who work in the factory to support front end retail. It became right. our path and our solution, which is why I'm so on board with this. And it's so critical to me that Industry City succeeds because you know, we're a hundred year old family business in New York City, hundred plus. Yeah. And <laughs> store number two opened a year ago in industry. Oh, it's fine. Sorry, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a, I, I think maybe if I could, if I could just take back a couple of those seconds and ask hey. somebody on the panel to talk about accountability. This is the question I have across the board. Uh, the proposal is one thing, but holding industry city accountable is incredibly important to the community. Uh, and the three pillars that I put up, you know, how are we going to hold industry city accountable when there's no CBA and there's no mayoral commitments to the entire package to mitigate those issues that we all know and see. If you want me to talk, I would say, I think we owe it to both the neighborhood and industry city to come up with a CBA as quickly as we can. I think that, that, Andrew wants to see that. I think that anybody that lives in New York City wants to see that. Um, it has to be realistic. There has to be an economic benefit to Industry City to be able to get community benefits. And if we don't get that on the plate quickly, I, I think that you know it's it's going to cause a hindrance to this. I think it's important. As far as mineral import, I don't think the City Council can force that, and I don't think Industry City can force that. You know, I, I do believe, um, as Randy said, that we, we should address somehow um, mitigating gentrification. And one of the ways we can do that, I think, is part of a CBA if we can't get more oil import. It's, it, I'm sorry, uh, input. It's, it's going to be difficult, but I think that that can certainly get broached. Okay. I'm out of time, so thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Here, I see no more members with questions at this time for this panel. Great. 
Thank you to the panelists. Thank you for uh, coming here and uh, waiting so patiently and giving your testimony here today. Thank you so much. Council, if you can please call the next panel. Thank you. So the next panel will include New York State Senator Belmanette Montgomery. The panel after that will include Ben Margolis, Liliana Polo McKenna, Julio Peña III, David Estrada, and Cynthia Felix. The next speaker is New York State Senator Belmanette Montgomery. Can, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? We can hear you, Senator. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair uh, Moya and members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm State Senator Belmanette Montgomery and uh, I represent Senate District 25 where Sunset Park and the Industry City site is located. Today, I make myself present as a full supporter of Industry City's rezoning proposal. For more than 50 years, Industry City has remained a heavy manufacturing zoning site, which has limited the extent to which it serves the community and utilizes its waterfront. We have seen many changes come to Brooklyn, and it is time to extend these changes to this part of our working waterfront. As many of you may know, I have been a strong advocate for the thoughtful and responsible redevelopment of Brooklyn's working waterfront. Industry City's rezoning proposal is the right project, in my estimation, to elevate both the waterfront and our community. Industry City's commitment to the community is unquestionable. They took part in more community engagements than any other developer I have ever met, and there have been many of these developers, and they crafted their proposal to directly reflect Community Board 7's 197A Waterfronts Plan. As of today, Industry City has served and continues to serve hundreds of local job seekers through their Innovation Lab, which is an integrated employment and business development center to provide local job seekers access to career training and job placement. They have provided space that has allowed new and small business to serve our community. They have removed the hotel and, the re and reduced the amount of retail space from their original rezoning plan as was requested by myself, by the community, and I believe by the city council member. They have actively pushed for green jobs and sustainability in Sunset Park. They have partnered with the Red Hook Container Terminal, NYSERDA, and New York City Economic Development Corporation in redeveloping the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal in order to serve as a port that will service the offshore wind industry, which NYSERDA will be creating. NYSERDA is an authority committed to bringing offshore clean, green, and renewable energy to the state of New York. Thanks to Industry City's role in the adjacent South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, hundreds of high quality green jobs in the offshore wind and maritime industry are coming to this part of Brooklyn. Industry City is committed to creating educational, and professional pathways to maritime and STEAM careers for young people in our borough and in our city. They have forged partnerships with academic institutions, including New York City College of Technology and potentially, which I am very excited about, Kingsborough Community College in their commitment to establish a public technical school and an adult education center once the rezoning takes place. Several years ago, I initiated a number of important community conversations around the future of the working waterfront, and we hosted a series of extremely productive workshops and working group meetings to discuss our goals and interests for developing the waterfront. What we heard over and over was that we needed waterfront development that was reflective of the community's interests that was inclusive, that was sustainable, and could support the growth of green jobs. 
that protected long time job creating spaces from becoming luxury housing and condos or and or hotels and that whatever was built had mechanisms for ensuring local residents could benefit from any new jobs created. I believe this rezoning plan meets these requirements vis-a-vis -vis our community. And it is important to mention that not only does the plan restore job creation to the Sunset Park waterfront, but it does so with hundreds of millions in private investment and no public subsidies. Today, if you listen to the plans of vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Kimball, who, by the way, I have worked with closely during his years at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and who fulfilled every commitment he made in revitalizing that waterfront site. You can see exactly why I have chosen to offer my full support. In this case, and after a career spent fighting for our working waterfront, I do believe in my heart that this is what's best for Sunset Park at this time. It is the best thing for Brooklyn and it is the best possible use of this important space for the city of New York. Therefore, I urge you to join me in support of this proposal. And thank you for allowing me to express my sentiments and my beliefs and my understanding of what this means to the people and especially the future generations in the County of Kings, in the city of New York. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for your testimony today. Here, I see no more questions, see no uh, members with questions for this panel. Uh, thank you again, Senator. Um, uh, we are now going to move into our, our next panel. Uh, Council, if you can please call up the next panel. Well, the next panel will include Ben Margolis, Liliana Pola McKenna, Julio Pena III, David Estrada, and Cynthia Felix. They will be followed by Jonathan Bowles, Michael Stamatis, David Carabello Baloso, and Jessica Ortiz. The next speaker on this panel will be Ben Margolis. It begins now. Ben, you may begin. Good afternoon. I'm Ben Margolis, Executive Director of SBIDC, a nonprofit supporting industrial businesses and their workforce in the Southwest Brooklyn IBZ and from our workforce center at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. We've been based in Sunset Park for 42 years. We're also a proud member of the Sunset Park Community Coalition that believes the industry city application as approved by the City Planning Commission and without modifications by the council would not ensure necessary protections or address Sunset Park's fundamental challenges. For example, challenges facing Sunset Park's manufacturing community. The pandemic has shown the great need for more local manufacturing and its value to the city's resiliency the quality of industrial jobs is well established, yet current zoning and policy offers zero protections for manufacturers in Sunset Park's IBZ, including the hundreds still operating in, at Industry City. So the council must fight to ensure that at least a third of the IC's campus is used for a wide range of manufacturing uses, an irreducible minimum, a real commitment that would guarantee more opportunities for residents. Nearly 1 million square feet of retail would severely impact operations of industrial employers and set an ir irreversible precedent for the city's other IBZs. So a total retail limit should be established based on Community Board 7 recommendations. Our coalition recommends 350,000 square feet. In 2018, the city council voted to curtail hotels in light manufacturing zones. So 
So following current city policy, you should ensure that hotel development will not be permissible at IC. The current application passed with no modification is our worst case scenario. Yet any modifications would mean little unless they come in tandem with substantial community investments and are most severely burdened and challenged. Without each, the city council should request that industry city withdraw their application. Thanks so much. The next speaker is Liliana Polo McKenna. Good afternoon, all. My name is Liliana Polo McKenna, Chief Executive Officer of Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow. OBT, founded in 1983 in Sunset Park, offers education and workforce programming for youth ages 17 to 24 and adults who are disconnected from education and employment. OBT is also a member of the Sunset Park Community Coalition. Thank you to the members of the council for the opportunity to speak today. Along with the community board, the borough president and council member Menchaca's recommendations, our coalition feels strongly that the industry, that industry city needs to follow through on public commitments to modify their application. Such modifications include, among others, scaling down the proposed retail square footage to align with CB7's recommendations and an enforceable 30% of space dedicated to manufacturing uses. These and other modifications work in tandem to support a platform of investments to address a variety of issues, longstanding needs that have only grown through the pandemic. As a workforce development leader, I am crystal clear on the need for jobs, a concern that I know we all share as people navigate historic unemployment and many face eviction and food insecurity. As the lead partner at the Innovation Lab, I've seen the possibilities and also the challenges in connecting local residents to opportunities at Industry City. The potential for scale is real, but Industry City is not an employer and scale without binding commitments to local hiring, permanent training facilities and creating a range of jobs is short-sighted. Capping retail and establishing a third party enforcement mechanism are critical to that. Many of us, myself included, know that access to jobs on this very waterfront has been an important first step for Sunset Park families and we need to ensure that that is true well into the future. As a coalition, we believe that the approval of Industry City's application as is represents a worst case scenario. The zoning modifications outlined are the absolute minimum and serve as a foundation for investment. If equity is a central value in this process and in the city's economic recovery, the outlined zoning modifications and further community investments must be non-negotiables as the council considers its vote. Thank you. Here, the next speaker is Julio Pena III. Time begins. Julio, you may begin. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julio Pena III, board chair for Neighbors Helping Neighbors and board member for Fifth Avenue Committee, uh, both members of the Sunset Park Community Coalition. Uh, thank you to the council for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm here to share the concerns that I and the Sunset Park Community Coalition have about the industry city rezoning application as is and the modifications and investments necessary should the council uh, allow this application to move forward. Uh, NHN is a 30 year old HUD certified housing counseling agency whose mission is to empower low and moderate income residents to maintain and secure quality housing and build financial assets. NHN is on the front lines of preventing displacement in Sunset Park, organizing and advocating to help prevent eviction and displacement. In fact, as a 42-year-old nonprofit community development corporation whose mission is to advance economic and social justice. FAC currently has 134 units of deeply and permanently affordable housing and construction in Sunset Park, the first new affordable housing in the community in more than 15 years. Along with the community board, the borough president, and Councilmember Machaca, the coalition feels strongly that industry city needs to follow through on public commitments to modify the application and address the significant precedent and impacts their initially proposed actions would create in an IBZ in the broader sense of our community, which has long been a working class immigrant community. Such modifications must include, for example, scaling down on the proposed retail square footage and uses to 350,000 square feet, eliminating the hotel special permit in the application and establishing an irreducible and highly enforceable one third amount of square feet on their campus for manufacturing uses. In addition to the modifications to the application, it is important that the council and the city do more to protect longtime foreign working class Sunset Park residents from displacement by extending the Certificate of No Harassment Program to Sunset Park and invest in affordable housing preservation and development. As NYU Furman Center outlined in the 2016 Focus on Gentrification Report, Sunset Park is a gentrifying community with rising rents, rising population, and increasing white population. It ranks fourth in New York City for overcrowding and housing among all community boards citywide. Sorry. There has been a lot of focus Thank you for your time. Thank Here's you. The Chair, the next speaker is David Estrada. 
starts. David, you may begin. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm. My name is David Estrada, and I'm speaking today to urge you to oppose the application in its current form. And without contradiction, I'm also urging you to consider how a highly modified application might proceed, uh, but only if it's in lockstep with city commitments to Sunset Park and ironclad enforceable community benefits on a model that we haven't seen before. It is possible, but there are many cautionary tales in Brooklyn of failed CBAs, and we're very aware of that. I'm speaking today in my capacity as executive director of the Sunset Park Business Improvement District. Uh, that's representing small businesses, residents, uh, building owners on the, in the heart of Sunset Park on Fifth Avenue between 38th and 64th. We are suffering. Small business needs help. Uh, I think that uh, a path of engagement and constructive work together is the way for our community to get ahead. Uh, I also am part of this Sunset Park Community uh, Benefit Coalition. Uh, and, you know, we, we formed because we knew that these land use items can either diminish or increase the very serious problems facing Sunset Park, displacement, gentrification, housing and food security, climate, resilience, just transitions, access to education and jobs. Those needs are real. The question is, can we set a new example for this city about how to do this together? Um, Though it's a private application, uh, I, I do think it's appropriate to look at it on the scale of a neighborhood application, even if ULERP and Seeker and environmental impact processes are all hopelessly dysfunctional and extremely unfair to local communities. For this application and for me, in my perception, the answer has never been yes or no. Uh, no, leading to continued as of right uh, development is unacceptable because it allows unlimited degradation of manufacturing uses for office and storage and such. A simple yes is a non-starter without the other components that were laid out by Council Member Menchaca right. at the onset. So I look, uh, I, I urge you to read Community Board 7's uh, analysis and the Borough Presidents, and I support working together. Thank you. Thank you, David. Mayor Moya, those are the visible witnesses for this panel at this time. I would ask if Cynthia Felix is listening and can hear me. Cynthia Felix, you're asked to please raise your hand so that we may identify you if you are here. Cynthia. And with that, uh, Chair Councilmember Manchaka has his hand raised for a question. I, they just unmuted me. Okay, the next speaker, Cynthia Felix. Hi, thank you. My name is Cynthia Felix and I'm a lifelong resident of Sunset Park and a member of the Sunset Park Community Coalition. Cynthia. We might've lost Cynthia or did she get I just. Muted? I was muted. I think I just got okay. unmuted. Hold on one second, Cynthia. Hold on. Okay. If, if the subject arms, if we can just start all over again. Let me set the clock again. Cynthia? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you may begin. Thank you. My name is Cynthia Felix, and I'm a lifelong resident of Sunset Park and member of the Sunset Park Community Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm here to share the concerns that I and the Sunset Park Community Coalition have about industry city rezoning application as is and the modifications necessary as the council consider this application. I have lived in Sunset Park my entire life. I have seen the good, the bad and the ugly. The good and my great neighbors are what keeps me here. The bad and the ugly inspire me to do all I can to make my community better. My parents immigrated to Sunset Park in the 1950s from the Dominican Republic, and my mother worked tirelessly as a seamstress as a factory on Second Avenue, so I know firsthand the struggles that immigrants have, and I'm grateful that every struggle made my family stronger. To me, my Sunset Park is like my family. Every struggle has made us stronger as a community. Today, we are struggling with the industry city rezoning application as approved by the city planning commission as the current application does not ensure necessary protections and does not address Sunset Park's and fundamental challenges. Our community does need a development that has economic growth, but it also must improve the lives of our residents, many who are immigrants like my parents and are struggling to make a better life for themselves and their families, as well as those who have low educational atten uh, uh, attainment who are underemployed or work a low wage job. Industry City must follow through on the public commitments to modify 
the application and address the impacts their initially proposed actions would have not only in the IBZ, but the broader Sunset Park community. Some of these modifications include scaling down the proposed retail to the community board's recommendation of 350,000 square feet, eliminating the hotel special permit, and establishing an irreducible minimum of one third of the campus for manufacturing and industrial uses. These modifications must work in tandem to support a platform of investment in the community that include investing in education, training, and hiring the local workforce for quality jobs, especially for those with barriers to commitments to with barriers to employment. I care deeply about the impact this rezoning may have, and without these modifications, the City Council should request in this city withdraw the application or vote against it should it come to a vote. If equity is a central value in this process and in the city's economic Thanks. recovery, thank you for your time. Thank you, Cynthia. Chair Moya, Council Member Menchaca has his hand raised for a question on this panel. Okay. I turn it over to Council Member Menchaca for the questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair and Cynthia and Julio and David and Ben and Liliana and Jesse and others in, the, in this team. Uh, um, thank you. Again, thank you. Enough. I don't have enough time on the clock right now to say thank you for the work that you've done to this point. Uh, and for your testimony today. Uh, so much of what you have testified really is rooted in your work, in your organization, uh, and your commitment to Sunset Park. Uh, and and I, I guess my, my first question is, part of today's conversation with uh, Andrew Kimball really uh, hinged upon the three different components of the framework, and your work was one of them. I asked about communication between industry, industry city and all of you. And if there's an opportunity for you to talk a little bit about any communication that you've had with industry city, I think uh, members in the council would be uh, appreciative of that. Um, what has been your communication with industry city thus far? And maybe one of you can take that on. Good afternoon, council member. Um, we, have, we as a coalition have made contact with Industry City, but there have been no negotiations on any CBA items or terms. Okay, thank you. Uh, legal representation, do you have legal representation supporting your work uh, in any way? For guidance, uh, we've, we have had and still have access to pro bono counsel. For potential negotiations, we're exploring, but don't have current representation. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have any concerns about signing a CBA at this point um, in the timeline that would create an ironclad strong CBA that the community would feel proud of uh, in the, the efforts for transparency and holistic cross-sectional um, development of such a CBA? I'd like to let other folks uh, also answer, but you know, from our experience as a coalition and, and, and having been on other neighborhood coalitions, uh, you know, we believe it takes months to negotiate a legally binding agreement of this magnitude. That said, this has been a completely atypical process and it still seems to be moving forward. So we have to believe an enforceable agreement could be achieved. It's technically possible, but we're concerned about the timeline. And I'll give anybody else an opportunity to answer that uh, before I move on to some other questions. This is David. I'm, I, I, I share that concern. Our eyes are wide open. The hour is late. The stakes are high. The risks are real. Uh, the chances of success are a narrow, a narrow lane. Um, but I think we owe it to our business community, our residents, and the people of Sunset Park to try, to keep work, to, to try. Um, just walking away from this, just doesn't seem right, um, not, in this, not in this moment. Um, and I'm speaking it, it, it to the current sense right now. Um, we've got to keep working. And, but we only have to work in ways we're uncomfortable with. And I'm, I'm okay with that. But, but we have to go into that discomfort to arrive at a solution that's workable. And, and, and maybe someone else can talk a little bit about the timing. I know that we were in conversations with Industry City about timing. And you, as a coalition wanting more time, Industry City, and if you could just confirm this, the Industry City uh, really rejected more time to your point that you need more ample time to really build out what you want to build out as a coalition.
Um, can, we can, can we unmute Liliana or um, other members? Yeah. I guess I'm asking for more time. Do you want more? Do you need more time? And could the withdrawing of the application give you the time you need so that you can actually build something that you're proud of? We're we're going to be together as a coalition beyond this process. Um, what brought us together uh, uh, are are the neighborhood's most fundamental challenges and its most vulnerable populations. So, um, you know, as a coalition, we're not here just for this process. We're here beyond because those problems aren't going away, especially in a time when the city is nine billion dollars in debt. So this process is still going and the worst case in our minds is still possible. So we will continue to work. Hi, and sorry, I just got unmuted. I, oh, yes. Sorry about that. Um, I think under ideal circumstances, this application would have been filed with the modifications and the focus over the past number of months would have been solely on investments to make in the community. I think as, as a coalition, uh, what has become pretty apparent in the past few weeks is ensuring that we really avoid what, as, as you've heard described as a worst case scenario, um, which is this application moving forward without any modifications, knowing even that the modifications alone are, are insufficient. Um, would more time be helpful? Of course, I think that that's undeniable. And I think that's just, that's just important to the nature of where we are right now. Um, and Chair, I have a couple more questions if I could just uh, Carlos, we have a, a long list of people here. Uh, okay. We're going to go into the late hours. We want to give people the opportunity to really come and testify. We don't want to lose folks as the day gets on. So we're going to move this along. Um, uh, I want to just say thank you to this coalition and for your incredible work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council, any other questions for this panel? Chair, I see no members uh, with further questions for this panel. Great. Thank you so much for uh, your time and giving your testimony here today. We really appreciate it. Um, Council, if you can please call the next panel. Moya, the next panel will include Jonathan Bowles, Michael Stamatis, David Caraballoso, and Jessica Ortiz. That panel will be followed by Juan Camilo Osorio, Ronald Schiffman, Ava Hanhart and Deviani Guha. The next speaker on this panel will be Jonathan Bowles. Clock is ready. Jonathan, you may begin. Hi, I'm Jonathan Bowles, Executive Director of the Center for an Urban Future, a think tank focused on creating a more inclusive economy in New York. I support the proposed rezoning because I strongly believe that industry city is crucial to producing the well-paying, accessible jobs of the future. The first report I authored, I authored at the center way back in 1999 argued that New York needed to do a lot more to preserve and grow industrial jobs. I was convinced that New York could stem the losses in the manufacturing sector, which had long been a ticket to the middle class. Manufacturing jobs are still vital middle-class jobs. There just aren't enough of them left to be the primary focus of our efforts to What's that? You can proceed. There just aren't enough of them left to be the primary focus of our efforts to lift New Yorkers out of poverty. Since that report I authored, the city lost two thirds of its manufacturing jobs. Even during the last five years, before the pandemic, manufacturing jobs in the city declined by 10,000, even as all other private sector jobs in the city increased by 450,000. We now need other strategies to move low-income New Yorkers into good jobs. One should be to nurture the well-paying jobs that are already growing rapidly in New York while dramatically increasing efforts to make those industries more inclusive. Where good jobs have been growing, it's largely been in the innovation economy, particularly in the tech and creative industries, exactly the kinds of jobs that have been created at Industry City. These jobs will continue to drive job growth. Indeed, during the pandemic, both the tech and creative industries have held up better than nearly every other part of the economy. Other cities are laying out the red carpet to poach these good jobs from New York. We need to keep them here and lay the groundwork for additional growth now more than ever. We can help by supporting this rezoning. We must also do a lot more to expand access to the innovation Time jobs. Expired. 
Industry City has been one of the leaders in doing this. Thank you. Here, the next speaker will be Michael Stamatis. Buck is ready. Michael, you may begin. Michael? All right there, I was uh, still muted. Um, good afternoon, muted. everyone. My name is Michael Stamatis, the president of the Red Hook Container Terminal and the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. I'm here today to offer testimony in full support of Industry City's rezoning application. Industry City and Red Hook Terminals began discussions in 2015 with the idea of working jointly to reactivate and bring the long dormant South Brooklyn Marine Terminal back to life. This unique facility in Sunset Park bordered on two sides by Industry City was once a vibrant economic engine and working waterfront facility until its closure in the late 1980s. We put on the cover of our 2016 RFP response to the New York City Economic Development Corp, our vision for the primary use of the site, a state-of-the-art port to serve the emerging offshore wind industry with the potential to bring hundreds of new green jobs to Sunset Park. This undertaking required a strong commitment to the working waterfront and industrial maritime industry here in Brooklyn and substantial resources to bring the vision of a fully reactivated SBMT to fruition. With Industry City, we found the perfect partner. EDC selected us as the RFP winners and we, have, and we now have a long-term lease to redevelop SBMT. With a commitment of 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind from New York State and two contracts awarded to developers Equinor and Orsted to build the first 1,600 megawatts of clean offshore wind farm power to power over a million homes by 2024, SBMT is now positioned to build the largest offshore wind staging and assembly and operations and maintenance port facility in the United States. I cannot underestimate, understate, excuse me, the fact that none of this would be happening or possible at SBMT were it not for the level of support and commitment industry city and its principles have shown to me as their partner in this new joint venture and our shared vision for the future. As a marine terminal oh, operator in New York City, it is not often that I can say a property developer shares the same vision of how a waterfront property such as SBMT should be used. With Industry City's proven track record with the first class transformation of Industry City property of the last five years, we will also attract a brand new industry cluster to offshore wind developers suppliers, vendors, manufacturers, and others to Sunset Park, creating further green jobs and economic benefits to the local community, city, and state. Time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Chair, the next speaker is David Caraballoso. David. Time begins. You may begin, David. Chairman Moya. Honorable members of the subcommittee. My name is David Caraballoso, president of High Rise Concrete Carpenters Local 212, with the men and women who build the New York City skyline. We are the newest of the nine locals that make up the New York City District Council of Carpenters, having been founded in 2016. We are also the most locally based and racially diverse of the Carpenters Locals. Of our approximate 1,000 members, 77% live within the five boroughs and 65% like myself are people of color. More importantly, and relevant to the rezoning or the question of rezoning, over 20% of local two and two members are Brooklynites. And it is on their behalf that I must speak. As a Latino currently living and raised on the edge of Harlem, I understand the struggles of our inner cities and outer boroughs. I know the day-to-day -day struggles faced by my members as I live it with them. I must therefore urge the New York City Council to render a vote in favor of rezoning. It's important that you understand that construction workers are dependent upon development as a means of putting food on the table. Thus far, the administrators of Industry City have shown that they are responsible neighbors, are forthcoming with information and express a sincere willingness to work with the community. 
On behalf of my membership, I thank you for the opportunity to speak on their behalf in favor of rezoning at Industry City. Thank you. Thank you, David. Sure, the next speaker is Jessica Ortiz. Clock is ready. Jessica, good to see you. You may begin. Hello, I'm Jessica Ortiz. I work with 32BJ. I'm speaking on behalf of one of our members that wasn't uh, able to stay. He had to go to work and he works at Industry City. Hi, my name is Humberto Rodriguez. I worked as a cleaner at Industry City for three years. I am also a member of 32BJ and a lifelong resident of Sunset Park. I support the proposed zoning for Industry City, and I will tell you why. The past six months have been extremely difficult for essential workers like me and my coworkers. We've continued to do our jobs through the COVID pandemic. The work we do keeps industry, sanita industry city sanitary and safe. My colleagues and I have been organizing to improve our wages and benefits. In the midst of the pandemic, we were able to secure high quality healthcare benefits that guarantee we can see the doctor that and get the care we need. But for us to improve our jobs for the long term, we need the conditions this rezoning will enable, especially now. All around New York City, commercial projects like Industry City are struggling. Every day we read about empty buildings, businesses shutting down, and tenants packing up and going elsewhere. So I want to see a new investment at Industry City. More resources coming into Industry City would need more resources to improve conditions to benefit working families like mine. And new investment would also create new jobs that are desperately needed in our community. The rezoning is a way to make this happen. You have a chance to vote yes on a project that creates opportunities which we need at Industry City. I urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Chair, there are no further speakers uh, on this panel. Great, yeah, I, I just got a, uh, a quick question. Uh, David, uh, if, if I could, just one quick question. Good to see you, David. Good to see you too. You, you know, I, you, you talked a little bit about how the, the, the local has uh, changed in its diversity. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what uh, it means to be uh, uh, a union member and how that's kind of changed the lives of, of, of many uh, in the local areas throughout the city? Absolutely. So. I've been fortunate enough to be involved with uh, direct organizing events where we reach out into a community and bring in members that are working in our craft, but not in the union. And to see a guy being able to provide health insurance for his family and how it affects his, over, his well-being, his attitude, his outlook on life, to see someone progress into becoming a homeowner versus a renter, it's not only extremely stimulating for me, but I mean, for the person, just to see the change and, and how they thrive and the vibrance that you see in their faces, it's, uh, I mean, really it's unexplainable and a beautiful thing to see. So that's my answer to your question. Great, I, I appreciate that, David, thank you. Happy to thank you. Council, is there any uh, members uh, who have questions for this panel? Chair, I see no members with hands or questions at this time for the panel. Great, I wanna thank the panelists uh, for coming and giving their testimony today. We, we thank you very much for your time. Uh, Council, if you could please call the next panel. The next panel will be Eva Hanhart, Deviani Gua, Juan Camilo Osorio, and Ronald Schiffman. They will be followed by a panel who will appear with the assistance of a Mandarin interpreter. That panel will include Ma Jack Lee, Ma Kitty Lee, Ma Yan Lin, Ma Gong Dong Chen, Ma Jiming Cao. And at this time, uh, we will go to the incoming panel. The first speaker, Chair Moya, is Eva Hanhart. Clock is ready. Maybe you may begin.
Eva, you got to mute yourself. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm Eva Hanhart and I'm a urban planner. At City Planning, I worked on the first comprehensive waterfront plan responsible for the working waterfront. New York City and its economy have been changed by COVID, yet the industry city application remains essentially unchanged. Although required by secret to be timely, the FEIS is not based on current existing conditions. To accurately forecast future conditions and analyze impacts, the FEIS must be updated, considering COVID in the no action and with action scenarios, adding up Rose's green resilient industrial district as an alternative. Before COVID, the industry city proposal with its focus on hotels, retail office and entertainment was inappropriate for Sunset Park. Today, their projections of a timely increase to 15,000 jobs are also unrealistic as these sectors have been decimated and their market future is unknown. In contrast, as an industrial business zone and significant maritime and industrial area, Sunset Park is ideally suited to take advantage of the commitments of the city's Climate Mobilization Act and the state's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. With preservation of industrial land, buildings and businesses, of the projected 190,000 jobs, potentially 26,000 could be located in Sunset Park and go to city residents. These jobs in energy efficiency, clean energy production and environmental management are open to those with a high school education or less and can pay 60 to $70,000. Having hollowed out its production capacity and ignored the vulnerabilities of its population, New York was unprepared for the COVID crisis. In approving industry cities application, the city risks being unprepared again. Instead, the city must commit to economic development as in the grid that will actually provide well-paying jobs that address real needs and opportunities and prepares New York City and region for today's and future crises, including climate change. Thank you very much. I urge you to not approve this proposal. Thank you. Here, the next speaker is Deviani Guha. Deviani. Hello. As an urban planner, I urge you to look at industry cities job projections carefully, separating reality from hype. The DEIS states that the rezoning will lead to a total of 15,000 jobs. Of those, 8,000 already existed pre-pandemic. Thus, the rezoning is supposed to yield an additional 7,000 jobs, not 20,000 as cited in the media. Projected offsite jobs are pure speculation. We don't know much about the 7,000 jobs. Are they new or relocated? Do they meet the community's real needs? Do they provide good lively livelihoods? And can industry city actually create these jobs given the current conditions in the food and accommodation, arts and entertainment, and TAMI sectors that underpin their job projections. We do know that having lost 70% and 65% of their pre-pandemic jobs respectively, the accommodation sector and the arts and entertainment sector are struggling. The office market is not expected to recover until 2022. 25% of employers intend to reduce their foot office footprint. 50% of companies expect to reduce their office occupancy by a quarter. In Brooklyn, new office developments are only about 15 to 25% leased. Another 6 million square feet of new office space will hit Brooklyn by 2024, likely creating a glut of office spaces. Tech startups that often locate in Brooklyn have lost 10 to 20% of their employees and their revenues are expected to go down by 50% for a while. Sunset Park's whale building is in financial trouble due to lack of creative tenants. Given these dire market conditions, Industry City's job productions, projections are a product of magical thinking. In contrast, recent legislations will create green jobs in building retrofits and clean energy production that are well paid and match Sunset Park needs. The council should demand accountability from Industry City, um, is hard questions and put the community's real needs at the heart of its decision by voting no. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, the next speaker is Juan Camilo Osorio. Juan, who's ready? 
Hello, my name is Juan Camilo Osorio. I'm an assistant professor in urban planning at Pratt Institute, but testifying as myself. It's documented in Obros as Green Resilient Industrial District Plan. The proposed rezoning is inconsistent with three days planning for maritime and industrial business and is based on outdated pre-COVID data that ignores the impacts on the community and the real estate market. In addition, there are two important inconsistencies with Waterfront City policies and regulation established in Vision 2020, the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan and the Waterfront Revitalization Program or WRP approved by the City Council in 2013. One, the proposal does not promote water dependent industrial uses. It does the opposite, focusing on expanding high-end retail and commercial while required to demonstrate support to maritime and industrial development, given its location in the significant maritime and industrial area. It hinders the city's blueprint for the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, limiting industrial job expansion and ignores Vision 2020's requirement to market marine transport to reduce truck traffic. Number two, it doesn't use the latest climate change projections published by the New York Panel on Climate Change required by WRP. It doesn't include any detail on adaptation strategies to sea level rise or chemical dispersion. Where Sunset Park could be leading the nation in turning adaptation needs into resilient green jobs. Regarding Council Members Moya's question on the needs for green jobs, according to a 2019 NYSERDA report, nearly 159,000 people worked on clean energy in 2018 statewide, more than biotech, and were projected to nearly 171,000 for 2019 an 8.9 increase since 2016, stronger than the state's overall growth at 3.4. But without planning um, the state's climate change, uh, uh, and, and we haven't been implementing yet the state's climate change legislation, which, which will seek these services somewhere else. So instead of displacing industry, the applicant should expand their dependent industrial infrastructure to produce the supplies for building retrofits and renewable energy, like offshore wind. But we need to plan for this to happen in seeking justice and equity. Instead, you heard the applicant refer to Philadelphia as a model of success, which peer-reviewed research uses to define green gentrification. Um, For these reasons, I urge the council to reject the rezoning as it compromises the future Thank of the waterfront. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is Ronald Schiffman. Clock's ready. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ron Schiffman. I am a city planner. Uh, and sat on this New York City Planning Commission uh, for a number, six years in the 1990s. In 1999, like uh, 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 Jonathan Bowles, I was an advocate for manufacturing in New York and helped found the New York City Environment, uh, New York uh, Industrial Retention Network. Much has been said by my colleagues and by other speakers, and I, for one, will uh, submit my written testimony, but I want to touch on a number of issues uh, before we go too far. One is I hear the pain of the, my brothers and sisters in the unions. I hear the pain of the small business people who want to stay alive. But the fact of the matter is that this proposed rezoning will not create any jobs in the near or foreseeable future. It will be towards the end of the decade that it will have any impact. And therefore, I think it's important not to do something that may have an adverse impact on them. One of the issues of enormous concern to me is taking a manufacturing zone that we have and without understanding all the implications of it, uh, begin to rezone it for other uses. When you take an M3 zone and rezone it, you'll never be able to recreate it in the future when we might find a need for it. The locational issues here, this is, a, 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 is of enormous impact. Uh, this area is at a regional crossroads. If we abandon the Steepwater port, uh, we won't be able to uh, uh, provide uh, the kind of rebuilding and uh, region infrastructure usually using locally manufactured and stored materials rather than importing material labor machinery from neighboring states, increasing the economic and environmental costs of it. We won't be able to uh, develop ideas for transferring, taking our trucks and putting them on rail and connecting the cross Brooklyn rail to what might be a tunnel in the future. The impact on adjoining communities fending off into Industry will be of enormous impact. And finally, I just want to say one last thing. The way to stem displacement is by stemming the hemorrhaging of housing through preservation action and not by things that will stimulate an uh, enormous displacement of people from this community. Not only displacement of jobs, but displacement of both culture and housing.
Chair Moya, that was the last witness on this panel. Great. Um, just, just a quick question for anyone on the panel. Uh, you know, throughout the day, we've heard various uh, testimony today that uh, discusses the job numbers uh, from the state uh, and the city goals for resiliency uh, and green jobs versus the proposals mm -hmm. and EIS uh, estimates. Can any one of you on the panel uh, just clarify uh, why we trust uh, job goals and projections of one and uh, not the other? Any, whoops. I'll anybody... let any one of you take that. Yep, go ahead, Eva. Uh, am I okay. muted? No, no, I'm unmuted. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, both the city um, CMA and the uh, state CLC, CLCPA um, are acts that have created commitments. The city will be, in fact, uh, committed, it has committed itself uh, to by 2050. Uh, to reduce its carbon footprint, uh, dealing with the retrofits of a vast number of the buildings, not just in Sunset Park, but in all of New York City. Those, uh, that work to meet those commitments will generate up to 190,000 jobs. Uh, now, uh, statewide, of that, we did a conservative estimate of how many would go if there were space in Sunset Park there. The fact is if they, if New York City does not allocate appropriate space, those jobs will go to New Jersey or upstate perhaps or Long Island. They will not go to city residents. These are commitments that have been made in two acts that have been adopted and that have put money behind them. Chairman Moya, a, a, a different approach to the same question. Yeah. And that is that we are at the intersection now of a economic crisis that has been perpetrated by the COVID crisis, a, a reckoning with our racial injustices throughout this country. And in order to address both those issues in the future, we are going to have to invest money into this region. There is no way we will come out of this deep economic crisis, as deep as the depression was in the 30s, without some form of New Deal. And if New York City wants to once again be in the leadership, we should put together the kind of plans and strategies so that when a new administration comes to Washington, we're able to marshal those resources and begin to revitalize our economy in a strong and meaningful way, not in a way that's just tangential that may occur because the, uh, we're creating space for it. We need to invest in it. The city needs to invest in it. And if God forbid we don't have a new administration in Washington, then the city and the state are going to have to find ways of creating creating this kind of new deal for New York and a new deal that won't have the racist background that the old new deal did. One that is there predicated on putting people to work to rebuild good jobs and to address the really important issue of climate change. People were talking about their children and their grandchildren. Unless we address climate change, they may live there, but they won't be able to survive there. So I think it's really important that we begin to think big and not just take these, uh, what really are forms of mental masturbation. I, I, I hear that, I hear that, but I just wanna go back to what like Eva was talking about. I mean, the, the jobs that you were talking about right there, uh, those, there, there's no job safety or wage requirements for those jobs. Uh, the retrofitting of construction, there's no guarantees. So, you know, I'm just, uh, this is why we had some, some issues with this before. So that's why I'm asking, you know, where are we getting these numbers, you know, versus uh, those, the, the other ones that are being put out there. That was where I was going with that. Um, and then, yeah, I'm sorry, Juan, go ahead. No, thank you for your question. And, and to build on what my colleague said, you know, I just wanted to reiterate that we're comparing a survey that was done by the developer by data that has been projected by the state referencing a state legislation and developed by the New York State uh, by NYSERDA. 
So a state authority has been has come up with numbers that to leave you with three strong facts about why we think that these jobs are a reality require to meet the, the goals of the CLCPA, we're going to require 9,000 megawatts of, or, of offshore wind by 2035. We're going to require 6,000 megawatts of distributed solar by 2025 and 3,000 megawatts of energy storage by 2030. So the question is, if we don't secure the infrastructure and the workforce development to attract these jobs here, they're going to go somewhere else. So these are clear facts that are coming from clear projections uh, that are being certified by a state agency as compared to data that has been gathered by the developer to support their proposal. And I'd, I would like to add that the jobs, the wages that you said are not guaranteed. Sure, they're not guaranteed, but we are looking at reports by Brookings and by a few other um, uh, think tanks who've looked at average wages for workers without uh, high school without college degrees or who more you know high school degrees so we have some basis for it what we hear from mr kimball there are no details there are absolutely no details for these jobs which is why i said it's like magical thinking so let's go with the with with that because it, it additionally the estimated 60,000 to 70,000 uh, a year salary um, uh, jobs for those who don't have a, a, a high school degree. Uh, what are those jobs and uh, where did those numbers come from? Uh, what are the guarantees for those salaries? I can, I can answer those. Uh, the, uh, uh, the numbers on those particulars come from two sources. One is the Perry study that uh, underwrote uh, the uh, creation of the states uh, uh, CLCPA uh, uh, Act. And so that was the study that was done to, uh, for the state about the potential of these green jobs and that helped uh, determine their commitment to doing them. The sec and those are, uh, and I, we can send you the charts from that report. It's their table number two, which says from 60 to $70,000, depending on what they are doing uh, the Brookings report um, talks about $60,000 plus in different kinds of jobs. Now, I'll tell you what kinds of jobs, but not exclusively. Brookings has a report from April 18th, 2019, that indicates that up to 320 occupations uh, will be involved in green jobs. But in this particular instance, let's talk about energy efficiency, retrofits, many of the things uh, that will have to be done to the buildings in New York City, anywhere from the metering to the uh, uh, insulation, to the windows, to the solar, to the solar panels or other uh, 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 applications for, uh, uh, for energy efficiency. The clean energy production we've talked already about extensively, which is the wind and solar, uh, but there are also other elements in terms of uh, other types of energy uh, production that are uh, clean energy, uh, not fossil fuel, and uh, uh, nor are they natural gas. Uh, and uh, the uh, environmental management are, is around green infrastructure, around recycling. Interestingly enough, SIMS is there. Uh, re uh, remanufacture of recycled materials uh, that aren't shipped somewhere to be remanufactured, but can happen. And it is already happening at a, one business level in Sunset Park. So. Uh, again, I can send you an exhaust, we can send you an exhaustive list, but it is the, in fact, the construction industry, which is doing well in Sunset Park, which is poised to grow to do this work. Uh, in uh, in the, terms the retrofitting that you're talking about uh, is without labor requirements. The, the answer, so, you know, I, I get it. Um, when I say this is the prevailing wage. In the industry, this is what nice what the reports have indicated in doing the inventories and the surveys. So uh, yes, possibly, probably 
as you would be adopting this, mo this more innovative economic model, a commitment to that would have to be made. We but would yes. hope that the unions that are sitting around the table will all help organize the labor to assure that those wages are there. We'll never have a new middle class unless we have a strong union movement, but we have to have the wherewithal to undertake those jobs and implement them. We're talking about rebuilding the Gowanus Expressway, which borders Industry City. Where are the trucks and the machinery going to come to rebuild that? We're, there's a possibility of revital, revitalizing the rail line that runs through Bay Ridge into Matt, Massbeth and into Long Island that serves both Long Island and upstate New York and connects the mainland United States to New England. Uh, we can take trucks off the road and put them on rail uh, if, uh, uh, if Congressman Nadler's uh, proposal to eventually build that tunnel takes place. If we do this, we never will have those opportunities. We'll forego those opportunities. I'm suggesting that what we do is we stop, we withdraw this application and we take the next six to nine months without in any way jeopardizing a job to plan this properly and to take a look at what the impact will be on the entire waterfront. To do it absent that look is just pure idiocy. You know, thank, you. I mean, thank you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate your, uh, uh, your answers. Uh, I want to recognize that we have uh, Council Member um, Levin, and uh, I believe uh, he has a question for this panel. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and I apologize uh, to my colleagues and to all the speakers prior. I was chairing a hearing all, all day today and so could not really participate in this hearing, um, but I will watch watch the six hours of video that I missed. Um, uh, I, I, I just one thing, uh, I, I'm not sure who said it because uh, it was right when I joined, but something about that this that the the EIS needed to be updated to be in accordance with the waterfront management plan. Is that I don't know who said that and sorry, my daughter's here. Um, is, is, is that's a that is a um, is there is uh, I'm just curious if you could tease that out a little bit more from a legal a legal perspective. Is that something that we are that that this proposal is is running afoul of or or would that i mean it was in the process in the Euler process prior to um prior to covid uh are they required to um update their eis like while while things while their pro project is in Euler? is that i mean it, i don't know what the legal uh parameters of that is do you want to start and I can I can talk about the, the... Let me just start because I'm going to discuss, uh, I, I called for the update uh, on existing conditions across the board, uh, not just on WRP, um, but to integrate uh, consideration of COVID. And it is based on the CEQRA manual, chapter two, B, section B300, which basically says that you need to be the existing conditions that are the baseline for your analysis of impacts um, and for your projections have to be timely. And uh, thus, uh, uh, you can go back to amending it. There is a whole provision in CEQRA, and I think the city council has done this in the past where amendments and updates take, uh, have to take place um, when the timeliness uh, and they explain that when unusual circumstances or a longer extension of time from when the first application started happen. And if COVID is not an unusual circumstance that has changed existing conditions, I don't know what is. Also, we, we, uh, it was highlighted in the response to the FEIS uh, that there was there wasn't enough analysis of sea level rise and climate change. And while sea level rise and climate change are different than COVID, it did say that they had to go back and take a look at those factors. If anything, uh, COVID is, you know, a much more in 
in, is a present day version of the kind of catastrophe that we will face if we don't address climate change. Uh, it's, it's an intensification of what that will bring about. So it was asked for before and ignored. And I think now, it, uh, plus what Eva just pointed out, it's a necessity to go back and evaluate. It. I want to talk about two, two other specific violations that the the, the proposal um, is in, in terms of the waterfront revitalization program, which again, this is the city's um, regulatory framework to evaluate proposals in the waterfront. This was approved by the city council in 2013. Um, and it, 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 I'm going to talk about two things. One is that because the proposal is in, inside a significant maritime and industrial area, the applicant has to demonstrate how it is supporting industrial and maritime uses. And it's doing the opposite. It's actually focusing on high-end retail and commercial without any real uh, substantive uh, information demonstrating how are they complying with this requirement. And on the climate change point, uh, and, and by the way, this is on policy two and 2.1, you can see in the WRP, you can find the requirements for support of maritime and industrial uses. And in terms of policy six, which uh, re relates to climate change, the WRP requires the use of the latest climate change projections from the New York panel on climate change. The New York panel on climate change released a report in March of 2019 with the latest projections, yet the proposal uses 2017 data. Therefore, the analysis that they do about the climate change impact is using out outdated information on climate change. And in addition to this, uh, in terms of the inventory of hazardous substances, which is also a requirement of the WRP, uh, the, 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 the proposal uses 2017 data, which is beyond the six month threshold allowed by the regulation. Thank you. Council, do we have any other questions for the panelists? I, uh, I see that council member 11 has his hand raised again for a question. Sorry, I was I was re-muted. Um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Ron, you had you had said something about about uh, that it was. I'm sorry that there was there was a um, a uh, that there was that 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 was there were certain things requested. Sorry, I'm I'm sorry. I've got my little kids here. Sorry that you, Ron, you had said that that uh, that it, certain things were asked for. Um, who, who, by whom, who had asked for that? Was that, was that uh, the city planning commission or? It was in response to the city planning commission release of the FEIS. Uh, but you said it's, that it's attached to my testimony. I'm sure it'll be, uh, it's available also on the record. I only addressed, I think item 23. But I'm sorry, but who, who, who was the, who was the entity that requested that information or that update? City planning commission. Oh, city planning commission. Okay. And that wasn't provided, yeah, but by the applicant. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, all right. Thank you very much, to this panel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member. Uh, council, do we have any other uh, questions from uh, any of the council members? Jeremiah, I see uh, no hands from members with questions at this time for the panel. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate uh, you taking the time to come here and uh, testify. Um, Council, if you can please uh, call up the next panel. Thank you. Moya, the next panel to testify will appear with the assistance of a Mandarin interpreter. Uh, and to clarify, the next panel will include Jack Lee, Kitty Lee, Yan Lin, Gong Don Chen, and Jimming Cao. We do have a Mandarin interpreter standing by. Nee, Mr. Nee, thank you. Before we go into these panelists, Mr. Nee, uh, if you would please, we would ask you to make a general announcement to the benefit of those listening that if anyone else who I have not just called needs the assistance of a Mandarin interpreter to please ask them to use the Zoom function and raise their hand now and we will work with them to bring them in uh, to this panel while we have you.
I may begin. I may translate that. Okay. So, 对于呃那一些想参加呃这个小群呃跟我们讨论，你可以用那个通过 Zoom 的视频的举手功能，然后当他们这些委员会呃看到你们的时候，他们会加入你们在这里的讨论。Thank you.、Uh, we will now ask、uh, our interpreter, Mr. Ni, to please inform the witness panel as a group that they will have a total of four minutes and fifteen seconds each for their testimony, including the translation, and that you will assist them as they go along、uh, in their statements so that they can make pauses where appropriate.、Uh, four minutes and fifteen seconds, please. 所以，对你们各自、你们每一个人，呃，都有四分十五秒，来想，呃，说你想说的话，呃，包括翻译，呃，所以，呃，之后，呃，我们会一起合作，来把你的主见告诉，呃，他们。Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Ni, I will just ask you,、uh, as we have been doing, I will announce each speaker in turn. The chair will recognize them to begin. And we'll just ask you to communicate to them that they may please begin. And with that, the first witness, Chermoya, is Jack Lee. 对，所以本人会先呃声明讲者，那之后主席人会告诉你你可以开始。啊，所以首先我们会有 Jack Lee， 你可以开始。Jack, whenever you're ready. Um, you may begin. So you need to prepare. Starting time. Prepare. Time. Please begin. Mr. Nee, do we have Jack Lee? 我们有 Jack Lee 在在线上吗？ No Jack Lee. Jack Lee 在吗？ Mr. Ni,、uh, we'll move on.、Uh, is Kitty Lee available? She will be. 那么 Kitty Kitty Lee Lee 呢？ Lee Kitty 呢？在吗 ？Kelly Lee 在场吗 uh, ？And Mr. Ni,、uh, I'll rely on you. But if there is no Kitty Lee at this time available, the next witness is Yan Lin. Sorry, go. 下一个目击人是 Yan Lin. Okay, Mr. Ni,、uh, thank you for bearing with me here.、Uh, once again,、um, as it appears, we don't have any of those witnesses so far. The next speaker on this panel would be Gang Don Chen. 好的，下一个是 Gang Don Chen. Gang Don Chen, 你在线上吗？ Make sure to ask、uh, everybody before we、uh, go. But not hearing、uh, anyone yet, the final name on this panel, Mr. Ni, that I have, is Jimmy Cao. 好的，那最后一个人呃，想邀请的是 Jimmy Cao， 你在线上吗？ Okay, Mr. Ni, if you would not mind, please、uh, just making that announcement one more time、uh, to anyone who may be listening and who、uh, may need the assistance of a Mandarin interpreter. 
to anyone who's listening, um, would you ask them to please raise their hand using uh, the Zoom button now? So, for all of you who are listening to this program, if you need a Chinese translator, please use the hand gesture. We can help you. Chermoya, stand by for one moment. Excuse me, Chair. We will uh, stand at ease momentarily. Uh, we just confirm that uh, there are no witnesses. Thank you. Okay, Chair Moya, uh, Mr. Nee, we have a witness named Albert Wiltshire who has indicated he has a need for the Mandarin interpreter. The next speaker, Albert Wiltshire. I didn't say I needed a Mandarin interpreter. I speak English. Hey, Albert, hold on one second. Excuse me, Mr. Wiltshire. Uh, we will come back to you. So it seems that we have no uh, witnesses at this time who are in need of uh, the Mandarin interpreter. Uh, we will give everyone a chance in the public uh, at the end to once again raise their hand if they need to testify. Uh, with that, that would be it for this panel. Mr. Nee, thank you. And with that, Chair Moya, the next panel will include George Janes, Eve Barron, Lionel Ponce, and Adam Friedman. The next speaker. Starting time. The next speaker, once uh, he is in, and confirmed will be George James. Great, thank you. Here we are still bringing in the next panel. Excuse me, please stand by. Yeah, thank you. Next panel, uh, if these individuals are here, and we will confirm. The next panel, again, George Janes, Eve Barron, Lionel Ponce, and Adam Friedman. Order, order cancel.
Thank you, Chair. We're still working out the panel. We have George James on this panel. And we will, uh, uh, meanwhile, work to bring in the rest of the panel if they are available. The next speaker, George James. Starting time. George. My name is George James. I'm an urban planner. And Community Board 7 engaged my firm to help in the review of the Industry City ULERP application. I'm here today only representing myself. I neither favor nor do I oppose the application. I'm just here to offer information. The CB7 review of this application was exceptional. I, I've really never seen anything quite like it. There were extraordinary efforts to communicate extremely technical details to both members and to the larger public. It was the first major rezoning in this area since 2009 and the board leadership, membership and the public all took it very seriously. And so did the council member who had staff at public meetings and who heard the comments and discussion that occurred throughout. Now this application is complicated and the zoning proposal had raised questions. For instance, the application is to create a new special zoning district but if you read the zoning text, it's actually pretty thin. There isn't much there. And that's because a lot of the detail of the proposal is not in the zoning text. It's in the special permit. Why is that? Why is so much of this proposal in the special permit rather than the zoning text? The application will also allow for development rights to float between different zoning lots on different blocks which is very unusual. Why are we considering such an extraordinary measure for this site here? I think you have to answer, I think you have to know the answers to these and dozens of other questions before you can make an informed decision on this application. I encourage council members to educate themselves, read the record, talk to the community board, Neighbors in Sunsets Park who kept showing up to every meeting, the borough president and your colleague, the local council member who was as active during this process as any council can be. Thank you. Thank you, George. Chair, we are still working out the remainder of this panel. Please stand by. Standing by. Moya, there are no additional witnesses on this panel. Um, I will turn it to you for questions. Okay. Do we have any council members that um, have any questions? No? Thank you. Members for the panel. Thank you, George. Um, council, if you can please um, call in the next panel. The next panel, we will go back to a panel with the assistance of a Mandarin interpreter. The next panel will include Jack Lee. And 
Mr. Nee, I will ask you again, just for the benefit of the witness to communicate the four minute and 15 second time limit. And then we will announce the witness, the chair will recognize, and then you will communicate that they move again. Is it Jack Lee as the next witness? Jack Lee. We need uh, Mr. Nee to be unmuted for this testimony. Hello. Starting yeah. time. Oh, I, I need a translator. Do yeah. it. So, yeah. Mandarin, mm -hmm. Mandarin. Yeah, mm. hold on one second, Jack. So, thank you for muting me. So, thank you for muting me. So, you have 4 minutes and 15 minutes to talk about what you want to talk about, including the language. So, please speak clearly. Okay, are we ready? Okay, let's go. Can I start now? Mr. Ni, if you would just confirm that our witness is Jack Lee. Okay, so please confirm that our witness is Jack Lee. Okay, so please confirm that our witness is Jack Lee. Okay, so please confirm that our witness is Jack Lee. Okay, so please confirm that our witness is Jack Lee. Okay, Yes. Thank you, uh, Chair Moya, the witness, Jack Lee. You may begin. You now can begin. Ah, I want to say that the question is 然后很多人在街上大小便，很脏的那个地方。Yeah, so I just want to mention that I think the problem is pretty clear. Around ten years ago, before Industrial City arrived, um, around Third Avenue, and it's a very, very dirty condition, a lot of criminals,、uh, drug users.、Uh, so it's just a, a very, very di、uh, dirty neighborhood overall. 另外，我还讲讲大家。他呃，大寿司里进来以后呢，那大家有个很很好的地方去去那边玩，而且现在也很干净。那很多人是觉得说房租变涨价了嘛？那其实房租涨价是城纽约都是这样子的，不是只有这个绿路公园。Yes, and next when Industrial City arrived, came in,、um, the place was very became very nice. The neighborhood was friendly. People could play, could live there. And regarding the rise of rent issue. Um, that's not just a, a this localized issue. It's the entire New York City.、Uh, the rent overall rises. 然后，如果讲到你的商业租金的话，那这个 Industrial City 呢，因为它在二大道跟三大道是很偏僻的地方，所以说，那我们住在五大道跟八大道这个绿路中公园中中心的话，其实根本就没什么影响的。那很多人是为了反对而反对。Regarding the loans for or the the rent for these、um, businesses, it's usually located around Second Avenue and Third Avenue.、Um, but you know, to to me, there's there's no、uh, problem、uh, regarding this. Some people just want to oppose、uh, because they just want to oppose. 那另外呢，我还想很多人，我也是工薪阶层，也就是住在这个八大道。那你们有没有想到，为了下一代，把这附近变得更好呢？不是说为了反对，你不可能一辈子都在做这个。做这个老南宁工人嘛，对不对？你自己不想进步的话，那你小孩子又要进步嘛？你要让小孩子知道有发展才是对的嘛，而而不是说十年、二十年都是一样一成不变的。所以这个社会是有问题的。Right, and you know, we want to think about our next generations too. Um, you know, what would they think about this after they look on twenty, thirty years? Do they want to see a place that never changed, that has never developed? Um, that, uh, that's Uh, going against these blue-collar jobs,、uh, so we have to think about them too. The next generation. 而且现在啊，大家不发展的话，你看现在我们去绿绿，就是说我们在绿绿公园去散步的话，你就发现很多人在街上大小便，然后吸毒吸大麻，然后小偷小摸也非常多。早上去散步的时候，很多人就在那边偷自行车。所以说你不发展，就是一成不变的话，你就是这个自然就变越来越坏。Right, and if you just think about the situation in Sunset Park, if there's no development,、uh, 
then you know the situation is pretty uh, horrible. You know, there's many thieves. Uh, people uh, would just use the bathroom in the streets. Uh, there was people would steal bicycles. Um, so we, we can't have a situation where there's no change. Um, if if not, things would just get worse and worse around Sunset Park. So if you say, "Don't do it," don't do it. Actually, you really don't affect us. 这个我们在五大道或者八大道生活的呢，因为它山这个五大洲是一里很偏僻的嘛。Right, so don't please don't oppose just for the sake of opposing. Uh, those who live in Fifth Avenue, Eighth Avenue, uh, you know, the it, it's there's no effect because it's such a remote area. 那我我是希望啊、uh, 那边就是大家以后有个好的去处，像去年他们推出那个 ice skating 在那个滑冰，那我们带小孩就去，这小孩就是很开心。不然的话。我们要去很远很远的地方去去去带小孩子去玩。And I, I look forward. Time、um, expired. Look, look forward to development, especially towards like ice skating. They they put a new ice skating rink there, so I could go with my kids and play there. So I look forward to this place being developed. 好，谢谢。Thank you. 还是 Do we have any council members that have any questions? Jeremiah, I see no members with questions for the panel at this time. Thank you. The next panel to be called will include James Smith, Claire Lim, Kristen Fernandez, Manuel Arboleda, Nancy Glassman, Angie Suarez, Jocelyn Sutil, Melissa Marshall. As we bring in this panel and confirm、uh, who's here, I will announce the speakers. Once again, this panel: James Smith, Claire Lim, Kristen Fernandez, Manuel Arboleda, Nancy Glassman, Angie Suarez, Jocelyn Sutil, and Melissa Marshall. The first speaker will be Melissa Marshall. Starting time. You may begin. This is Angie Suarez. Am I am I up? You're, you're up, Angie. The, the next speaker.、Okay. Oh wait, Angie. Sorry, hold on. The speaker that we are waiting on is Melissa Marshall. Is Melissa Marshall here? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Hello. Melissa, can you hear us? Melissa, you gotta unmute yourself. I did. I just pressed the thing that said unmute, but I you, but I guess you can hear me. We can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. You can hear me now. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Good afternoon, children, boy, and members of the community. My name is Melissa Marshall. I'm a security. To BJ member and a longtime resident of South Brooklyn near Industry City, I am speaking this afternoon on behalf of the union in support of rezoning of Industry City and especially about the good、um, the good building service job he proposed to stand and bring to Sunset Park community. In my job at the Nine Eleven Memorial Museum, I'm building wage because of this good standard. I am paid a living wage that is allowing me to continue to live in the city I love. I also have access to full family health care, retirement, and training paid by my employer, all covered by the prevailing wage. As an essential worker, I know that simply creating jobs is not enough. Jobs that give workers kinds of protection have 
um, oh, excuse me, I have a short, a short supply, and we need more of them in my community. In our city, especially now, Industry City has made it a formal commitment that the many new buildings survive um, services jobs and rezoning will create, will be a living wage. Just like mine, this is an investment in the frontline workers and our neighborhood that I think Sunset Park was need and deserve. I will also give someone like me a chance to have a building service job that pays family assistance wage in my own community. Having a building wage building service job has changed my life. I know the impact would be the same for the other neighbors. Due to the cost of living always, I mean, due to the cost of living always rising. I urge you to vote yes to creating good jobs in Sunset Park by approving this, um, the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Moya, the next witness is Angie Suarez. Angie? Clock is ready. Angie? If you can hear us, you can unmute yourself and you may begin with. Okay, I'm on. You're on. Well, it's been a long wait for my name to be called, but um, thank you. And I, I've, um, I'm here too as a, as a long time resident where I grew up in Sunset Park. I, um, I'm speaking on behalf of what I feel is going to bring a uh, big revival uh, to revitalize Third Avenue and Sunset Park. Before I start, I want all of you to take note that in order to revitalize Sunset Park, it needs to depend on private companies. With everything that's going on after the pandemic, we cannot depend on government. Government right now is dealing with a major economic crisis. Not just government, but all of us. So with that being said, I am in favor of industry city rezoning. I'm disappointed to say that I have not seen a huge revitalization involved in my neighborhood. There has been a lot of going, uh, ongoing talks of uh, revitalization, but not much leading to transformation. Some of what I just seen that since uh, industry city took over of the de decrepit Bush terminal, I've seen a enormous amounts of definitely an improvement to third avenue what third avenue stood for was a city dark dirty place and with the revitalization of of what industry city has become is definitely has an improvement to my community so i have really i really would like to say that sunset park needs growth there's a lot of talk of political empty words that I've been hearing for years caught up in bureaucracy, but there has been no growth in Sunset Park. And one of the things that I hear more and more that there's a misunderstanding that industry city is causing misplacement to the community. How so? How is industry city causing misplacement to the community? So I need to, uh, I'm really going in for the rezoning of industry city because Sunset Park needs to we be revitalized, especially the waterfront. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Chair, the next speaker is James Smith. Clock is ready. You can everyone hear me? Yep. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to my statement on the industry city rezoning. My name is James Smith. And over 35 years ago, I was born in Lutheran Medical Center, located in Sunset Park, the neighborhood in which this rezoning will take place. Growing up in Brooklyn, I know what the area looked like 20 to 30 years ago, and it was not good. Crime, drugs, poverty abound was the picture of the area throughout the 80s and 90s. As a result, it makes me very happy to see all the positive developments going on in Industry City and the possibility for more by Industry City committing, committing to use union labor. Just a little background on me. At the age of 17, I found myself homeless. My mom was a drug addict and she abandoned me. We were living in Red Hook in uh, public housing over on uh, Columbia Street. I slept on subway trains. I was stayed at a shelter and eventually I worked my way out of poverty and into prosperity. A secret to my success was the Carpenters Union. 
they gave me an opportunity for a better life and I took advantage of that. Now, over 17 years after being homeless, I am a proud father, husband, and importantly, a homeowner. I am proud that I own the land my family lives on and now I have something to leave my son. I have broken the cycle of poverty and now myself and my family can be a positive contribution to our community. In addition to home ownership, the Carpenters Union has allowed me to represent my membership as a delegate to the largest carpentry union local in the USA and Canada, Local 157. Hundreds, if not thousands, of my union carpenter constituents live in Sunset Park, Red Hook, Bay Ridge, and the surrounding neighborhoods in Brooklyn, and would love an opportunity to work in their own communities. Lastly, what excites me most about uh, this possible, possible development is there might be someone out there just like I was many years ago someone down on their luck and in need of an opportunity might just find it at Industry City with a good paying union job that has the potential to change that person's life forever. Please do not say no to the opportunity for better. I humbly ask this subcommittee to approve this rezoning so we can bring back some uh, much Mr. needed Butter. union jobs to Brooklyn and give opportunities for people to better themselves. Thank you. Thank you, James. For anyone listening to the testimony at this moment, if your name is Claire Lim, Kristen Fernandez, Manuel Arboleda, Nancy Glassman, or Jocelyn Sutil, please use the Zoom function to raise your hand now. Claire Lim, Kristen Fernandez, Manuel Arboleda, Nancy Glassman, Jocelyn Sutil, if you can hear me, please raise your hand now. Charmoya. Uh, the speakers that we have heard from uh, the available witnesses on this on this panel. We will wait to hear back about the others. Okay. Well, I just want to say one thing, James. Uh, it's a very inspiring story, uh, and I think it's it's truly what uh, the stories we like to hear uh, about people who have overcome adversity, uh, and especially. Uh, through our union brothers and sisters uh, who've really paved the way for the middle class. My hat's off to you and uh, my congratulations on your success. Thank you very much. Council? Uh, Chair Moya, excuse me, please stand by. Kristen Fernandez will be the next speaker on this panel. Kristen Fernandez. Talk is ready. Hi, all. My name is Kristen Fernandez, a lifelong Sunset Parker, and for the last 16 years, an employee of Sahadi Fine Foods, a factory on the Sunset Park waterfront. Sahadi's also has retail locations on Atlantic Avenue and in Industry City. I fully support the proposed industry city rezoning. When I moved back to Sunset Park after college, I wanted a walk to work job, a job that would allow me to live, work and play in the community I call home. And I found that at Sahadi's. When I started at Sahadi's in early 2004, my work was metered by the daylight and I was always sure to leave before sundown. Because of the efforts of industry city and the attention it's paid to our community, what was once a dark, desolate and underutilized area is now full of life. Industry City and its proposed rezoning will bring thousands of jobs of all kinds to our community. In a time when unemployment numbers continue to skyrocket, isn't this what's important? Industry City will not only bring jobs to our community, but they will bring jobs for our community. Walk to work jobs for our neighbors that will turn into careers. Industry City is the partner that Sunset Park so desperately needs, providing not only jobs, but community, diversity, and culture in a time when we need it more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, the next speaker is Jocelyn Suetel. Jocelyn Suetel. Time starts. Jocelyn. Do we have Jocelyn? Hello? Hi, um, my name is Johnson Soya. I live in Sunset Park, 
for, for, for 35 years. And uh, we want to stop um, Union City and no rezoning. So we have our Sunset Park here. So Woo! we're going to say no rezoning, no Thank you, Jocelyn. Okay, he was hello. So um, I've been we did much um we did a protest since five months and we're gonna keep on fighting. No rezoning, no petition. Thank you, Jocelyn. Such a seven day. Thank you. Move on to the next um, panelist. Thank you. Jeremiah, we have no additional panelists, uh, speakers on this panel. Great. Um, do we have any council members uh, who have any questions for the panel? Chair, I see no uh, members with questions for the panel at this time. Uh, seeing none, uh, let's move on to the next panel. The next panel will include Antoinette Martinez, Terry Hum, Darius Gordon, and Rob Solano. As they are brought in, I will announce them. Uh, the next speaker for this panel, Terry Hum. Hello. Terry. Yes. Am I? Yep, you're on. Okay, very good. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to testify um oh you know what oops sorry thank you right thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today on industry cities rezoning application um it is somewhat surreal to take time from my work as a faculty member and department chair at a city university of new york college whose students are working class new yorkers many of them essential workers to comment on a special district application put forth by a consortium of the world's largest transnational real estate investors and developers. My name is Tari Hum and my family moved to Sunset Park in 1974. My dad continues to live in our family home. This rezoning application is personal to me because both my parents labored in New York City's industrial sectors and these jobs enable them to raise four kids and purchase a modest row house in a working class neighborhood. While my parents' lives were not easy, we had a home in Sunset Park and a New York City public education and access to public institutions such as libraries and museums, and that is what launched our socioeconomic mobility. Industry City says no one wants to work in the manufacturing jobs of the 1950s and 1960s. Rather, Industry City claims the rezoning will catalyze an innovation economy based on, as Mr. Kimball described earlier, an eclectic ecosystem comprised of makers in sectors such as media and information, technology and cultural production. Sin Sunset Park continues to be made up of people like my parents, limited English speaking, hardworking immigrants. My question to Industry City is, where are the maker jobs that will enable working class New Yorkers to raise a family and purchase a home in neighborhoods such as Sunset Park? Industry City Special Innovation mm -hmm. District and rezoning application. Is that it? Yep, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the next speaker on this panel would be Rob Solano. I'm beginning. Rob Solano. Rob? Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Solano. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Churches United for Fair Housing. At St. Michael's in Sunset Park, we have thousands of members that are mostly undocumented and are looking for good paying jobs. Um, a lot of them do not work in Sunset Park now, and there is no real clarity if they will have jobs in Sunset Park. I am a person who used to work in labor. I come from the electrical union and brought me to a tremendous success. But the realities of labor is not necessarily it's a good job. 
in, in for a site, it's a good job for the member. Doesn't mean that the project is a good job. For example, labor has 421A, also has the uh, Williamsburg Greenpoint rezoning. There are many different types of projects that have come out that have joint labor mission. Doesn't necessarily mean it's good for the neighborhood. In Ridgewood alone, there's a project right now that the apartments for affordable is 3,500. They have 32 BGM members, carpet union, and electrical union members. There are times when labor does align itself for the greater good for jobs, but doesn't necessarily mean the pro project is better for the neighborhood. And finally, I end with this. There have been many, many testimony about crimes in Sunset Park and Williamsburg in these neighborhoods. It wasn't real estate or developers that improved those neighborhoods. It was people like my mother, abuelitas, that took care of the neighborhoods and brought it back to health. And that's when the developers returned and we made it better. My mother right now is struggling in COVID and a ventilator. She was the one with many of our people that took care of our neighborhood and made it better. Let's never forget that it was our people that improved it. And then the developers came back and taught it to boot progress at our neighborhood. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now the next speaker is Antoinette Martinez. Clock is ready. Antoinette. Do we have Antoinette? Antoinette. Hi, everyone. My name is Antonia Martinez. I'm a lifelong resident of Sunset Park. Um, I serve on the Land Use Committee on CB7 here on the commute Local Community Board. And I'd like to speak directly to Francisco Moya, to Stephen Levin. I have lived in Sunset Park my whole entire life. My, this is where my grandparents were able to purchase their first home. And I know that you have the ability to make a strong stand right here with the Sunset Park community. We are here, we are very passionate. We've, read, we've, we've spent hours reviewing this application and we know that it is not for this community. We've done the grunt work. I have sat through community board meetings until two o'clock in the morning. You know, we have done our homework. We have really put our heart and soul into looking through this and this application is not for this community and we need for you both in particular to stand with us to say no to industry cities rezoning application we saw what happened in williamsburg we do not need a crystal ball to have any sort of we don't need a crystal ball to tell the um, to predict the future here we know what's going to happen we know the gentrification the displacement that will happen to this community and we need for you to stand with us and to say no. Sunset Park! No Sunset Park! No Thank, you. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next uh, panelist. If the witness Darius Gordon can hear me, Darius Gordon, we ask you to please raise your hand if you can hear me, if you are present in this meeting. Mark is ready. Chair Moya, it appears that uh, that is the full component for this panel, and I see that Councilmember Manchaka has his hand raised for a question. Councilmember. Thank you, Chair, and uh, I want to say thank you to Rob and Antoinette and Jocelyn for speaking on behalf of the Park President. Um, I have a question for Tari Hum, who has done extensive research uh, as an academic, but also as someone who is from Sunset Park. Uh, Tari, if you're still on, on, can you speak to the speculation that is currently impacting industrial businesses uh, and, and really kind of speak to, even without a rezoning, speculation has already had impact. And if you have data that can support that, uh, it'd be a great time to talk about it. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Carlos, um, for this opportunity to to talk about some of the research that I've done. Um, I think, in particular, one piece that I, that was published in Metro Politics uh, looked at um, the real estate um, 
speculative uh, increases in uh, property values and sales that occurred after um, Industry City made an announcement about the $1 billion investment and in seeking a special innovation uh, district rezoning. Um, in that article, I also had the opportunity to talk with small business owners, uh, some who, at, who owned their property. And um, because of all of the hype around the industry city, uh, special innovation economy, and all the hype around the kind of um, hip and happening place that it was going to become, um, they couldn't resist selling their property because of the inflated um, um, offers that they were getting uh, for their property. So definitely um, looking at the kind of real estate activity that happened after Jamestown Properties assumed part ownership and hired Andrew Kimball uh, to promote this innovation economy, uh, the kind of real estate activity you know, increased greatly. And there is data for that. I don't have it off the top of my head, but it is in one of my uh, published pieces in Metro Politics. And can you talk a little bit about what the actual uh, changes, so you, you said that there's real estate, real estate activity. What, what, what does that mean? Well, that means um, real estate activity, meaning that there are um, a lot of investors uh, who are, you know, purchasing uh, warehouses, who are purchasing industrial properties, um, and, um, you know, at, at high cost, and then uh, converting them into different um, uses uh, that command, you know, higher commercial real estate rents. An example is um, a factory building that is across the street. Um, I think it was 341 39th Street across the street from Industry City that, um, you know, was sold a couple of times. And that's a form of speculative activity where profits are made just based on the potential for its future use. And um, the building became Sunset, uh, Sunset Yards, which is a, um, which was uh, renovated to become a, a WeWork office space. It was a garment factory and there were active, you know, garment uh, tenants that employed, you know, hundreds of workers that were in that building that were viable businesses and they were displaced. They were evicted because of the sale of the factory building. Tari, are there any ways to grow good jobs in Sunset Park from your perspective and your analysis? Well, I think absolutely. I mean, I, I think that we heard from a panel of Pratt urban planners and academics. You know, uh, we heard from um, Elizabeth Jean Pierre and other uh, leaders um, around um, a green economy and around the just transition. I think that they're absolutely right that what makes sense in um, an industrial, one of the remaining large industrial areas of New York City, that there is an opportunity to produce good, high paying manufacturing jobs in a green economy. We just need to make those investments to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, yield sure the time back to the chair. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. Uh, Council, any other members that have questions for the panel? I see no other members with questions at this time for the panel. Great. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists. Thank you for uh, taking the time out today uh, and joining us. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Um, Council, I'm just going to ask for a quick pause. Chair, we will, uh, the meeting will stand at ease.
cancel. Whenever you're ready, we can resume. We gotta unmute you, uh, Arthur. Thank you. Yep. The next panel uh, will be Ana Diaz, Kenny Guan, George Cardona, Karen Rolnick. Now, as we bring those witnesses in, I will take a moment to repeat a few technical reminders. For uh, anyone who has registered uh, for this meeting and who yet requires translation services, we remind you to please tune in to one of the live stream channel options on the council website in order to keep track of where we are uh, in the meeting and to have some notice of the timing of your own testimony. Second reminder, for those waiting to testify, we want to please remind you uh, to be sure that you are using the name, uh, that, that to make sure that the name that you use to access this Zoom meeting is the same name uh, that was used during your registration process. The third reminder, uh, is that for anyone who wishes to submit written testimony instead of appearing before this subcommittee, you may email the testimony to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. And my final technical reminder, once again, to all participants is that there is a slight delay in the process uh, of unmuting. And to please be sure that your microphone is on when you are recognized to speak. Uh, and I will also announce at this time uh, that the panel after this panel will be assisted, uh, will appear with the assistance of a Spanish interpreter uh, for the benefit of those panelists. That will include Willie Baez, Danny Gonzalez, Oscar Gomez, Solano Rosado, Jose Colado, and Pablo Felipe Tapia. And with that, our current sitting panel uh, should be ready. The first speaker will be George Cardona. Clock is ready. George. George, can you hear us? Do we have George? Jorge Cardona, si nos oye, Jorge Cardona. I do see Mr. Cardona. He appears to be here with us. Uh, and we are just waiting for him to be unmuted. Hello? George? Hello? Yep, we yes. can hear you. hear you, you can begin. Okay, uh, so real quickly, a lot of the stuff that's being said, there's valid points on both sides, but we keep going in circles. We keep talking about the same stuff for months and months and months, and nothing ever happens. You know, I have a small business here in Sunset Park, and Industry City is, is a nice destination place to go, and I've actually gotten business from small businesses there where I do their tax returns and so forth, and it helps. The other thing is I'm a little offended when people from Sunset Park want to make people from Sunset Park sound like losers. There's a lot of smart, educated people here that can work in Industry City and move forward. And just like with any job, there are people going to go forward and there are people that are going to fall behind. Just like when I started in business entry level, I made minimum wage and I worked my way up and a lot of people did. Other people fell behind. And it's up to the individual as to how hungry they are and they can do things. So when people say, oh, pity, pity, poor people in Sunset Park, they're not equipped to do things, they can do things. My mom at 60 years old went and got her college degree and got her master's. You know, she didn't sit back. 
And then there's a lot of people that come to this country from South America, Peru, Nicaragua, El Salvador, follow the American dream and open up their own businesses and are successful. Then there's others that whine and don't do anything for themselves. And, you know, I, I, I do feel bad, but I'm not going to feel sorry for, for somebody who doesn't uh, go forward. Again, I think Industry City has a lot of potential for small business in the area. I've seen it. It's a nice destination place to go to. And uh, it, it's good. I think it's good for the community and to go forward. Are there going to be people that fall behind? Absolutely. Just like, you know, when you play baseball, there's a first place team, there's a last place team. It depends on what you want to do with yourself. You know, so to hear some people act like whiners from Sunset Park, shame on you. There's a lot of potential. There's a lot of smart people here. There's a lot of people that have come from other countries that never knew English, learned the language, and have moved forward and owned properties and have gone forward. Then sad to say, there's a small percentage that don't do anything inspired. for themselves, and they want us to feel sorry. I don't feel sorry for them. Um, that's my point, and I like to move forward. And I think there's, there's a lot of smart people on both sides that I have respect for, and I think that's important because we need thank to you, have George. people on both sides. You can't have everything thank all you. one Time side. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Judge. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. The next witness is Karen Rolnick. Karen? Oxford. Hi, can, can, can you hear me? Nope. You may begin, Karen. Until Industry City opened, the businesses in my area, Greenwood Heights, which is right next to Industry City, were mostly car washes, auto parts store, and an occasional bodega. The seven blocks of Industry City had been abandoned and decrepit for decades. I and many of my neighbors support Industry City. It has been a huge improvement to our neighborhood, providing good jobs and a lovely place for people to gather. Having said that, there are a few things that are of great concern to me about this variance, especially traffic. Our neighborhood is extremely congested already. There have been several cycling and pedestrian deaths on Third Avenue recently. In addition to Industry City, there are several schools in the area and a popular park causing many pedestrians to cross Third Avenue. And there are several projected as of rights projects in the area that will further exasperate traffic. According to the environmental impact statement, Industry City will increase traffic across all uses However, the increase with destination retail is astronomical and food store is not far behind. For these reasons, I strongly recognize, request that destination big box retail or large grocery stores not be allowed. Also, I believe that light manufacturing is better for our community than heavy manufacturing and I strongly support academic uses. So far as displacement, that is a citywide scourge that we all as a city need to address. It, Industry City did not cause that problem and it can't cure it. And I don't think it should be held responsible for it. So thank you for hearing me. We are all exhausted. Thank you for hearing me. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Thank you for your patience. We appreciate uh, you hanging in there uh, and giving your testimony today. Thank you. For the remainder of this panel, Ana Diaz and Kenny Guan. Ana Diaz, Kenny Guan, if you can hear me, we ask that you please use the Zoom function to raise your hand at this time. The next witness will be Ana Diaz. Clock is ready. Ana? Hi. You there? Hi. Ana Diaz? Do we have Anna Diaz? Yes. Can you hear me or see me? Yep, we can hear you. We can't see you, but okay. we can hear you. All right, let me start my video. Sure. How's that? Okay, great, sure. terrific. All right. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, my name is Anna Diaz. I'm the owner of Diaz Electric. I've lived in Sunset Park for over 20 years. And as a longtime resident and now business owner for eight years, I have seen the community thrive for thrive with a healthy economy. Diaz Electric is a minority owned women business. It's also known as an MWBE firm. We are in support of the rezoning for Industry City. The rezoning would allow MWBE companies to continue to stay open and expand their businesses. A reconstruction of this area 
would allow for us to continue to hire from within the community. We would be able to train more local residents for a career, not just a job. There are approximately 2.2 million small businesses in the New York City area, and approximately a small percentage are black and brown owned. During the pandemic, 41% of the MWBE companies have closed nationwide, as opposed to the 17% of the non-black or brown companies. We must keep in mind, Industry City has been a presence to the community. They have worked with local MWBE contractors, such as Diaz Electric, NNW Electric Supply, Guayaco Construction, and many other companies there, which just to name a few. Industry City has continuously demonstrated support to companies from either awarding projects or allowing them to use resources that they have needed for administrative business growth. The city controller's office, Scott Stringer, has, has reported that 85% of the MWBE firms in New York City will not survive within the next six months. I urge, not out of fear, but out of pre-planning, pass the rezoning to the community, has passed the rezoning so the community has work to look forward to. With work, there's growth. With work, there's hope. With proper planning, there's success. And Industry City has a Thank you, Anna. Track. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll submit the rest of it. But thank you very much thank for hearing so much. me. Thank you. Thank you for sure. your testimony. Chair, the next speaker on this panel will be Kenny Guan. Time begins. Hi, uh, you hear me? We can hear you, Kenny. Hey, hey how, are you? how are you? How are you, the chair? How are you, everybody? Good, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Um, yeah, my name is Kenny Guan. I support the, the industrial city rezoning. And um, I'm leaving Sunset Park for 32 years. And I'm a small business owner. And I'm also a board member of Community Board 7 for 12 years. And um, I raised my two kids in Sunset Park. Um, and then we love Sunset Park. And, um, and also, A Avenue Chinatown, uh, Brooklyn, a lot of small business, uh, they love uh, this kind of idea and plan to improvement to create jobs. And yeah, because right now um, our city, our country, uh, our community, uh, we need jobs creation. Uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it damaged a, a lot of jobs in small business. So I believe is this is creating a lot of jobs, is helping the communities. And um, and now uh, during the um, pandemic and affecting um, small business owner and also uh, a big company, everybody has been like, you know, slowing down all the business. But right now with this kind of idea to, to, uh, to the private owned invest money uh, to, to the, like over 400 million, this kind of investment is huge. It's a big deal. So I, I believe is uh, this kind of deal. We we not turn it down. We we gotta figure it out how to support this kind of uh, private owned in uh, investment. Um. Also, uh, the seven seven years ago when Industrial City, uh, they coming in Sunset Park, they this past seven years they've been built a lot of good things and the community, uh, and also the buildings. It's all good stuff, and and we 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 seen that, and we we that actually thank you, thank you, Kenny, thank you for your testimony. Sure, Moya, there are no uh, further witnesses on this panel. Great. Uh, any questions from the council members? And at this time, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, I want to thank the panelists for coming on. Thank you again for your patience. We really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Council, if you can please call the next panel. The next panel will uh, be expected to testify with the assistance of a Spanish interpreter. We do have a Spanish interpreter standing by to assist with the panel. The witnesses will include Willie Baez, 
Danny Gonzalez, Oscar Gomez, Solano Rosado, Jose Colado, and Pablo Felipe Tapia. Before we go through these witnesses in turn, when the interpreter is available, we would ask the interpreter if you would please to make a general announcement for the benefit of all those listening, that if anyone else needs the assistance of a Spanish interpreter, please ask them to use the Zoom raise hand function and raise their hand now. We'd like to have our Spanish interpreter, uh, before we go through the witnesses, we'd like to have our Spanish interpreter make, again, a general announcement uh, to anyone else who is listening that if they do need the assistance of a Spanish interpreter, uh, we ask that they please raise their hand using the Zoom function at this time. Do you hear me? I'm the interpreter. Mr. But, interpreter. Uh, yes, but uh, uh, I I cannot start the video because I need your your approval. Yeah. Okay, we will have someone uh, handle. No, setting. please. Yeah, could you do it again, please? Okay. And now uh, I would ask you to just make a quick general announcement to anyone else listening who needs the assistance of a Spanish interpreter to use the Zoom raise hand function now, and we will work to include them on this panel if there is anyone uh, else while we have you. Okay, si hay alguien en el panel que quiere testificar, que por favor levante la mano ahora en este momento, que ellos le van a dar cabida para que ustedes puedan hablar. Por favor, si van a hablar, levanten la mano para que ellos os vean. Thank you. We will now ask you to please make a general announcement to this witness panel that you will be interpreting for them as they go along through their statement and that they will have a total time limit of four minutes and 15 seconds. Sí, uh, ustedes van a testificar en español y yo voy a ser su intérprete. Los voy a traducir. Eh, van a ir sucesivamente. Ustedes tienen el tiempo para hablar de cada uno es de cuatro minutos y quince segundos. Thank you. And as before, I will announce the names of each witness. And then the chair will recognize that witness. And then we would ask you to communicate to that witness that they may begin. The first speaker is Willie Baez. Willie? Awkward. Willie, before anything, you got to unmute, Willie. Willie. Willie, nos oyes, Willie? Dime? Sí. Ok, ahora okay. te. Yeah. Ok, Ahí gracias. Te. Mi nombre es William Baez. Eh, vivo en el área de Bay Bridge. Okay, Estoy my viviendo... name is William Baez, and I live in the area of Bay Ridge. Estuve viviendo 22 años en el área de Sunset Park. I was living for 22 years in the area of Sunset Park. Eh, trabajo para la compañía de Industry City. Soy parte del miembro de la 32 BJ. Uh, I'm a member of the unit uh, uh, 32 BJ. Eh, las condiciones del trabajo de Industry City, realmente ahora mismo nosotros con la pandemia no estamos seguros porque la seguridad de nosotros corre peligro porque hay personas. Ok, ok, ok. 
Uh, right now, the work conditions at Siri when I work, because of the pandemic, uh, we are not very sure. Eh, estamos, somos trabajadores de elevadores, de freight elevators, eh, we, y nos corremos. We, we work in uh, freight elevators. Nos corremos eh, riesgo de ser contagiados, ya que cuando vienen de libre hay muchas personas que no quieren usar las mascarillas. Uh, and we run the risk of, of being infected with the COVID because when people come to make the deliveries, they refuse to use a mask. Uh, llevo 32 años trabajando para la compañía de Industria City. Uh, I've been working for 32 years for the uh, Siri company. Mi salario actualmente ahora son 19.77. My salary now is 19.77 per hour. Creo que el salario que estoy ganando actualmente ahora no, no, no me alcanza para sobrevivir y mantener mi familia. I think what the salary I'm making now is not enough for a fair living and to sustain my family. So queremos luchar para un contrato nuevo que sea justo con mejores beneficios, mejores pagas. We want to fight for a new kind of contract, which is a fair contract with more benefits for us. Y queremos que la Unión 32BJ nos consiga un buen contrato. And we, want that, and we want that the union, the BJ32, uh, uh, get for us a, a good contract, a better contract, as they promised. So, ellos nos prometieron conseguirnos un buen contrato y ahorita they, mismo. They, they promised us to get for us a, a better contract. So, ahorita mismo no ha resultado lo que ellos nos prometieron. And so far, we have no results of that. Y creo que los de Rizuni no estamos de acuerdo. And we, are, and we don't agree with the rezoning because va a afectar a la comunidad de Sonsepa, la gente pobre. It will, the rezoning will affect the community in Sunset Park, uh, working and poor people. Y la mayor parte, pues, los empleos que ellos quieren procrear, creo que no va a ser favorable para nosotros los hispanos que residimos en Sunset Park. And all the new employments that they would like to create or that they say they will create will not be favorable for us Hispanics. Va, sería un impacto muy duro para la gente de Sunset Park, la, la comunidad hispana, mayor parte. And it will be a very bad impact for the Hispanic community at Sunset Park. So, habrá negocios, dueños de negocios que se beneficiarán sobre eso, there be, pero... There will be owners of stores that will benefit from this, but... Entonces, ¿dónde va a quedar la comunidad hispana, los pobres? ¿Dónde vamos a quedar? So when then, uh, uh, where will be us, the Hispanic community? Time is expired. Gracias, Willie. The next speaker will be Danny Gonzalez. Danny Gonzalez. Danny? Well, Danny, are you ready? Yeah. Ready. Go ahead, Danny. Okay. Ah, sí, puedes, puedes seguir, Danny. Si quieres, puedes ya empezar. Disculpe. Okay. Mi nombre es Danny González. Vivo... Hold on, Danny. Hold on, Danny. Espera un segundo. Sergeant, uh, can we just set the clock back? Yep, thank you so much. Yeah, Danny, cuando estás listo, uh, puedes empezar. Okay. Yeah, gracias. Mi, Disculpa. Mi nombre, mi nombre es Danny González. Vivo en el área de Sanso Pal por 11 años. 
My name is Daniel Gonzalez. I live in the Arrow Sunset Park for about 11 years. Es empleado de Industry Cities. I am and I work in an employee of a series company. Por nueve años. For about nine years. El 16 de marzo del 2020. March 16, 2020. En Dutri City hizo un miri con nosotros y me informó que iban a estar afuera hasta junio. Uh, at, at that date, a serious company informed us in the meeting that we'll be out of work till June. Y sorpresa que me llegó una carta dándonos la IOS. And they sent us a letter explaining that. Eh, En de esos nueve años que yo duré en la compañía, nunca le falté ni un ni cinco minutos de, de, de tiempo de trabajo. In the nine years I worked for them, I never, I was never absent. I was meeting every time, every minute in the company. Y sorpresa que ellos dicen que, que van a traer buenos trabajos para la gente de San Sofá. And this is... Nuevo, and this is a company that says that they will bring good jobs for the community in, in Sunset Park. Y yo que duré nueve años con ellos dándole servicio y, y por la epidemia de, de 16 de mayo, de 16 de, de marzo, eh, me dieron la IOS porque ellos me dijeron que iban a entrar en, en, en junio y en junio me dieron I, la carta. And because and me, who worked for nine years loyally uh, to the company, I was laid out March 16 because of the pandemic. Como nosotros, la gente de San Sopa, podamos creer en Industry City, si yo, que fui un empleado, ejemplar de ellos, con nueve años de trabajo, me dieron la Dios. And how me, who work uh, loyally for, for the company for nine years, I'm going to believe what they say now. I was yeah. laid out. Y en la página de Industry City, ellos tienen una página que dice que, que, que le quieren, que le falta, que quieren empleado para emplearle en Industry City. Y, and, y, diez, y diez compañeros conmigo que yo votaron. And, in the, and in, the, in the website, they have a page where they are asking for people to work for them. And me and, and another 10... Uh, fellow workers. Y nosotros pertenecí, pertenecamos a la 32 BJ, los 10 and compañeros. We, and me and the, and the other 10 fellow workers, we belong to the BJ32. También que fuimos despedidos eh, and we were, de Industry Cities. And we were uh, fired by, by uh, uh, the company. ¿Cómo no, la gente de Senso Park puede creer en Industry City si Industry City mintió a los 10 compañeros que estamos afuera? How the community in Senso Park could believe uh, Nutri City, the company, if they lied to us, to me and, and, and my 10 fellow workers? Y dentro de los nueve años, a 15 pesos la hora ganaba. And during these nine years, I was making $15 the hour. Nosotros, la gente de San Sopá, esperamos que Industry City nos tome en cuenta. Uh, we, the people at Sunset Park, we expect, we hope that Industry City will take us back. Time is expired. Gracias, Danny. Next speaker is Oscar Gomez. Oscar Gomez. Oscar, oh, cuando estás listo, puedes empezar. Oscar. Oscar, ¿ya estás listo? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, my name is Oscar Gomez. And I've been working for Industry City for over 19 years. And I'm only getting paid $15 an hour. 
and I need to know why, because I know people that are working less time than me and they make more money than me. And I'm going almost, you could say 20 years, and I don't think that's right. And depending on if they promised us, they, they say it, but they never did anything. So that's my condition. I would like to know why and what could be done. That's, that's what I think. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You're welcome. Next speaker for this panel will be Jose Collado. Jose Collado. Jose? Whenever you're ready, Jose. Okay. We hear you, you can go ahead. You can start, Jose. Okay. Um, my name is Jose Collado. My name is Jose Collado. I live in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. I live in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Hace 17 años. Uh, since for 17 years now. Uh, I work for Sears Industries. Yeah, I've been working in the company for 15 years now. Y ahora es que estoy ganando a 15 pesos porque el gobierno dio que subieran a 15 pesos cuando subieron. And now I'm 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 um, I'm making 15 dollars the hour because the government says that we should be paid 15 dollars the hour. Estamos peleando para ver si nos dan un contrato bueno porque we're fighting to see if we get a, a better contract. Mucho gato en aquí en San Pablo está todo caro. Because here in San Pablo the cost of life is high. Y la unión ya vamos para un año que nos ofrecieron un contrato y todavía no tenemos ningún contrato ni nada. And it's been a year now that the union has been offered a contract, but still we don't have any contract. That's all what I have to say. Gracias, Jose. Gracias por tu testimonio, Dia. The next speaker will be Rodrigo Camarena. Rodrigo Camarena. Rodrigo? Hola, ¿me escuchan? Hola, soy aquí Hola. en Industry City, como padre de familia, residente de Sunset Park, en oposición a la residencia de la Espera, Rodrigo, por favor. Rodrigo, espera, espera, espera. Rodrigo, no, no se va a poder oír tu testimonio si la gente está gritando atrás tuyo. No se oye okay. nada, ¿ok? Hay mucha pasión, Francisco Moya. Entiendo, entiendo, pero no se oye. Eso es el problema. Bueno. Ya hay, ya hay calma. Y ahora puedes empezar, sí. Mi nombre es Rodrigo Camarena. Estoy aquí como residente de Sunset Park en oposición a la resonificación de este vecindario de clase trabajadora. Okay, espera, 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 espera. My name is Rodrigo Camarena. I live in Sunset Park. I'm here uh, to oppose the rezoning. Este vecindario es un vecindario de clase trabajadora. This neighborhood is a working class neighborhood. De migrantes. Immigrants. Y familias desplazadas por Industry City y la pandemia del coronavirus. And families that has been displaced by the city and by the pandemic. La propuesta de Industry City desplazaría las familias que actualmente están sin empleo y que ya están sufriendo por la enfermedad. The proposal of uh, uh, a serious industry will display the families that are here and suffering because of the pandemic. Es injusto que en este momento, cuando se está sufriendo tanto en esa comunidad, aceleren este proceso de resonificación. It's unfair that at this moment when the community is suffering so much, uh, 
they try to accelerate this process of rezoning. Y es injusto que concejales que no representan esa ciudad propongan cambios que que no conocen y que no eh, entienden. And it's unfair that council members that they don't live in Sunset Park, that they don't know nothing about what's going on in the area, make proposals. Nos oponemos, me uno a mis vecinos en oposición a esta resonificación que está basada en racismo y en un modelo económico que, que ha fracasado y que no le pertenece a esta comunidad. I join uh, my neighbors and all the community in opposing the rezoning because this rezoning is racist and it goes against the grain of every uh, thing. Decimos, stop in the three city, save Sunset Park, stop racist rezonings. Gracias. Chair Moya, the next speaker will be Solano Rosado. Thank you. El reloj está listo. Saludos. Saludos, muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Eh, yo este, estoy en representación de mi compañero José Solano. Mi nombre es Julio Valladares. Uh, I represent my friend Solano. My name is Julio Valladares. Eh, este, la razón por la que estoy aquí es, eh, testificando es porque este, nosotros tenemos... Eh, en mi caso, eh, en nuestro caso, tenemos 15, 16 años, eh, en el caso de nosotros, de trabajar para Industria City. Uh, in, the, in, in my case, I represent people like me who have been working for Industria Series for 15, 16 years. Y nunca eh, Industria City ha sido digno de, de, de darnos un, este, de, 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 ¿cómo se llama? Darnos unas mejores condiciones de trabajo. And never in all the time I'm working for them, a Siri Industries was able or was, yeah, able to give us a fair conditions to work. Lo cual eh, pensamos que nosotros hemos, eh, merecemos un incentivo de mejor salario. And we think that we deserve a better salary. El cual... Nunca lo hemos tenido. Uh, we never had it. Eh, al contrario, si, si no es porque la ciudad aprobó el salario mínimo de 15, eh, yo estuviera este, trabajando todavía eh, eh, por 12 dólares la hora. And if the city has not uh, um, obtained the, the basic for 15, uh, the minimum for 15 dollars the hour, me and my fellow workers will be uh, making just $12 the hour. Eso no motivó a, a luchar y, y pertenecer a la, a la 32 BJ. This has motivated us and uh, it was a big incentive to belong to the unit BJ32. Para, uh, yeah. para eh, eh, sí. sigue nomás sí. Sí, sí. para que nosotros este ellos nos ayudaran a, a mejorar nuestras condiciones eh, no solo salariales sino de, de salud y, y otras condiciones de, de retiro Because we, wanted, yeah, because we wanted them to help us to get not only a better, a better salary, but also better conditions of, of working, uh, a good health plan. What is uh, strange is that they have been um, uh, cheating us. 
porque ambos, ambas partes, tanto Industria City como la 32 BJ, han because estado both, tratando eh, because, el, el, el contrato. Because both parties, uh, serious companies and, uh, uh, and the union, B, BJ32, has been haggling about the contract. Y luego ellos no... no nos dicen de que este, ellos no tienen este, había condiciones económicas este, para, para prometernos eso que nosotros exigimos. And then we were told that they don't have the uh, economic conditions to, to provide that we are asking. expired. En esa, esa razón, por esa razón, este, dudo yo de que eh, la resonificación eh, eh, sea importante. Because for that reason, I think that the rezoning is not such a big thing. It's not important. Gracias. The no. next, the next speaker on this panel, Jeremoya, is Pablo Felipe Tapia. Pablo. Pablo. Tiempo empieza. Pablo, cuando estás listo, puedes empezar. ¿Está bien? Sí. Mi nombre es Pablo Felipe Tapia. Vivo en la zona de Sonse Park, 4220 Tercera Avenida. My y name tengo, is, tengo, is, tengo my name is nueve Pablo años Fe trabajando. Ok. My name is Pablo Felipe Tapia. I live in Sunset uh, Park. Uh, and I've been working for Sirius Company for 19 years. Llevo 19 años trabajando con Industria Siri. Las condiciones de sueldos realmente son raquíticas. No nos alcanza para pagar la renta. Yo, rent, yo pago 1,550 dólares y tengo que trabajar sábados y domingos en otro lado para poder salir con mis compromisos de, de, de renta y otros. Okay, y otros okay, 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 okay. Uh, what we earn is 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 uh, is ridiculous. I cannot make ends, uh, and I have to work uh, extra hours and uh, and work a lot to be able to go with my family on weekends. Nosotros queremos que nos mejoren el sueldo. We want to have a better salary. Tenemos la desventaja de haber dejado a una unión y cambiarnos a la billeter y tú en la cual no hay negocio todavía porque no okay, sabemos okay, okay, el okay, okay, okay. we made the mistake of change unions we left a good union and we went to union uh, unit BJ32 and we don't see anything from them la situación de nosotros en la, en la reunificación Resonificación para nosotros no es no es aceptable. Uh, for us, the new que, que ellos no cumplen. Uh, for us, the new situation of the rezoning is not acceptable because of all the promises that they made and for nothing they don't uh, fulfill their promises. No, no, no culpo a la compañía, tal vez los dirigentes de nosotros no se saben expresar, o tal vez I'm, alguien. I'm not uh, 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 making guilty the company itself, but uh, maybe it's some executives that represent us that they don't know how to express themselves. Tal vez. Piense que nosotros con lo, el, el sueldo que ganamos, que es el mínimo, gracias a la ciudad que tuvo la bondad de aumentarnos un poco, no es suficiente para que nosotros podamos salir con nuestros gastos. Uh, we, our salary is very low and we thanks to the city that uh, increased the, the basic hour for, to $15, we're able to do something but still it's insufficient y quisiera que, que la billeter y tú pudiera trabajar legalmente con ellos para que nosotros 
no tuviéramos en la zozobra de, de estar en duda, porque ni tenemos contrato, ni tenemos beneficio. And we like that the union works well with the company because in our situation now, we don't have a contract and we don't have any benefit. Por lo tanto, doy gracias a ustedes a que nos hayan invitado para expresar nuestros problemas y que nos ayuden, porque en realidad oh. necesitamos esa ayuda. So therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful to you to be, uh, because to allow us to be heard because we need the help. Yo estoy en contra de la remodificación porque en I realidad am the no va a beneficiar. No va a beneficiarse a los pobres. Because they're not going to benefit the poor people, the working people. Sino no, a la gente no. que tiene dinero. But only they will be benefit those who already have money. Muchas gracias, buenas tardes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. La próxima. Gracias, Pablo. Gracias por el testimonio hoy día. Gracias por eh, esperar tanto tiempo también. Okay, the next speaker on this panel is Jorge Ruiz Reyes. Jorge. You're muted. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, George. Yeah. Buenos días. Buenos días. Okay. Buenas tardes. Buenos días. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Eh, desde Sunset Park. Mi nombre es Jorge, un mexicano nacido en Brooklyn. Uh, my name is Jorge Muniz. I'm a Mexican born in Brooklyn. Y yo tengo un mensaje muy simple con mis vecinos hoy este día para el Consejo Municipal. And I have a very simple message for you. Queremos que hagan su trabajo. We want you to make your job. En vez de dejar nuestra costa marítima que tiene tanto trabajo para personas como mis papás que vienen de México que trabajan con sus manos, que trabajan con sus manos. Uh, and, and, and if you to be, uh, to, to allow the people to go on the coast, people like my parents who work with their hands. Una zona que hace todo el reciclaje para la ciudad de Nueva York, todo el metal, el vidrio, se, se hace el reciclaje aquí en, en la costa de Sunset Park. Uh, it's an area with all the, the recycling for the city, metals, uh, glass, uh, everything is done in this area for the city of New York. Es un lugar a donde el Consejo Municipal tiene la obligación de poner un plan público para toda la costa marítima este año. Comprehensive and, waterfront plan. and it's an obligation for the city council to put uh, 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 rules and, uh, and for the, all the work that is done on the coast. Pero en vez de hacer eso, estamos hablando de un plan muy pequeño. But instead of that, we are talking about a very small plan. Y tiene al centro uh, eh, el bienestar de unas corporaciones multimillonarios muy, muy pequeñas. And at the core of this project is, uh, is the, the wealth and the benefit of, of a very small number of very wealthy companies. Entonces queremos trabajar, queremos trabajar con nuestras manos y queremos que el Consejo Municipal ponga un plan público para hacer esto en vez de and, dar a nuestra costa a estas corporaciones privadas. And we want that the council uh, make a, a public plan for us, uh, in order to us to work with our hands instead of giving all the, the plans for these wealthy companies. Y, y como hemos escuchado, uh, tenemos trabajadores que están sufriendo aquí en Sunset Park, que en una pandemia los están botando a la calle. And as we heard today, we have a lot of workers that have been, been fired, lay out uh, during this pandemic, and they are suffering. Hasta los trabajadores del Correo Postal los están botando. Even the workers for the U.S. postal system are being fired. Entonces te pregunto si el gobierno federal no puede negociar con estas cosas para quedarse, cómo lo va a hacer un un inmigrante o alguien que que trabaja aquí. So if the federal government cannot negotiate with these kind of things, how we that are simply immigrants can we deal with it?
Entonces, uh, uh, quiero que tenemos el mensaje muy simple. Ya lo hemos dicho cuatro mil veces, lo vamos a decir cinco mil veces, las veces que se tengan a decir, por favor, voten no a Industry City. Fin. Punto. So, so our message is a very simple message. We have repeated 4,000 times, a lot of times. It's very simple. Say no, vote no to serious industries. Sin condiciones, no necesitamos acuerdos privados, no contratos privados, queremos trabajo público solamente, por favor. Y creo que mis compañeros también tienen mensajes para ustedes, porque Sunset Park no es un lugar que se vende. Uh, and we want not uh, uh, private deals, we want uh, public uh, jobs for everybody here. Yeah. Okay. Sunset Park, no, no se vende! Sunset Park, no, no se vende! Yeah, we want to say no! Thank you, there you go. Chair Moya, the next speaker on this panel will be Jorge Lima Rodriguez. Okay. Jorge. Jorge. Hola. ¿Sí me oyen? Sí. sí. Hola, yo me llamo Jorge. Yo me crié en Sunset Park. Mi familia está aquí y ahora vivo aquí otra vez. My name is Jorge. I live in Sunset Park. I was raised in this neighborhood and my family lives here too. También trabajo en un bufete de abogados que dan servicios legales gratuitos a los inmigrantes, muchos quienes, quienes viven aquí en Sunset Park. I work, I work in a law firm that gives a free counsel and advice to the, to the immigrants, to the immigrants that uh, also live and work here. Yo quiero mucho esta comunidad, como alguien que quiere mucho a Sunset Park, estoy aquí para exigir que voten no a la resonificación de Industry City. Uh, I'm here just to say to you to vote no to the rezoning in favor of serious industries. Industry City dice que su plan es bueno para la comunidad. Con serious el... Industry says that its plan is good for the community. Pero nosotros no le creemos. But we don't believe it. Industry we don't City believe them. Industry City dice que su resonificación va a crear 20 mil trabajos, pero hoy día hemos aprendido que solo son 7 mil a lo máximo. Uh, uh, serious Industry says that the rezoning will create 20,000 new jobs, but that's a, that's a lie, that's a true. We know that, that they will only will create 7,000 new jobs. Y también el historial de Industry City nos dice que cualquier trabajo que ofrezca la comunidad de Sunset Park va a ser en los sectores de servicio, retail o solamente en oficinas. And also we know that the new jobs that serious industry will create in Sunset Park through the rezoning will be only in the service uh, um, area. So, uh, yeah. Pero nosotros necesitamos trabajos específicamente para la comunidad inmigrante de clase laboral. But we need specific jobs for the working people of the, that come from the immigrants. Industry City también ignora el hecho que su plan va a hacer que suban las rentas y va a desplazar a nuestra comunidad. Uh, and serious industry, uh, uh, serious industry's plan also uh, um, concerns that rents will be go up and that will displace all the people, the working people who live here. La pandemia de COVID-19 ha hecho mucho daño a nuestra comunidad, ha dejado a nuestra gente sin trabajos y sin ingresos. The, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has been terrible for in our community. A lot of people have lost their jobs and are ¿Y por qué estamos, y por qué estamos pe pensando en un, en un plan que solo va a hacer estos efectos que sean peores? No entendemos. And we don't understand why we're talking about a plan whose effects will be uh, much worse. Nosotros no queremos que alguien de afuera de nuestra comunidad venga acá a decirnos qué hacer con la tierra aquí. We don't want that people from outside our community come to our community and tell us what to do. Ustedes tienen que hacer caso a la gente de la comunidad y seguir nuestra visión para el waterfront. Uh, 
you have to follow what our advice, because we are inside the community, and the, uh, and take our plan for the waterfront. Yo apoyo al plan Grid de Uprose porque es algo que viene de la comunidad para hacer buenos trabajos y nos prepara para el para el climate change, lo que está cambiando de la clima. Uh, I uh, I support the plan for for climate change. Exigimos que voten no. Ustedes tienen que escuchar a nuestras voces. We ask you to vote no. You have to uh, listen to our voices. Y exigimos que que prepare este barrio para un futuro que nosotros queremos y para el futuro que nos merecemos. And we ask you to uh, prepare our neighborhood for a future that we like and that we want. Sunset Park. No no Sunset Park. Thank you very Park. much. Hermoya, that concludes the panelists that we have for this panel. Thank you. Uh, do we have any members? Uh, I know that uh, Councilmember Machaca has some questions. Councilmember Machaca is the only one I see with questions. Great. Councilmember Machaca. Uh, si puedo hablar con Willy. Willy, estás presente? Estamos. Están. Qué bueno. Pues muchas Salud. gracias a, a, a todos ustedes como trabajadores. Les quiero las gracias por tener el tiempo para ser parte de esta audiencia pública. La pregunta para mí es esto. ¿Tienen confianza en Industry City en este momento? ¿Qué van a hacer para ustedes como trabajadores? Eh, realmente no. No estamos okay. confiados con Industry City, ya que llevamos mucho tiempo muchos años trabajando y nunca se nos han tratado como debería de ser. Tenemos muchas personas que trabajan más de 20 años ganando a 15 dólares la hora. Y si ellos quieren traer buenos empleos, lo está bien, los traerán, pero con el sueldo para ellos, no para buen sueldo para nosotros. Ok, Willy. Um, I, just, I, I asked if, if, you, if they have confidence in Industry City that they were going to do right by the workers. They said no. Uh, if they really were going to do it, uh, they bring the right wage, wages um, and chair and all the council members that are listening. These are the workers that I've been I've been connected to. 32BJ and I have been working with them uh, to really bring representation. They're asking for that now. Uh, they don't like what they've seen so far on the, in the contract. Uh, Willie, ya te presentaron un contrato sobre uh, lo que Industry City los quieren dar a ustedes como trabajadores. El contrato, sí, nosotros teníamos ya hace un año atrás eh, peleando por el contrato y después de la pandemia, pues eso quedó en nada. Hasta cierto como un mes y medio nos dieron la respuesta de que Industry City nos daba un contrato de cinco años con un 2% de aumento del primer año, los otros cuatro años sin aumento y sin pensión. La pensión vendría siendo después de los cinco años. Entonces, ¿dónde vamos a quedar nosotros? La 32B nos puso tantas cosas bonitas. ¿Dónde quedó todas las cosas buenas que nos ofrecieron? Eso queremos ver. So I asked about a contract and whether or not they were presented with a contract. It sounds like there was a, a, a contract that they don't like. Um, because of time, we can go back and, and, and talk a little bit about that contract later. We're going to be meeting with 32BJ. Um, Willie, uh, otra pregunta sobre usted o otros trabajadores sobre las condiciones del trabajo cuando están haciendo construcción, demolición. Um, y... y uh, Puede hablar sobre eso también. Eh, las condiciones de lo, del grupo de demolición son bastante fuertes, son trabajos fuertes de construcción. Ellos le están pagando 15 dólares la hora. Tras que le están pagando 15 dólares la hora, cuando viene el puro invierno, tienen que ir a paliar nieves todo el complex de Industry City hasta temprano de la madrugada hasta tarde de la noche. Y creo que el salario que ellos están ganando para hacer ese trabajo no es justo. No es justo. 
¿Y, y con quién puedo hablar en, uh, de todos los trabajadores sobre las condiciones y todo lo que uh, han pasado en eh, los años antes de las condiciones de, de demolición? Uh, perdón, la pregunta, repíteme. Si me da, ¿Con quién puedo hablar? Eh, eh, so, los trabajadores que uh, es, hicieron testimonio ahora, ¿con quién puedo hablar sobre el, las condiciones? Con José. Uh, ya él viene un momentito y... Ok. Uh, <risa> dame un segundito. Okay. Okay. ok, eso es muy importante de hablar de las condiciones uh, sobre el trabajo, que, porque ustedes son pagados por Industry City. Um, so I'm trying to find out who can talk about the demolition and the conditions. Uh, this is something that the council has been working on for such a long time to ensure that workers are safe. And we're hearing, uh, we're hearing now that workers, the demolition crews that Industry City was talking about, because they've only hired 80 people in their whole staff, this is part of their staff, um, have been put into really terrible conditions without protections. Um, y usted dice, Willy, que José, ¿puedo hablar con José? Si sí, él hablar, está aquí pero, ahorita. Si puedo hablar sobre las condiciones um, y sin, sin las protecciones que ustedes merecen como trabajadores. Ok, él está aquí, aquí se lo dejo. Gracias. Okay. Muchas gracias, Willy. Ok, a la orden. José, ¿puede hablar sobre las condiciones de demolición y, y lo, que, lo que necesitan pero no tienen uh, no para la construcción, para seguridad, para su, uh, su salud? Las condiciones que, que eran en el trabajo no eran lo, lo, lo justo, lo suficiente que nosotros teníamos como buen trabajador de, de demolición. No era lo básico que nos daban. Eh, en vez teníamos que pelear por una mascarilla, un par de guantes. Eh, el trabajo que estábamos haciendo de demolición tenía sus, sus fallos, sus peligros. No, lo, no, no nos daban absolutamente el, el equipamiento adecuado para el trabajo. Teníamos que que pelear con los jefes teníamos que ir a pedir lo justo pero no no era no era lo que era lo que suficientemente lo que necesitamos para trabajar okay. muchas gracias uh, ya, ya no tengo tiempo uh, uh, he, he answered that he did, didn't he didn't even have masks they have to fight for uh, even masks uh, so I'd like to ask the committee to do more work on just understanding that after the hearing just so we can bring in their full testimony Uh, muchas gracias, José. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Council, any um, other Council yeah. Member, other questions? Yeah. Yes, Jeremiah, we have one, one additional witness for this panel. Uh, the next speaker will be Maria Roker. Maria? Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Can you see me? We can see you. <laughs> Good. Um, uh, I am Maria Roca in Sunset Park since 1964 and as founder of Friends of Sunset Park since 1995, I pose the following observations slash questions. None of the intentions advanced by Industry City on jobs, none have been verifiable, none. Are the numbers about jobs lost? Where are those numbers? Not just what have they created, but what has been lost as a result of economic displacement. Next. The hotels promised repeatedly have re no um, promised and requested to be removed from the uh, proposal repeatedly at community board members at community board meetings at, in any in any form way and shape that you can re remember are still on the proposal. Um, 
it's 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 unbelievable the the willingness to ignore the community not only the community but officials of the city of new york the council person the borough president um also the um what does it tell you about that today on the, at the 11th and a half hour we're still discussing jobs and hotels in this proposal what does that tell you it tells it it should tell you you meaning the the council who are the next ones to vote that industry city cannot be trusted to provide evidence and or follow up on their promises trust is on the line and if we have nothing left in this world is trust most of you are going to be leaving the council and your vote, the, the consequences, the results of your vote are going to fall on our shoulders, no one else's shoulders. So please go home and think and think hard. Trust is the issue here, right here, right now. What, how you vote uh, tonight will follow you in all of your political careers. People will not forget. Fool me once, shame thank on you. you. Thank you, Maria. Fool me thank twice. You. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, really appreciate it. Just a point of clarification. Earlier on, they they were very clear when we asked the developer about the hotel, uh, and he was clear that they are not doing the hotel. So I just wanted to make sure that we, uh, you might have missed that during the uh, earlier part of the testimony, but just wanted to point that out for clarification. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, Council, any other questions from the committee members? I uh, see no further uh, questions from members for this panel, and we have no further witnesses for this panel. Great. Thank you. If uh, you can call the next panel. The next panel will be Elena Schwalski, Rob Santos, John Santor, Leslie Kagan. They will be followed in the next panel by Daryl Hawes, Jennifer Dundas, Justin Pascone, Joe Landolina, and Jack Kuhn. The first witness on this panel will be Rob Santos. Rob, whenever you're ready. Starting time. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Rob. Maybe you're ready. All right, thank you. Uh, one question is, where is the racial impact study? Uh, has that been done in this? Uh, every elected official covering Sunset Park, uh, opposes to rezoning, Carlos Menchaca, U.S. Congresswoman Nadia Velasquez, incoming state assembly member Marcela Matenas, and incoming state senator Jabari Brisbane. Uh, why, is the, why are the wishes um, of the community and the officials that they were elected to represent them being ignored. This IC rezoning proposal results from a profound failure of New York City's industrial policy. Because the city has ignored the needs of industrial areas, allowing non-industrial uses and divesting in critical infrastructure, the door has been left wide open for private property owners to flip industrial properties for profit. Look at Chelsea Market as an example. Our industrial areas are not encouraged for industrial uses, which is why we see consistent conversion to office, uh, office event, food and beverage uses like at IC. Using of as of right development, yes, industry city's current rezoning allows unlimited office and small scale retail, but these have limited impact on job growth. Office, office demand is at an all time low. Retail only goes so far. The proposed rezoning supercharges this threat enables a high-end destination retail mall on Sunset Park waterfront that is not possible today and will foreclose on all the possibility, possible options for our waterfront in the future. Um, <clears throat> this rezoning is a threat to working class communities in Sunset Park and across New York City. If approved, it will send a clear message citywide that New York City government values the profits of developers more than the needs and wishes and plans of the community. Council members, ask yourselves, what if this was your district and your constituents and other elected officials were being ignored? This is not Brooklyn Navy Yard, which was mostly publicly owned. 
Industry, had, industry City has plenty of access to capital and space remaining to develop. Without a rezoning, their development efforts would be slower but not stopped. Industry City does not need a rezoning, rezoning to lease more space to businesses or as they claim, create, create jobs. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for your testimony today. Here, the next speaker is John Santor. John, whenever you're ready. Okay, Starting can you hear time. me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, John. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, Chair Moya, uh, just out of curiosity, did anybody so far today talk about Industry City's uh, proposal to Amazon in 2017 for their second headquarters, Amazon's second headquarters? No, uh, but I did ask the question of what uh, they would do um, with the, uh, if they were just doing their as of right, what would be able to go in there? I, that, that was the series of questions in which I asked. Okay. But you may um, begin, John. Just, yeah. bri just briefly, I, I bring it up because in September of 2017, Industry City uh, responded to EDC's RFP for Amazon's second headquarters. And specifically, in their proposal, they offered Amazon 4 million square feet of commercial office space. And that proposal was predicated on a rezoning. So it's very clear. Uh, Mr. Kimball signed the cover letter. I emailed it to your office in a memo that I sent you so you have a copy of the proposal. Um, that Amazon proposal has never been justified or explained by Mr. Kimball or anyone at Industry City. Um, it directly contradicts everything that Industry City says that it wants to do in the future post rezoning. And it's the existence of documents like that that led to a tremendous lack of trust uh, on behalf of the community and a belief that Industry City would try to maximize revenue and that this rezoning was really about maximizing revenue. E even though whatever they had said they had been doing and intended to do, they were really going to maximize revenue. That led to a, an attempted CBA negotiate, negotiation. That could lead to the City Council now attempting to negotiate with Industry City. My overall thought is that um, the more public involvement these negotiations involve, uh, you're really getting to what this should be, which is the public should help define what the waterfront becomes. This shouldn't be a situation where a conversation begins and ends with the economic and fiscal profit margins of a giant developer, uh, which, by the way, the, the people who own industry has, Industry City have never actually Time expired. Uh, to our community directly. So I, I, I ask the council to support public control um, in this rezoning fight, not, not something that begins and ends with, with the industry city itself. Thank you, John. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. At this time, I would ask to those listening if Elena Schwalski and Leslie Kagan, if either Elena Schwalski or Leslie Kagan can hear me to please raise your hand so that you may be brought into the hearing. moment while we confirm the witness. Can you hear me? This is Elena. Elena Schwalski, thank you. Okay, Elena, whenever you're ready. Uh, oh, I've been waiting Start a long time. time. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your my patience, is, Elena. Thank you. My name is Elena Schwalski. I'm a longtime resident and homeowner in Sunset Park. I'm here today to support my community and strongly urge that the City Council respect our voice and those who we have elected to represent us and vote against the industry city rezoning proposal. 
I'd like to use my time to say a few words about the community benefits agreement process, which seems to have been seized upon belatedly by Andrew Kimball as a possible way to seal this deal. We need to pay attention to experience. Previous community benefits agreement efforts at Atlantic Yards, West Harlem, and Yankee Stadium have not delivered on promised benefits and have proved impossible to monitor and enforce. And in fact, you can Google this because that's how I found it. The New York Bar Association produced a 50 page report that noted the following points as flaws in this process in New York City. There are no safeguards in place other than those the groups impose upon themselves. There's no mechanism for ensuring that those who claim to speak for the community actually do so. There's no guaranteed forum through which the community can express its views about the substance of the CBA or the wisdom of entering into a CBA and there are no formal means by which the community can hold negotiators accountable for the success or failure of a CBA. So when we talk about a CBA as somehow being the saving factor in this process, it's important to remember that there's no way to legally enforce a CBA except by taking the developer to court. And given that industry city developers are billionaires with unlimited resources at their disposal and Sunset Park is a working class community struggling to stay alive, we can only imagine- Time expired. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Elena, thank you. Chair Moya, we appear that, it appears that we do not have Leslie Kagan who would have been the last speaker on this panel us, that concludes this panel. Thank you. Uh, do we have any council members that have any questions for this panel? Uh, I see no members with questions for the panel at this time. Okay, thank you very much um, to the panelists who uh, came here to testify. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, the next panel. The next panel will include Daryl Halls, Jennifer Dundas, Justin Pascone, Joe Landolina, and Jack Kuhn, K-E-U-N. That panel will be followed by Margaret Murphy, Jackie Painter, Joseph Lara, and David Vibert. The first speaker on this panel, Jennifer Dundas. Hi, oh, hello, thank you very much. How are you? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Starting time. Thank you. I, uh, my name is Jennifer Dundas. I'm testifying because I want the community to know how I see has benefited my small business and in turn has benefited my employees. I founded Blue Marble Ice Cream in 2007. In 2010, we launched our wholesale division. We're in need of a production space and a warehouse. We moved to Industry City in the fall of 2011 prior to Jamestown's partnership. In fact, we were the first post redevelopment tenants on the ground floor of Building 2 on 36th Street, now known as the Food Hall. At the time, it was a massive vacant warehouse surrounded by decayed structures and no amenities in sight, which suited me just fine. We needed no frills. I have learned a great deal in my last 13 years in business. I have seen many, many, many small food businesses like mine fail. We need several things to survive, proximity to our customer base, access to reliable labor, a network of service vendors to help fix things when they break, a space to work out of, loading docks, and manageable rents. If we don't have these things, we cannot exist. IC is the only remaining place in New York City that provides these necessities to small businesses like myself. I started the business in, res uh, in response to irresponsible sourcing practices that dominated the ice cream industry. Artificial ingredients, low wages for farm workers, sugarcane burning that made low-income communities sick, corn syrup responsible for degrading agriculture and increasing serious illnesses across the world, cocoa and fruit source cocoa and fruits sourced from companies with exploitive labor practices, to name a few. A product as ubiquitous as ice cream can stop its support of cheap, unethical, and destructive sourcing that hurts low-income communities across the globe. Brooklyn was the place that made this possible for my company. I truly believe we could not have sustained our business in New York City if not for our residents at 
industry city. We are considered light manufacturers. We are a small business. We are good for the economy. Since 2011, we have employed over 250 people. The, the kinds of jobs we create in light manufacturing and a specialty retail cannot be rec replicated by in a machine or replaced by AI. Our workers make a living wage, making between $25 and $30 an hour. Um, we have numerous supplemental educational opportunities for our employees and a track of upward mobility. The other two people running the company with me began as hourly employees nine years Thank ago you. and are now in. Thank you, Jennifer. We appreciate it very much. You can still submit your testimony. Thank you. Sure. I will now ask if any of the remaining witnesses on the panel can hear me to please raise their hands. That includes Daryl Hawes. Justin Pascone, Joe Landolina, Jack Kuhn, K-E-U-M, Daryl Halls, Justin Pascone, Joe Landolina, Jack Kuhn, if you can hear me, please raise your hand uh, at this time. And I see that Councilmember Menchaca has his hand raised for a question for this panel. Starting time. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for your testimony, uh, and I'd like to read the rest of it. I'm really kind of curious about the proposal and really thinking about how you feel about large scale retail uh, and whether or not that's helpful for your business, particularly because of rents going up uh, as a business and whether or not your rent has increased over time at Industry City. Hi, can you see and hear me? I can hear you, so you just keep okay. going. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Um, I My rent is reasonable at Industry City. My rent has been reasonable at Industry City. Um, I've had an, a lot of different leases over the years in Brooklyn, and by far, Industry City has been the most reasonable landlord that, that I have worked with. Um, you know, for but I don't I, I don't know the motive for that, but that's my experience, and I have to testify to that. Um, one How of my biggest problems business? in my other locations has always been uh, rents that are too high, and I have not had that problem at Industry City. How long is your lease? Uh, well, when I started, it was seven years, and I have worked cooperatively with them to extend it several times. And at this time, I believe I have another, oh gosh, I want to say around another eight years. And I started there in, in 2011. So it's pretty okay. long-term commitment on both sides. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And, and really the, the kind of first part about the large, lo, the large retail box, the, uh, the large big, the big box retail and whether or not that would be conducive to your, uh, your business at Industry City. How do you feel about that? I think that um, the, the, the bottom line is I don't know, um, but what I can say intuitively as a small business owner is that the more population that's there visiting, the more exposure all the small businesses are getting. And, um, you know, would I be thrilled if, if a haagen or Ben & Jerry's superstore opened to compete with me right next door of course i would not but if there are more people that are that are brought there for shopping you know costco i know is helpful um that that actually brings more population there and and helps support the small businesses like mine and 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 finally jennifer uh we've heard from some, a lot of businesses in the neighborhood uh industry city campus that the pedestrian oriented investments uh, that industry city talked a lot about in their testimony have been difficult for the manufacturing operations have you found that or experienced that at all uh in fact it's a great question um i i'm kind of a i'm i sit on both sides of that because i need the pedestrian and but i also need to have the streets cleared um, I, when I started on 36th Street, there was, you know, it was the, still the Wild West out there. And I was dismayed and not excited to see um, that, okay, I was going to maybe lose my exclusive loading dock. I, I had a free for all whenever trucks came for my products to deliver my ingredients to pick up my production. Like it was great. But I was actually proved wrong. I was, it, they, it, the way that it was designed 
was very functional for us. Um, and it, I did not find it disruptive to my flow of my business. And, and in fact, you know, I, I had to share the loading dock, which I thought was going to be a problem. And it was not. Um, management was very supportive. I have now located to another building, which is on 33rd Street, but I still have my retail spot on in the food hall. Unfortunately, due to COVID, it's been closed for a while. But um, I'm now on 33rd, which is less developed than 36th Street. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. And, Thank you. Uh, uh, I yield back my time to the chair. Thank you, council member. Chair, sure, we have a, an additional witness for this panel. The next speaker will be Jack Kuhn. Jack, whenever you're ready. Starting time. You may begin. Hold on, Jack, we can't hear you. If we can check Jack's audio. Hi, can you hear me now? Yep, now we got it. Yep. Jack, you may begin now. We can hear you. Hello? Yep, can you hear us, Jack? I'm sorry, I cannot hear anything. Just give me one second, please. Hello, can you hear me now? We can hear you, Jack. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Yep. Uh, good evening, uh, my name is uh, Jack Hume. I'm a Sunset Park resident and uh, live right up the street uh, from Industry City. Uh, my company, iMaker, we are a commercial 3D printing company and we have been a tenant here at Industry City for three years. And I'm here to offer my strong support for Industry City, Industry City rezoning. We chose Industry City because we saw the great investment being made, providing opportunity for small business like ours. And even after three years as a tenant, I'm still amazed how Industry City is constantly finding new ways to help small business like ours to grow. Uh, here's a very good example. During the early stage of the pandemic, we actually pivoted our business to manufacture PPE for donation to local hospitals. And when we reached out to Industry City proposing our plan, we were overwhelmed by Industry City response. Industry City has provided us an extra space that we needed, created a platform for other tenants to join our effort, and even connect us to local hospitals, namely Elmhurst Hospital, Brooklyn Hospital Center, and NYU Langone in Sunset Park. And thanks to our collaborative effort, we have donated over 5,000 of this 3D printed PPE to keep our first responders safe. The kind of changes by rezoning will only strengthen the uh, existing business and help iMaker grow. More businesses at Industry City means more business for iMaker. Members of uh, City Council, please support this project that is so critical to the community, the city, and the future of small businesses like mine. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Maria, I see no further uh, witnesses that were called for this panel. Do we have any questions from any of the uh, council members? At this time, I see no uh, members with questions for this panel. Great. Let's call up the uh, next panel, please. The next panel will include Margaret Murphy, Jackie Painter, Joseph Lara, and David Vibert. They will be followed in the subsequent panel by William Carabano, Andrew Hunt, Giovanni Tavares, and Scott Kearns. For our incoming panel, the first speaker will be Jackie Painter. Starting time. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jackie Painter. I'm an organizer and a climate activist here in Red Hook, Brooklyn, lifelong resident. As everyone might know, it's the neighborhood, uh, the neighboring waterfront community from Sunset Park. It's just down the river bend. 
Uh, and Red Hook is unrecognizable from when we were rezoned with a little store that you might know named Ikea that drew people from all over the city into our small neighborhood. We know what it's like for developers to come in and profit off of disaster capitalism, which is what this is. Eight years ago after Sandy hit, developers took the opportunity to buy up cheap property as our community suffered from the worst flood we've ever seen. Hundreds of residents were displaced, including my own mother, who tried to move back a year ago after Sandy, I mean, a year after Sandy and couldn't because the rent was too high. This is the exact same story that's about to happen to Sunset Park. Rents are going to skyrocket and people will be displaced. I'm a little confused why people say no one's being displaced. People are being displaced and there's about to be a lot more of it. I do not understand how many examples we need to see of this throughout the city to finally get it right and to finally believe it. To all of our representatives of this city that's listening, it's time to put people first. As we heard today, there's no proof of these so-called 20,000, 7,000 jobs, which will displace current Sunset Park industrial workers. Uh, when are you gonna have the strength to stand up to the landlords and developers and stop them from actually taking advantage of communities of color, working people and immigrants? And to the land use committee who is listening, please, please listen to the residents of Sunset Park. Let them lead the conversation. Listen to the people. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your testimony uh, today. The next speaker is David Vibert. David, whenever you're ready. Starting time. Hey, yeah, the thing wouldn't let me unmute. So hi, uh, good evening, Chairman Moya, other city council persons, thanks for the time. Um, my name is David. I'm a longtime Sunset Park resident and local small business owner. I'm here to speak against the industry city expansion. I live with my partner and her family who have been in Sunset Park for the past 40 years. It's people and family like hers, not landlords and developers that improved the neighborhood and made it a great place to live by building communities and small businesses here. This proposed rezoning is an existential threat to the working class communities of Sunset Park and all across New York City. It ignores alternative plans and all community input. If approved, it will confirm the message that what the city values is the profits of developers, not the needs of working class communities. This is the largest private rezoning application in New York City history, almost 1 million square feet. Every other rezoning of this size, scale, and importance has gone through a public review process with input from neighborhood residents and New Yorkers. This IC process has been entirely developer driven and prioritizes the private interests of the property owner and developers over the interests of the Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and New York City communities. For good reason, we are seeing immense community opposition to this proposal. The Protect Sunset Park Coalition has collected over 4,000 resident signatures in opposition to this rezoning. Every elected official covering the Sunset Park area opposes the rezoning. Council Member Carlos Machaca, U.S. Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez, incoming State Assembly Member Marcella Matanis, incoming State Senator Jabari Grisport, State Senator Zen Omari, and Public Advocate Jamani Williams. And you have heard not only the community's opposition tonight, but that of environmental academics and urban planners opposed to this rezoning, who realize too well the detrimental effect this impact, this expansion will have on the neighborhood. The people testifying tonight, many of them business owners in favor of industry cities expansion have financial interests in that expansion or they're here paid for their time. Those of us opposing it, we are volunteers and we've been sitting on a 10 hour live Zoom call because this is our lives and this is our neighborhood. Industry cities, well-paid PR firms are hammering on job creation as a reason for the council to vote against our community and for industry city, but I'm industry city doesn't create jobs. Please listen to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker will be Joseph Lara. Can you hear me? Starting time. <clears throat> Hello. We can Hello. Hear you. Okay, awesome. Yep. Um, my name is Joseph Lara. Uh, I'm a native New Yorker. Uh, I grew up here with an immigrant single mother. Uh, for over 20 years, my mother and I had had to move over 20 times. So I know the harm of gentrification and displacement very intimately. Um, I'm currently a resident and a community health worker in Sunset Park. And I've been helping our predominantly undocumented immigrant community gain access to basic social services. Sunset Park has been neglected for decades, making it one of the few affordable places for undocumented immigrants to live in New York City. 
during this pandemic, this community has been devastated with no shortages of fears. I still make appearances. Families are going hungry. COVID still wrecking these families and many are worried of losing their homes. By supporting Inuit City, this council is condemning these families to the same miseries and trauma of my upbringing here in New York. I know the cost and toll of real estate speculation. And I know the faces of the very people this proposal will displace. I know jobs are important, but we can't rely on vague promises that we know our underserved immigrant community can't access. This isn't an and or or argument, displacement or jobs. These communities also need jobs. And we can't abandon our waterfront to luxury development because we know how predatory real estate is and how it will displace immigrant neighbors. Like it displaced me. So as this council, will you commit to a racial impact study to see what this proposal would mean for Sunset Park? Will you pledge to protect the vulnerable immigrant working class of Sunset Park with the public waterfront plan as required by the New York City Charter instead of abandoning our waterfront to private interests? And I hope council members remember who you are supposed to be representing. I yield my time. Thank you for your testimony, um, Council. Who's our next panelist? Uh, for the last name that was called for this panel, I will ask that Margaret Murphy, if you can hear me, please raise your hand. We'll give you a few seconds to do that. Margaret Murphy, we're asking you to raise your hand in order to be brought into this panel. Okay, it appears that this panel uh, is complete. Okay, any um, council members that have questions for this panel? Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel at this time. Okay, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you for your patience and thank you for your testimony today. Uh, council, let's call up the next panel. The next panel will include William Caravano, Andrew Hunt, Giovanni Tavares, Scott Kearns, and Manuel Arboleda. If any of those individuals whose names I just called can hear me, we ask that you please raise your hand at this time. We will allow a few seconds for you to do so. William Carabano, Andrew Hunt, Giovanni Tavares, Scott Kearns, and Manuel Arboleda. Okay, Chair Moya, it appears that uh, we have none of those persons present at this time. Okay, we'll move to the next panel. Chair, please stand by while we determine the next panel. Okay, standing by. Moya, we do have Manuel Arboleda, who was called for the just released panel. Panel, Manuel Arboleda uh, will be the next speaker. Thank you, Manuel. Hello, Hi, Manuel. this is Manuel Arboleda. Hi, Manuel. Hello. Sí. Yes. Good evening. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Yes, I'm ready. Okay, you may begin. Yes, good evening. My name is Manuela Bolida. 
Um, I'm a property manager for Industry City. I've been there with the company for 42 years, in 1978 as well. That I'm a uh, Sunset Park resident at the same time. And whatever I can say to you, that I'm very proud to live in the Sunset Park area as well that I'm working for Industry City. The conditions and everything that we have, that's fantastic. We got a lot of progress. We went through to so many different cats. Um, problems, you know, medic, um, we got catastrophes, we've been here with Sandy, but we're coming out from that. If we approve, if the city approve the rezoning, we're going to be in a better shape. After, and since 19, since 2015, Sunset Park was a tremendous chaos, a lot of empty buildings. Now, we are proud that we were you see in, in San Supa as well as in Industry City. The buildings are in very progress right now with the pandemic. We really need this zoning. You know, the economy is terrible. So if the city approves the rezoning, we're going to be in a better shape. So I am approve this situation with the rezoning. Again, my name is Manuel Bolita Sr., I'm with the company in Sunset Park in 1978. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you very much for your testimony thank, today. Thank you so much for the time that you give it to me. Good night. Thank you. Have a great night. Okay. Good. Thank you. Bye. Council, any uh, questions for this panel? Sure. I see no members with questions uh, for the panel. Great. We'll move to the next panel. Next panel will include Victoria Cernos, Jimmy Attilas, Whitney Hugh, and Catherine Walsh. I'll give a moment for those individuals to be brought in. First speaker will be Catherine Walsh. Clock is ready. Catherine, can you hear us? Catherine? I think we need yeah, a moment for her to be uh, brought in. Hi, thank you. This is Catherine Walsh. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Catherine. Great, thank you. Um, can I get started? Yep, whenever you're okay, ready. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so my name is Catherine Walsh. I am born and raised here in Sunset Park, and I'm also the chair of the Brooklyn Democratic Party's Assembly District Committee for the 51st District, um, in which the rezoning sits. My testimony today just reflects a letter that was signed by more than 40 fellow Brooklyn Democrats who were just elected into county committee in our district. These are representatives who live, work, send their kids to school in the district and have been um, longtime residents as well. Um, so I'm just providing an abridged version of, the, of that letter for this testimony. Today we ask you to respect the work and voices of Council Member Carlos Menchaca of Community Board 7 and most of all of the thousands of Sunset Park community members to vote no on Industry City's current rezoning proposal. 
As residents of New York City, we are painfully aware of the economic difficulties we find ourselves in due to the COVID pandemic. That pain is our pain. But this is not a reason to move forward with a plan which has clearly failed to win the support of the Sunset Park residents and the officials who studied it most closely and the community members. Community Board 7 spent years analyzing the industry city proposal. More than 4,000 Sunset Park residents signed a petition to reject the rezoning, and our council member, Carlos Menchaca, has officially also announced his opposition to the proposal. All of these recommendations, the opinions, the findings, the years of work and thousands of hours of time were ignored by the City Planning Commission. As you know, for years, members of the council have deferred to one another on land use matters, believing that local members are most responsive to the needs of their constituents and best able to judge the merits of projects within their districts. Member deference creates accountability at the ballot box where it belongs. Now to ignore the voices of so many Sunset Park residents who did everything they can to make their opinions known is the kind of anti-democratic action that we as Brooklyn Democratic Party representatives cannot support. We ask you to vote no on the industry city rezoning. Thank you. This time I will ask whether the following individuals can hear me to raise their hand to be recognized in the hearing. Victoria Cernos, Jimmy Atilas, and Whitney Hugh. If you just heard me call your name, please raise your hand. The next speaker will be Whitney Hugh. I'm begins. Whitney? Hi, Whitney. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Great. Whenever you're ready, you can begin. Great. Hi, my name is Whitney Hu. I live on 4th and 20th, and I've been a part of the community for close to a decade. I think after a long night, you guys have probably heard most of the statements and facts and all the reasonings for why you should strike down the industry city rezoning. But I would also just really love to urge the city council that at this moment, we should not be trying to push through massive rezonings that are gonna reshape neighborhoods. Our communities right now are focused on survival mode. One in four New Yorkers can't pay rent. 2.2 million have food scarcity and trying to bring together a community to also fight a rezoning process through it is tone deaf and it's cruel. We should be focused on making sure that our communities have enough to survive on and to stay within our neighborhoods. The city council should be focused on fighting the impending eviction that we're gonna be seeing with the crisis, <laughs> considering a lot are unable to even pay rent at the moment. There should be a moratorium on all rezonings moving forward. We know that the ULIP process is greatly broken and that we are forcing communities to have to negotiate on time Just a reminder, industry by Blackstone. The same Blackstone that is also the cause of the US housing crisis as stated by the United Nations and the same Blackstone that is also one of the causes for the Amazon fires. If what's happening on the West Coast is terrifying, imagine that sort of energy coming to Industry City, coming to Sunset Park's waterfront. We are a working class neighborhood and we need to stay one. And our communities shouldn't have to negotiate with developers and real estate money in order to get investments. Black indigenous immigrant communities are fighting for survival in New York City. And it's up to the council Thank to actually sorry. make a plan to invest in people and not property. Thank you so much. Thank you, Whitney. Here, those are the two names, uh, two witnesses who were available for this panel uh, at this time. Do you have any council members that have questions for this panel? At this time, I see no members with questions for this panel. Great. Let's uh, proceed and call up the next panel. The next panel will include Nancy Calvarino, Laura Tenervia, Albert Wiltshire, Elizabeth Rojas, and Carlos Raldirez. The panel following that 
is expected to include Priscilla Grimm, Rebecca Lurie, and Eric Fretz. The first speaker on this panel will be Laura Tenervia. Laura, do we have you? Do we have Laura? I see Laura. We're just, it's just a matter of having her. Uh, okay. Thank you, Arthur. Do we have Laura? There appears to be a technical issue with Laura Genervia. If any other names that were called on this panel, uh, if, if you can hear me and this is your name, please, we'll ask you to please raise your hand as we deal with Ms. Genervia's audio. Nancy Calvarino, Albert Wiltshire, Elizabeth Rojas, and Carlos Raldirez. If you just heard me mention your name, please use the Zoom raise hand function uh, to raise your hand at this time. As we uh, continue to deal with Laura Tenervio's audio issue, uh, we will move ahead and include uh, the next panel, Priscilla Grimm, Rebecca Lurie, Eric Fretz. Bringing in the next panel, Priscilla Grimm, Rebecca Lurie, and Eric Fretz. And the first speaker, of this panel will be Eric Fretz. Oh, okay. Hi, Eric. I live on 41st Street on Sunset Park, a community with long ties to the waterfront where people walked to work historically. I was horrified when I read through the proposal from in the, in the plans from Industry City. That waterfront area is zoned M3 industrial for a reason, and it has supported an ethnically mixed working class community for the longest time. Uh, right now we have a unique, uh, you know, large maritime area for, for ind the industry of the future, uh, as seen in the 197A in the grid proposals and an Equinor looking to build the wind turbines at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. That's, uh, that's been mentioned and we could bring in $500 million, you know, essential permanent jobs. They've mentioned, but this kind of proposal would put a wall in front of that, uh, keep it from expanding. And in the industry city proposal, it says the heavier end uses will be restricted from locating in proximity to the hotels and the lighter uses. Their private commercial pressures um, would, would decimate the badly needed manufacturing in this city. The present M3 zoning is what we need. But even if changes were needed to be made, they should be made with the interest of the community in mind and they should be made as part of larger plans for the New York City waterfront, not carving some kind of private uh, you know, luxury island out of it. The, 
the luxury tourist hotels, sure, they bring in more profit for the developers, but the wages are half of that you get in manufacturing, and they raise rents in an area already rent burdened. And it's that kind of displacement that's key here, but a, a lot of other people have mentioned it. Um, Sunset Park already has too many hotels, and now, you know, look, the luxury hotels in Manhattan, you know, they sit almost empty. The offices, this it's 20% for new, you know, uh, uh, occupancy and new ones in Brooklyn, and they want more retail now with retail shedding jobs throughout the city. Those, the promises they made were nonsense in the first place, and now they're just laughable about jobs. Um, some of the, the small business Thank you, Eric. Thank you for your testimony. Council, can we call up the next panelist, please? If Priscilla Grimm and Rebecca Lurie uh, can hear me calling your name at this time, we ask you to please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Priscilla Grimm and Rebecca Lurie. Okay, as we wait for those two, uh, that concludes this panel. And at this moment, I see no members with questions uh, for this panel. Thank you, um, Council. Let's uh, call up the uh, next panel. The next panel will include Jennifer Wirtz, Zachary J.C., Anwar Coder and Robert Mason. They will be followed in the next panel by Margaret Gregory, David Wynn, Elizabeth Norman, and Lynn Cohen Kohler. I'll ask, uh, I'll just make another reminder uh, that when you see the, uh, ask, uh, the unmute request that you accept it if you see it. Uh, and I will again, make the reminder that the unmuting process can lead to some delay. The first speaker on this panel will be Jennifer Wirtz. Clock is ready. Jennifer. Jennifer. Do we have Jennifer? I can see Jennifer Wirtz in our list. Uh, however, we appear to be having a similar audio issue uh, with Jennifer Wirtz. If your name is Zachary J.C., Anwar Coder, and Robert Mason, we ask you to please use the Zoom raise hand function to raise your hand at this time. We will allow a moment for you to do so. And while we continue to deal with uh, these audio issues, I will re recall the following panel Margaret Gregory, David Wynn, Elizabeth Norman, and Lynn Cohen Kohler. And I will also include William Caravano. The first speaker will be William Caravano. William? Hey, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. I apologize for the background noise. I'm in my brother's restaurant and uh, I got skipped over earlier. It's okay. Hold on. Let's start the clock one more uh, time. Let me see if I can lower the volume. Oiga, ¿puede bajar la música por dos minutos? Gracias. Solo por dos minutos. Hey. How are you with it? Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, no, sort okay. of you can start whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'll get started. So I'm born in Sunset Park, raised there. I only lived outside of Sunset Park for 10 years. Uh, and I've been back in Sunset Park for 15. And uh, 
I've watched the neighborhood change a lot since I'm a kid. I remember my friend's sister, I walked her home once through uh, the park itself. And it was about one o'clock in the morning. This was like 16 years ago. And I said, you remember back when we were younger, this we would have been robbed and stabbed walking through this park. And now I'm safely walking you through this park because the neighborhood is changing little by little. And then years later, a Barclays Center opened and I watched the neighborhood move from Park Slope, building after building, block after block, and everything started changing. And now stores were coming in, places were cleaned up. And then Industry City came and I was super excited about it. And I still am, and I live right off the corner. And I watched so many people say so many things about Industry City. And I'm sorry to be so frank, but if somehow magically Industry City disappeared tomorrow, the progression of what happened starting with Barclays Center would not, it wouldn't cease. The same thing would happen, whether it's, it's just a natural progression of how New York has been going. My father came here from Columbia when he was 17 years old with nothing. And he made his way, he built his way living in Sunset and he did what he had to do in very rough conditions. The conditions are a lot better these days. There's a lot more opportunity for people. And I firmly believe that Industry City is gonna bring a lot more opportunity I have friends that have businesses in there that I've watched them grow from block to block and then make their way there and it's taken them to other levels. So again, even if it's there tomorrow, I personally know some of the opposition and some of their families are homeowners and they benefited from the fact that their home prices are now two to three times the value that they paid for it. And the fact that I feel safe walking through Sunset Park, which used to be named Gunset Park when I was younger, because I'm 45 years old, I just think that some of these things that can continue to benefit. I'm looking That's forward inspiring. to it. William, thank you so much for your testimony. The next speaker, we are going to go back and try to hear from Jennifer Wirtz. Jennifer Wirtz. Hi, Hi Jennifer. Gary, thank you very much. Sorry about that before I was putting my okay. kids to bed. Um, hi, I just wanted to take a minute. Um, I'm a resident of the neighborhood for over a decade. There is a lot of people on my block. I live on 28th Street that have been on the on the block for decades. And I, I really, I, I want to speak for and against it, but really, I, I feel like there's a compromise here and we need to listen to the people. And I just feel like the people and the businesses together can work together to make this a better area. I know people are worried about being displaced, but I will tell you my neighbor next door, he had to move out because his landlord raised his rent. And the reason they raised the rent is not because of the rezoning. They raised the rent because the city hasn't done improvements that they need to do to keep the rents down. The city has increased the property taxes of my next door neighbor by over three times in the past decade. So that's a three, you know, a 300% increase. And then they can't fix the sewer at the end of the block. So when it rains really hard for Hurricane Irene and Sandy, there's been issues with the landlords having to pay thousands of dollars to rebuild their first floors. So if we could take some of this revenue that would be coming in, excuse me, from Industry City, we could use it to fix problems that have been going on for decades. They've been talking about fixing the sewers since long before COVID, long before Sandy, and long before Irene. It really needs to get fixed. There's other issues with safety that have not been fixed before the rezoning that really need to happen. There's so many children around here that don't really wanna live next to another homeless shelter or a prison like we have at Industry City already. We need businesses there that the community needs that we can work from. And we also need the elected officials to realize that they're- Jennifer, thank you. Sorry, we've run out of time, but uh, we really appreciate uh, your testimony uh, and you can always submit that uh, to us as well. Uh, thank you. Let's move on to our next panelist. Uh Going back to another uh, name from the prior panel, Zachary J.C. will be the next speaker, Zachary J.C. Hello, can you hear me? Can yep. hear you. I can hear you. 
Hi, uh, my name is Zachary JC. <clears throat> I'm a 20 year resident of Sunset Park. I'm a member of IOTSE Local 52, the film and television industry. Um, and I am a work uh, with the community. I am speaking today as a private citizen, testifying today in favor of a yes vote for the rezoning of Industry City. Since my time in the neighborhood, we've been working towards creating a sustainable working waterfront in Sunset Park. A waterfront that would provide jobs, activities, accents, access, <clears throat> and no residential housing. Industry City's rezoning plan gives us the opportunity, opportunity to accomplish all of these things. This is what a working waterfront look, looks like, something this community has sought for decades. We have an asphalt plant, distribution centers, a waste transfer station, the country's largest recycling plant, film studios, and a campus devoted to making, creating, and innovating providing sustainable green jobs, education, and retail, improving everyone's lives in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and in New York City. One of the arguments being used against rezoning is that the Euler process does not work. Uh, this is true, and the city needs to work to improve this process. However, this is the process that Thank currently you. exists. Thank you so much. We've run out of time. We appreciate your testimony. The next speaker will be Elizabeth Norman. Elizabeth Norman. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Elizabeth, whenever Thanks. you're ready. Thanks. I have been a resident, homeowner, and landlord in Sunset Park for 15 years. I've actively sought to fight against displacement during that time. And I'm asking you to vote no out of respect for our elected officials and the residents who have spoken. As a homeowner, I don't want to see people to get displaced or seeing the rents go up or see property taxes go up incentivizing people to charge more. Um, as Elena said, the CBA is not binding and if Industry City hasn't been willing to work with the community during this whole process, what's to make us think that they will now? It would be a real shame to lose the industrial waterfront to luxury malls and hotels, something that New York City has plenty of when we don't have enough industrial jobs or spaces for them. And if another event happens again on the waterfront like Sandy, large chain stores will not be open or there for the residents. Mom and pop shops who will be displaced will be. Um, a friend of mine who lives on the Lower East Side said after Sandy, nothing was open in terms of the big box stores and it was hard for her to find um, food because so many bodegas have been displaced. So um, this plan doesn't account for climate change. And if you think about a neighborhood like Williamsburg, it would be very expensive to convert that back to an industrial working waterfront. So I think we should not lose one of the last ones that we have left. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'll make uh, one last call to uh, Margaret Gregory, David Wynn, and Lynn Cohen Kohler, asking you if you can hear me, say your name, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Margaret Gregory, David Wynn, Lynn Cohen Kohler. Okay, that will do it for uh, these panels. Uh, we, we've just heard from a collection of individuals from the prior two panels. Thank you. Any council members who have any questions for the panel? I see no members with questions at this time. Okay, let's call up. Thank you very much for your testimony and uh, let's call up the, the next panel. Next panel will include Gina Pignatelli, Marcos Diaz Gonzalez, and Clinton Miller. They will be followed by Jose Pincon, Felicia DeVita, Jeremy Kaplan, and Alexa Avilas. For this panel, calling Gina Pignatelli, Marcos Diaz, Marcos Diaz Gonzalez, excuse me, and Quentin Hello. If you just heard me say your name, please raise your hand. Gina Marcos Diaz Gonzalez or Clinton Miller. Do we have Marcos? It appears we do have Marcos. 
Marcos. Yes, I am here. Okay, Marcos, we can hear you. So whenever you're ready, you may begin. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Members. My name is Marcos Diaz Gonzalez. Uh, my company, AECOM, opened a 60-person office at Industry City three years ago. Many of our employees were attracted to Industry City and the possibility to have a design office close to an ecosystem of innovative manufacturers and other companies. Our office includes designers and engineers working on resiliency, water, and green environmental projects. We also use our Industry City location to partner with the small M and W B firms, some of which you've heard before, like DS Electric. For instance, we also run uh, MWB partnership uh, workshops on behalf of some of our clients, uh, such as New York City DEP, using our Industry City office. Three years ago, we also partnered with Sunset Park High School through the ACE mentor program, of which I am the vice chair for engineering. Uh, the ACE mentor program is the city's largest STEAM program focused on architecture, construction, and engineering. Every year, we mentor about 20 high school students from Sunset Park. They come to our office at Industry City, and we have hired seven of them for paid summer internships and also as interns with the goal to get them interested in green engineering jobs, and hopefully they work for us, and hopefully they work at Industry City and in Sunset Park. Finally, we have partnered with Industry City and Red Hook Container Terminals to transform SBMT into an offshore wind hub that will create hundreds of green jobs in heavy manufacturing, marine engineering, and research development in green offshore uh, energy jobs. I strongly recommend that the City Council approve this rezoning. It will support the creation of a critical mass of jobs, including green jobs, that will diversify the economy in Sunset Park and in Brooklyn. Uh, we talk uh, often about resiliency, uh, but you need economic resiliency in order to have resiliency. Uh, I would like to have, uh, you know, to think of a future in which Sunset Park High School. That concludes this current panel. Chair Moya, uh, I currently do not see any members with hands raised for questions. All right. Let, thank you to the panelists who uh, were on, and let's proceed to the next panel. The next panel will include Jose Picon. This panel will be Alexa Avilas. Uh, do we have Alexa Avilas with audio? Alexa? Yes. Okay, Alexa, whenever Hello. you're ready, you, you can begin. Great. Um, can you hear me? Right, we can hear you. Fantastic. So thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. It's been a long day of 10 hours. Thank you for your patience. My name is Alexa Viles. I'm a Brooklyn native, a longtime resident of Sunset Park, and a member of Community Board 7. I vehemently oppose the Industry City rezoning application. I ask you 
to reject the application and stop this ineffective and broken process that is being used to railroad our community. I implore each of you to listen to the actual lived experiences of the Sunset Park residents who bear the brunt of the daily impacts of this complex. Sunset Park has been hard hit by COVID. We've had devastating job loss, rampant food insecurity, severe trauma and mental health needs, ice raids, and a looming housing crisis. We are deeply suffering. Do you know who's not suffering? Industry cities owners who are reaping the benefits of high profits in a very lucrative market, purchasing even more property on the waterfront during from the federal government during this pandemic, and spending millions of dollars on PR firms and lobbyists who peddle unsubstantiated claims and false promises. You know who could have benefited from those million dollar investments? Our community. If Industry City listens so well, why has this application not changed? Why are all the things we have asked for not found anywhere in this application? Kimball says they've made historic commitments to manufacturing. That is not reflected in the application's usage allocations. It's a meager amount. The community board significant, the community board noticed significant failures in the application, but no one, not one, has been addressed by Industry City. Industry City is quick to want to negotiate some kind of community benefits, but did not was unwilling to change the application prior. Why? Because they know that a community benefits agreement is not enforceable. These changes should have been made in the application in a proper procedure. Commitments. Mr. Kimball's testimony was filled with contradictions and no. Alexa, Alexa, the two minutes have expired. Um, we thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you. You can always submit uh, your testimony um, to us as well. But thank you for your patience and thank you for, for staying on. The next speaker will be Jeremy Kaplan. Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. You got to mute yourself. Is that working now? Yep. We can All hear right. Councilman, Councilman uh, Francisco Moya, uh, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I want to speak specifically to uh, Rafael Salamanca and Stephen Levin, actually, about racial impacts. Because the fact is you're, you're co-sponsoring a bill about racial impacts on rezonings. And right now, Industry Cities rezoning is a clear example of racial displacement of our Sunset Park community, a predominantly working class immigrant community. And there has been very little to zero implications about racial displacement. And there's these lies from Industry City and Andrew Kimball about this not being a housing when essentially already Industry City has negatively impacted the working class and predominantly manufacturing communities of color. Uh, we have a lot of manufacturing on this waterfront, small manufacturing that has already been priced out because Industry City has rents that are five to 10 times as much as the current manufacturing. And I think we need to be very smart about how we're developing and we're asking for a comprehensive waterfront. The community has never been saying, we are just no because we have no ideas. We have really bold and beautiful ideas and we want you to listen to us. We've been here for 10 hours and I'm disappointed to see that a lot of council members are not even on right now listening to us. And now the community is finally able to speak and no council members are on. So I appreciate uh, Francisco Moya that you're on and I want you to listen to La Luchadora. I want you to listen to the rest of our council members. I want you to listen to Jabari Brisport. Marcella Matenas, I want you to listen to the 5,000 people and say no to this rezoning, say yes to climate jobs, say yes to our bold proposals that we have, like the grid, like the 197A plan that Andrew Kimball has said he's been using it, which has nothing to do with it. His proposal has nothing to do with it. And we say no to this industry city rezoning and we say Sunset Park, no se vende. Um, okay, the next speaker will be Felicia DeVita. Hi, Felicia. Hi, thank you for taking uh, my speech here. Um, I'm a resident of 28th Street between 3rd and 4th Avenue. And uh, although we're considered a mixed use block, we have 14 multi use homes and our children would like to play on our block, our block and ride their bikes. The reason why this is an issue for us 
is um, we're all for change. However, we can't go forward with rezoning until we address the issues that Industry City has already brought to our community. Since the increase in traffic, traffic to Industry City and Liberty View, our small block has become a throughway for illegal 53 foot tra trailers traveling at high speeds to make the light, often taking off our mirrors. They often make a pit stop in Kentucky Fried Chicken, eat their food that they purchase and throw them down the uh, contents down on our street. Our block has become an illegal truck route for them to be able to turn down towards Third Avenue. I'm telling you today that this these trucks traveling down at high speeds are tragedy waiting to happen. I've spoken to many agencies about this problem. You can't continue to build and promise that you are adding to our community when we are suffering from what you are building. Our taxes continue to increase and our quality of life continues to decline. A, des a designated truck route needs to be designated before you start building more factories. It needs to be enforced. The other concern is our sewer system that's overtaxed. Our entire block of homeowners own sump pumps and installed check valves. Even with these safety measures in place, July, a heavy rain backed up our sewers and the pressure of water was too much. We lost our entire kitchen and living room area from this disaster. Before you start building hotels on every corner and continue to build, you need to address the outdated sewer system that's in our neighborhood. The last concern is these spaces for homeless shelters next to our schools. What does that say for the future of this up and coming area? The highway that you used to use for trailers near Industry City has pushed them down to our corner. And uh, underneath our, our street on 28th Street has become a mess while you continue to rebuild the underneath the highway by Industry City. It makes it dangerous for us to cross Third Avenue to even go and visit Industry City. My husband's family has owned this house since it was built in 1910, and we will be the generation that finally leaves. All the stores have closed. Time has expired. At this time, I will ask and give Jose Picon uh, another few seconds to raise his hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Jose Picon. Uh, and with that, Chair Moya, that concludes uh, this panel. And at the moment, I see no members with questions for this panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the panelists. And let's proceed to the next panel, please. Uh, for the next panel, I'm going to ask now for a show of hands among those listening for anyone who requires uh, interpretation services as part of their testimony. We ask that you please raise your hand at this time. Uh, the next immediate panel will be Marie Miller, Doug Steiner, Alondra Vargas Soto and Peter J. McGuire. As we uh, begin to bring those individuals in, I will again ask those waiting to testify who do need translation services or the assistance of an interpreter for your testimony, we ask that you please raise your hand now. And I will now ask whether Marie Miller, Doug Steiner, Alondra Vargas Soto, or Peter J. McGuire, if you can hear my voice, to please raise your hand now. It appears that we have no one on that panel. We're gonna to go to the next panel, Chair Moya, which will include Joshua Mullenite, David Rojas, Christopher Bajana, and Naomi Schiller. However, uh, before we bring in that panel, excuse me, Chair Moya, we're gonna try to get Laura Tenervia, who has been waiting patiently and has been experiencing some audio issues. Laura Tenervia. Okay. Starting time. Laura, can you hear us? Okay. You gotta unmute yourself. Hello? Yep. Hey, oh. Laura. Hi. Okay. Um, just give me one moment. I'm so sorry. I'm just pulling up my notes. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. And you may begin. Hi, my name is Laura Federa, and my family and I own and run a business um, in Industry City. We are a bass guitar manufacturing company. 
and we've been there since 1990. I have personally worked there for almost 11 years now and have seen it go from a very sketchy place that I was very nervous to be in to a flourishing campus that I am proud of and now enjoy with my family, friends, and coworkers. I'm here to offer my strong support for Industry Cities rezoning. Let me tell you something about what it was like before Andrew and the current ownership began the current revitalization. When we arrived as a tenant in 1990, filth and crime was everywhere. Unfortunately, I will never forget the smell of the halls as I walked up to our floor. There was even a specific day that my dad wanted to bring my little brother to work and had to shield him from seeing someone bleeding out in the staircase. It was a good day when the elevator worked and the power didn't go out. It was very hard to work under those conditions and was even worse to invite our customers into them, especially as a high-end company. All of that changed when the new ownership arrived in 2013. They've grown the campus, invested in new power infrastructure, sidewalks, loading docks, and amenities that make it a place that we now want to come to and are very proud to call home. I often see people traveling out of Brooklyn to work and enjoy free time, including my own friends, and I don't understand why anyone would not want to keep that close to home. I am in favor of Industry City's request for rezoning, and I hope that you approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, Council, let's call up the next panelist, please. The next panel, I will recall Joshua Molinite, David Rojas, Christopher Bajana, and Naomi Schiller. If you heard me, if you just heard me say your name, please do raise your hand now. Joshua Molinite, David Rojas, Christopher Bajana, Naomi Schiller. Chair Moya, we have uh, an individual from a prior panel that we had called. The next speaker uh, will now be Alondra Vargas Soto. Alondra? Starting time. Hi, Alondra, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you guys. Great. Whenever you're ready, you can begin. Okay. Hi, my name is Alondra. I live on 47th Street in Sunset Park. Um, so I just wanted to give a very personal account of what I think about this rezoning. Um, I think that the council should vote no to this rezoning, no conditions for a few reasons. One, my father works in the auto industry, which is very prominent in the industrial sector of Sunset Park within those exact avenues that Industry City is thinking of rezoning. Um, and those businesses will not be able to pay rent once it gets rezoned and once that area has different building requirements. Um, also, just commenting off what the prior um, person spoke about in terms of why they were in favor of the rezoning. Um, I just feel like that's not a just way to look at our neighborhood. Like, yes, we have had a bunch of crime in our neighborhood, but Sunset Park is full of working class people who come here to make a better life for themselves and aren't all these like violent people who are out here doing like messed up things. And Industry City is not our savior in that way. Um, also, CBAs are not for Sunset Park they aren't legally binding and so this whole talk of we can make them legally binding and let's take this off the table and come back with the cba i haven't seen any rezoning that successfully done that um or any hard evidence to show that that's what sunset park needs um and in general there has been very little evidence about how covid will be looked at in terms of jobs in terms of our community and many of those jobs are not for us. Even me with a college degree does not want to work there um, because for me, it symbolizes that I'll be to helping displace my community. And that's just something I'm not about. Um, and so all the council members who want to vote yes, I strongly urge you to vote no, especially if you're a person of color because we're inspired. really struggling right now and we do not need this rezoning. Thank you for your time. Jeremiah, uh, before we call the next panel, I'll uh, just note that I'm not seeing hands from members for this panelist. 
Uh, the next panel will be Sabrina Franza, David Crofton, Michael Anderson, Steve Lang, and Carlos Raldirez. If I have just said your name, please raise your hand now using the Zoom raise hand function. Sabrina Franza, David Crofton, Michael Anderson, Steve Lang, Carlos Raldirez. Okay, moving on to the next panel of names. The next panel will include Shanna Castillo, Madeline Borelli, Rachel Meyer, and Vanessa Phil. First speaker on this panel will be Madeline Borelli. Good afternoon. My name is Starting Madeline. Time. My name is Madeline. I'm a parent and educator and a longtime resident of Sunset Park. I chose to speak today because I am vehemently against the proposed rezoning of Industry City by Jamestown Corporation. This rezoning effort is violent and it will displace many of the local businesses and community members that allow our neighborhood to thrive. The Sunset Park community demands that the city council vote no to protect our neighborhood and save it from the capitalist vultures that wanna see our waterfront further privatized and inaccessible to working class people. It upsets me that the city continues to prioritize billionaires over local communities, businesses that are too expensive for many residents to access, and it has already failed to provide meaningful employment for people in the area, despite what the owners would like you to believe. Chair Moya, I'm sorry. This rezoning, can I continue? We, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, we will come back to you. We do need to uh, stand at ease for a moment to deal with a technical issue. Hang tight, it will be right back. Yep, thank you. You may continue, sorry. Madeline? Ms. Borelli, Ms. Ms. Sorry, Ms. Borelli, please. Ms. Borelli? Thank you. Yeah, um, sorry. Am I good to go? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, there, this industry city contains businesses that are too expensive for many residents to access. This rezoning is going to cause rents to rise, forcing generations of families out of the community that they help build. The Sunset Park community should decide the future of our Brooklyn waterfront. We don't need luxury retail or expensive hotels. We need protected and expanded affordable housing for our families. We need public recreational spaces and parks for our kids. We need well-paying union and trade jobs for working class folks. And we need sustainable manufacturing practices and climate informed planning decisions. Industry City's owners keep mentioning New York City's crisis, but fails to recognize that runaway development, gentrification, and racist rezoning are a crisis in our neighborhood that they contribute to. They need to stop hiding behind innovation when what they really seek is profits, no matter how the community is harmed. So I ask, why do we keep building structures to the rich? Where were they when the pandemic was ravaging our communities? How about instead we ask them to pay their, pay their fair share of taxes instead of letting them decide the future of communities they will never be a part of? I wanna to speak directly to city council members for a second. Council, I'm calling on you to listen to the people, not the wealthy corporations, but the folks who will decide your future political careers. You have the opportunity to do the right Time expired. Thank you, Madeline. The next speaker will be Vanessa Phil. <clears throat> Starting. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you, Vanessa. Hi, great. Um, so I'm here, I'm just representing um, a community of artists uh, who I don't think have really spoken uh, on this topic uh, so far. Uh, Industry City used to be an affordable place where um, working artists would have studios. And I worked um, for a nonprofit that was based in, in Industry City. And they were some of the most predatory landlords um, in the way that they squeeze, they tried to squeeze as much value out of the tenants there. Um, and at this point, there are very few working artists left. And one of the things I hate most about Industry City is the way that they have branded themselves as a creative hub, 
what is a creative hub um, when they've displaced all of the people that actually make the culture um, what it is? And on top of that, I mean, who are the vendors? I want to know how many of those vendors in there are people of color and immigrant owned businesses. Um, to me, they are blatantly racist in the way that they operate and they are absolutely not to be trusted. Um, so they have already so much space and I would like to question why they need to have more. Um, and I'm speaking directly to my councilman, um, Mr. Levin. Um, I appreciate your thought on this. I mean, really think hard because this is Williamsburg all over again. Um, make the right choice here, listen to the people. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to the next panelist. Uh, at this time, I will ask Shanna Castillo, Shanna Castillo, or Rachel Meyer. If you can hear my voice saying your name, please raise your hand now using the Zoom raise hand function. Okay, Chair Moya, that concludes uh, this panel. And at this time, I see no members with questions uh, for the panel. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move on to the next panel. The next panel is uh, being arranged and I will announce it shortly. The next panel will include Adam Kwapich, Irene Tung, Lita Hakoda, and Patrick Robbins. The next speaker, the first speaker on this panel will be Irene Tung. Starting time. We ready? Adam? Yeah, the first speaker is Irene Tung. Oh, I'm sorry. Irene? We're just waiting for her microphone to be unmuted. Uh, while we deal with Irene Tung, the next speaker will be Lita Hakoda. Starting time. Lita. Do we have Lita? I see Lita Hakoda, we will uh, come back to her. We're gonna go to the next speaker, Patrick Robbins. Starting time. Patrick. Uh, hi everyone, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, my yeah. name is Patrick Robbins. I am uh, born and raised in Brooklyn. I am also on the organizing committee of the New York City DSA Eco-Socialist Working Group. Um, we oppose the industry city rezoning for several reasons. As many have mentioned, this will displace uh, longtime residents. Currently, Sunset Park is a hub of manufacturing in New York City. And as of 2014, had the highest concentration of, of manufacturing jobs of any neighborhood in the city. 
Um, we know that this will uh, worsen gentrification. Our own lived experience in New York has shown that a neighborhood's social cohesion determines how prepared it is for climate disaster. Um, right now we are in hurricane season. It is unconscionable to be advancing this um, at this moment. Uh, and I'm gonna go, you know, just to speak to what people have said before, we've heard from the uh, renters from Industry City. We've heard from their workers. Um, pretty much everything we've heard today has shown that these, you know, these developers cannot be trusted and they cannot be trusted to do the right thing. And handing them a non-binding community benefit agreement, I mean, that's, that's insulting. Um, and uh, we oppose this. We support the UPROS proposal for the GRID, the Green Resilient Industrial District. This would create workforce training for uh, renewable energy jobs, reduce carbon emissions, and ensure people who already live in Sunset Park uh, benefit from development where they live. Thank you very much. I yield my time. The next speaker will be Adam Kwapich. Adam. Adam, you, you got to mute yourself. May I begin? You can start, yep. Thank you. Um, my name is Adam Kwapich. Um, first, I will discuss uh, someone who um, spoke earlier. I have been a neighbor of Maria Roca for 19 years. She is a great community leader. I trust her judgment on matters pertaining to Sunset Park. Also, I am proud of how Sunset Park helps the homeless. I am not afraid of the homeless. Most of the people supporting rezoning are wealthy. I am a lower class citizen. My last paycheck was less than $250. I strongly oppose the industry city rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. We will now try to go back to Irene Tung. Irene Tung. Starting time. Irene. Do we have Irene? I can see Irene's name in our list. It appears we're having some sort of issue. Gonna try to take uh, gonna try to take Lita Hakoda. Lita Hakoda, if you can hear me, please raise your hand. Appears that we may have lost one of these panelists. Uh, that will conclude this panel. Irene Tung, we will try to come back to you. Uh, Jeremiah, that concludes this panel. Uh, I see no member questions uh, at this time. Let's proceed to the next panel. We are going to try to take a couple of uh, individuals and then, Chair Moya, uh, we're going to have to pause at 8.30 for a moment. Okay. Is Darren Goldner available? Darren Goldner. Okay, I see Darren Goldner, who will be the next witness. Starting time. My name is Darren Goldner. I'm an organizer with the Eco-Socialist Working Group of the New York City Chapter of Democratic Socialists of America. We are unequivocally opposed to the proposed rezoning for Industry City and in favor of climate justice like, the, like UPROSE's grid plan. 
Like many of today's speakers, I was born and raised near Industry City. In fact, my first union job was with, was with 32BJ within walking distance of Industry City. I worked nights and weekends cleaning middle school 88. So did my two brothers. This was honest work that helped us support our family. As a former 32BJ member, I wanna stress that we are the exception, not the rule. For most, these cleaning jobs are not springboards to greater opportunities in life and not a great way to survive. I'm appalled that the 32BJ bosses would sell out the community and their own union members for short-term gains. It's so counter to the interests of our working neighborhood and the labor movement that it must be emphasized. Luxury retail isn't what this community needs and can't come close to the higher paying green industrial jobs that could be generated in this space. Industrial roles are the highest paying jobs in this neighborhood and green industry represents skill and growth opportunities in our community for decades to come. This isn't fantasy. New York's already passed Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act will create 150,000 green jobs and the Green New Deal will add even more. That the 30 TPJ leaders would sacrifice those better long-term jobs is beyond disappointing. It's a direct betrayal of their duty and the trust placed in them. Next, the industry city plan does nothing to address existential crises affecting our community, coastal resiliency and displacement. Industry city sits on a valuable and rare stretch of our coast. It's an opportunity to rebuild our coast in a way that protects our neighborhood from the growing flood risks that are a new reality. The IC plan has no attempt at coastal resilience. In fact, Andrew Kimball just testified they intend to let the neighborhood flood. This is unacceptable. Our community cannot be endangered just so these investors can maximize their profits. As industry cities brought in luxury shopping and high-class tenants, Sunset Park has seen very few local job opportunities. At the same time, residents are finding new competition for housing and quickly I'm rise. Inspired. Thank you. Thank you, Darren, for your testimony. Thank you. That concludes that panel, Chair Moya. I see no members with questions at this time. Great. The next panel includes A.D. Kanango, Cynthia Vandenbosch, Frankie Correa, and Paul DeMauro. The first speaker of the panel will be A.D. Kanango. Awesome. Can you guys hear Starting me? Starting time. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. It's great to finally be on. It's only been 12 hours, but it's great to be here. My name is Aide Cañongo. I am a lifelong resident of Sunset Park. Um, I live in Sunset Park, and I'd like to say, no, Andrew Kimball, Richie Torres, Donovan Richards, I am not looking forward to the industry city expansion. I'm not looking forward to the displacement that is inevitable to our entire working class migrant community of color. Let me make something clear. Sunset Park is not a community to feel sorry for. We are not a community that, it, that is pushing uh, to get anybody sorrow, uh, sorrow. Our 36 Sunset Park area has not and has never been the, the Wild West. It is a community of migrants, which is different. The rezoning does not reflect the interests of Sunset Park community. It reflects the interests of developers, developers, billionaires, and dirty politicians that are backed by real estate. I want to let you all know present that we are watching, the people of Sunset Park are watching. When you speak or post anything in relationship to the crimes against humanity happening at the ICE detention centers against our migrant woman, I, I, I want you to know that we are watching and that you must protect the, the, the working class, migrant women, migrant children, migrant families that live among you and you have sworn to protect. I am not asking pity for any other residents of Sunset Park. I, on the contrary, I am asking you to acknowledge the success that we've had as a community, predominantly migrant community working of color. Um, that despite all factors against us, Sunset Park is a mecca for commerce, for culture, and for life. Cuantas más evicciones, cuantas más redadas de ice, cuanta más violencia policiaca. Ya basta, no a industry city. And if I can just translate that, no more, how many more evictions, how many more ice raids, how many more police violence, enough is enough. No, I say no to industry city because I stand with the migrant working class community of Sunset Park. Thank you very much. Sunset Park, no se vende, Sunset Park. Thank you. The next speaker will be Cynthia Vandenbosch. Cynthia? Starting time. Whenever you're ready. Respected members of the New York City Council, my name is Cindy Vandenbosch. I'm a small business owner and I live and work in the district. I am also the secretary of Brooklyn Community Board 7. Um, today, I'm speaking on my own behalf after thoughtfully participating in a years-long process, um, both through the community, 
community board and through speaking with my neighbors. Um, this private application covers 16 blocks in one neighborhood in Sunset Park. This is a neighborhood that has maintained a strong industrial industrial waterfront and workforce for generations. I'm concerned about the scope and the scale of this proposal in its current form and the impact the rezoning will have on displacing manufacturing and retail businesses on the industrial waterfront and, and displacing people who live have lived in Sunset Park for decades. The fundamental issue here is that the applicant is legally bound to make decisions that maximize shareholder value. They are accountable to private investors, not the public. The motives and mechanisms for accountability are fundamentally different from city-owned, nonprofit-managed industrial sites like the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is why we don't see industrial retention at the heart of this application. And instead, what we see are carefully, is carefully crafted language about an innovation economy concept that includes luxury hotels and 900,000 900, square feet of unrestricted retail space, which is equivalent to six Costco's worth of retail within a matter of blocks. The fact that these conflicting uh, uses are still in the application makes it clear to me that manufacturing businesses will be pushed out or priced out and that IC's innovation economy model will in fact play out as an inequitable economy for the longtime businesses and residents of Sunset Park. Something we have seen happen in other cities where innovation districts have widened racial and economic disparities. We've learned from COVID that industrial retention matters in the city and we can create models and industry city can be on board as long as it remains one of the largest industrial complexes um, on the Brooklyn waterfront. The next speaker will be Frankie Correa. Frankie, starting time. Frankie? Yes, can you hear me? You can hear you now, Frankie. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Frankie Correa. I've been in Sunset Park for almost 40 years. Thank you for this short opportunity to speak even as community member. This platform doesn't feel like we are in a position of power. I say that because Industry City has a lot of money, influence and power. And when you have money, you never let a good crisis go to waste. Many of our neighbors and throughout the country are temporarily out of work, but yet the stock market has never been higher. So Industry City has used their leverage and purchased more property, as well as outside influences, newspapers, clergy, tenants, and elected officials who need real estate, who need real estate sugar daddy dollars. All these supporters have been used to recite Industry City's rhetoric of 20,000 jobs, $100 million in revenues as they seek to, this opportunity to land grab while people are hurting. Today, they have posed as both victims who are trying to grow their businesses as well as also uh, the, survey, the saviors of this community. When in fact, they have Pentagon-sized properties of 17 buildings, almost 6 million square feet, yet they want more. They say that that they are bringing $100 million in revenues and taxes. Our property taxes have tripled in the last seven years. So who's paying for this revenue? We, we know that, that if they invested a billion dollars, like they say, they will be writing off those revenues for years to come. Industry City has not worked with the community, but in Trump-like fashion, they have been divisive. They've used the unpopularity of our council member who has taken a couple of, of Apollo night treatment, but has stood behind the will of the people, which is what we elected him to do. Not to kiss the ring of the leadership or, or the so-called stewards of I'm public inspired. Good. The next speaker will be Paul DeMuro. Paul. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Paul DeMuro. Um, a middle school art teacher who has lived and worked in Sunset Park for the past nine years. Um, I stand with my neighbors, uh, over 4,000 of whom have signed a petition against this rezoning, uh, as you all well know at this point, and as well as all of our local elected officials and community groups and nonprofits who have spent countless hours uh, working with community members uh, saying no to this rezoning, 
while envisioning a different path for our waterfront. It seems to me obvious uh, that IC's main goal is to maximize profits as landlords. And this plan is essential to that. Uh, Industry City's end goal isn't to create a coding camp utopia for our neighborhood. But I'm not here to say what Industry City should be under the current zoning restrictions. The owners of this complex took a speculative gamble when they purchased it with those restrictions in place. That gamble is not the burden of the residents of this neighborhood. Of course, it is Industry City's right to seek that the zoning be changed, but that is not a process to be determined without the feedback of the current residents. And those current residents have spoken and have said no emphatically to this proposal, rightly skeptical of an easily overturned CBA. I join them in this rejection. Um, I wanna talk about innovation, which has become a singular slogan for Industry City. Yet when we talk about innovation, that is the introduction of something new. And the kind of advancement we need in this city and more broadly this country, Industry City's plan is anything but innovative. In fact, it relies on a very traditional and stagnated mode of growth, namely charging expensive rents to chain, chain stores, luxury hotels, which I believe are still in the written proposal, despite what was said today, private universities, novelty boutiques, while keeping the option open to sell the entire complex in just a few years time. Industry City's model is to raise rents as high as possible for its international investors, making the property desirable for a flip. It has become second nature for politicians. Time to expire. Thank you. I'll submit my testimony. Thank you. Shermoya, that concludes this panel. Okay. Any questions? No. I do, not, no. I do not see any members with questions for this panel. Let's call up the next panel. The next panel will include Eve Mitchell, Gloria Navoa, and Paul Stein. First speaker will be Eve Mitchell. Start. Hi, my name is Eve and I, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Um, I'm with the Sunset Park Popular Assembly, and I just wanted to call out today how alienating and disempowering this whole process has been. Um, this whole meeting has been stacked with industry city supporters at the very beginning, and you've waited until now to hear from community members who overwhelmingly do not support this rezoning. Um, we've heard from many different people in the community that disagree with this. We've heard some interesting stories. Um, Manchaka, for example, forgot to mention that the community had to press him for months and months and months to vote against this. So we know that everybody who's actually not listening anymore, these council members are not listening, but everybody on the, on the council has their pockets lined with money from real estate capital. We know real estate capital runs the city and the politicians are just their playthings. Um, the community um, has fought back um, for many months and forced Manchaka to vote no on this. And this is a call to people not on the panel. This is a call to people, everyday people who are sick of this bullshit, of sick of these processes that um, force us out of our neighborhoods, that force us out of the process. And we're building power from the ground up. So if you're interested in connecting in grassroots organizing that um, doesn't um, fall prey to these um, politicians and their bullshit, um, please hey, connect with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. The next speaker will be Gloria Navoa. Starting time. Good afternoon, City Council. Do you hear me? We can hear you, Gloria. Hi. Um, I've been in Sunset Park 50 years. We've tried our best to be who we are. We have always been a working class, immigrant, but powerful kind of community. This is a community that has been built on the same land that they now own, which is Bush Terminal. Everybody that came here was very clear, I can work and I can live and I can own. And they are not supplying that kind of energy, that kind of 
gravitas, which is in their hands. When you buy a property as large as theirs, you're also buying the reality that you must be better because you're sure it's like bigger. And anybody that comes on your block, you expect certain things. You expect them to, to if they have a lawn, to, to clean their lawn because everybody else cuts their lawn and to be a part of the community. They have chosen time and time again not to be that neighbor. As big as they are, they've made decisions that have never been a part of what Sunset Park is at its core, which is a neighbor to neighbor neighborhood. I can't believe that with all the kinds of lies he's told, let us not forget, Andrew Kimball promised that he was going to write a different letter when he put in his paperwork and he did not. He sent the same paperwork, which he had told our councilman, Carlos Menchaca, he was going to change. He did not. If I can't trust you to do the, the simplest thing, which everyone will know you did it, how can I expect you to be anything but a bad neighbor and a bad person? Now you bought, fine. You, you live with what you bought. Don't ask me to do any favors. Don't ask me to say yes to you. because you Time expired. Thank you. Thank next, you speaker, next speaker will be Paul Stein. Stein Hi, Paul. Good evening. Good evening, Paul. I'm here because I wanted to personally appeal to the members of the city council to honor the wishes of the majority of the Sunset Park community and oppose this rezoning for two reasons. One, any upscale purposes, any upscale uses that are allowed uh, to be uh, carried out by Industry City means that that land will not be available for manufacturing and most importantly for a green resilient industrial district, which you've heard about earlier. And second of all, the rezoning would accelerate the displacement through gentrification. And the effect of gentrification is racist what, regardless of what you think about the motivation, the, the effect is definitely racist. And something to think about in terms of some facts having to do with the uh, gentrification. The vast majority of the residents of Sunset Park are people of color. Two thirds of those residents are renters and two thirds of rental units in Sunset Park are not rent controlled, rent stabilized, rent regulated in any way. And that means when the largest real estate companies in the city and the state, for example, Douglas Elliman and, and Compass in the country actually, are advertised and they advertise proximity to Industry City because they know that the new upscale workers in Industry City, not Sunset Park residents, the vast, vast majority of them want to live as um, Andrew Kimball said, uh, the walk to work, it's a walk to work property. So please vote no and end this acceleration of gentrification. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Chair Moya, that concludes this panel. I see no members with questions for this panel at this time. Seeing none, um, any members have any questions? See no members with questions at this time, Chair Moya. Great, thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next panel, please. The next panel will include Brian Garita, Lita Hakoda, Jess Kulig, Helen Filion Ansarud, and Corinne Candelaria. The first speaker on this panel will be Brian Garita. Brian. Hi, uh, yeah, can you give me like one minute? Sorry, I'm just Brian. preparing my notes. We're on a clock, you have to. All right, well, 
if I'm on the clock, then you're on the clock. You ready? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready now. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So my name is Brian Garita and I vehemently oppose this, um, this rezoning um, on the grounds that we're not here for your macroeconomics. We know that these developers are not humanitarians that, you know, they talk about all this macroeconomic stuff, but the reality is that 55% of the Sunset Park neighborhood is rent burden. They spend more than 30% of their money on rent. Um, about 9% live in overcrowded households. And we know how, how much that's affected them, you know, during this, this epidemic. Along with that, you know, with these ice raids, you know, along with COVID, this rezoning is really going to change my community for the worse. And, um, and a lot of our people are going to be displaced. Um, we have to cancel rent. There's so much to do. And we're over here talking about a rezoning that's going to bring um, a boutique hotels that aren't going to do anything for our community. And, you know, so again, I vehemently oppose this on so many levels. And um, just let the community decide what they want to do with their land, honestly. I think, you know, Donovan Richards, Robert Carnegie, these are all foolish men who don't have anything to do with our community. Let them rezone their own neighborhood. Why are they um, advocating for a rezoning in we're Sunset gonna, Park? We're not gonna Leave take, us alone. We're not, we're not going into insulting other council members right now. No, no, I'm, finish, not, I'm not. I'm finish, just saying, I just want to point your, out. You can make, finish I your testimony. Just, let's let's, let's, keep, it, let's that, keep it to the, our, to the actual um, hearing itself, okay? Thank you. I, I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to go digress. No, okay. I just meant to okay. say that our council member has already spoken for our community. Those council members should just speak for their own. And, um, you know, stop, stop trying to sell ours piecemeal. And that's what's going to happen is, you know, our community is going to change little by little. We already have reports of a Chipotle trying to come into our community. We don't want those kind of businesses here. We want our culture and our vibrancy to change our community and our economic development. Please, please, we do not need private developers. The filth and grime that those people mentioned before are, is my community. And those people talk from a perch of privilege. Those people have nothing to do with our community and they do not live the everyday average life. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Next speaker will be Corinne. The next speaker is Corinne Candelaria. Hello. Hi, Corinne. Hi. How are you? I'm doing well, well, thanks. How are you? Is my time on? You're right. Yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Corinne Candelaria. I'm a resident of Sunset Park and small business owner here as a licensed New York City tour guide, um, which is just to say that I've spent a lot of time sharing and interpreting, um, sometimes celebrating the history of our neighborhood um, and this Canarsie Lenape land that we occupy. Um, and I want to say that from my interactions with international visitors and conversations I've had with other community members, I can tell you that this type of development is outdated and embarrassing. Um, in my tours, I like to talk about the history of Bush Terminal and how during World War II it served not only the community, but the world. Um, and there's an opportunity right now for Industry City to serve the world again, not through business hotels or toxic classrooms, but through a green waterfront. Um, for the past month, I've been here in Northern California looking after family and the air outside has been unhealthy uh, to hazardous for 22 days. Um, so I urge you to please take advantage of New York City's last waterfront opportunity to invest in sustainable energy, carbon neutral infrastructure, and environmental amenities to impact and inspire and impress the rest of the world. And selfishly, I'd like to end my tours with a skyline that doesn't uh, get obstructed by literal pillars of racist rezonings, profit being put over people, and the selling of Sunset Park. Thank you for your time. Next speaker is Helene Filion Ansarut. Helene? Arthur, should we move on to the next person? 
We'll try to take Jess Kulig as the next speaker. Jess Kulig. Hi, my name is Jess. Um, I live in Sunset Park, actually right down the street from Industry City. It's like literally right behind me, sitting in my bedroom. Um, so the first thing I wanna say, um, I am completely opposed to this rezoning. Um, but before that, um, just this whole Euler process is a sham. Um, we all know it's meant to work in the favor of developers, make us feel like we have a voice. Um, we know this as a community, which is why we've been working for years outside of the process to show the strong opposition to the rezoning to Carlos. But lo and behold, when Carlos finally says no, the goalposts are moved. Now, suddenly the decision of the local council member doesn't, isn't the one that um, matters. It's, you know, all the council gets to decide now. So um, it's just, it just shows how messed up and performative this whole process is. The second thing um, is that as other people have said earlier, all rezonings, including the current one, are inherently racist. Um, Sam Stein, who's an urban planner at CUNY Grad Center, um, wrote a book explaining that the purpose of rezonings is always to raise property values, and that sp spreads across the whole neighborhood. Increased property values means higher rents, which means displacement. We've already seen building owners marketing their properties at higher pr prices, like Paul said earlier, explicitly stating that Industry City is about to be re rezoned and is down the street. And all the talk of 8,000 shitty jobs really doesn't mean a thing when people are priced out of the neighborhood. Um, and when I say shitty jobs, I'm talking about jobs like the ones at Lilac Chocolates, which is an industry city business that hired union busters to stop workplace organizing. I'm also talking about the industry city employees who were retaliated against earlier this year for raising concerns about COVID cases after much of the city was already shutting down. So are they saying a good job is one that you're supposed to die for? Um, I also don't hear any mention from Industry City of the fact that they're evicting the post office, which is basically the one thing that people in Sunset Park actually use down at Industry City. And that, that facility is made up of union workers as well. And now we're going to have to go more than a mile down the street. Thank you for your testimony. The next speaker will be Lita Hakoda. Hi, um, my name is Lita, uh, a member of Sunset Park Tenants Union and Sunset Park Popular Assembly. And I uh, just wanna say that um, I'm really, really extremely opposed to the rezoning proposal, as well as the current uh, state of the industry city buildings. Um, those luxury, like nice looking things are not for me. <laughs> enough for people in the neighborhood. And um, COVID pandemic has been asking us of, you know, fundamental changes in our way we live and think and work and cooperate with each other. And we'll build it. You, um, our group is building on some amazing, amazing movement to support each other. And um, this rezoning is going to really ruin that. And we're really coming up with new strategy that deals with you know um, this capitalist relationship and dynamics, and uh, we are grouping together, building together to uh, overturn that. And we heard earlier from some of the workers um, who said that how how low pay their pay pays are, their wages are, and those people, and along with the community members who have been opposing you know, this rezoning for years, um, we really need to listen to them. They are talking reality and uh, whoever is um, in favor of rezoning, in favor of industry city is talking fantasy. Um, we have learned um, history and we have seen actual what's going on in the neighborhood that, like Williamsburg, I was displaced from Williamsburg and uh, all the rezoning is uh, really ra racist, as some people have pointed out. And and this process has this process to, today. You know. Okay. Thank you, Lita. Thank you so much. The next speaker will be Helen Filion Ansarud. Um, 
thank you. Um, I've lived in Sunset Park for the last 34 years, and I consider this neighborhood to be the best I've ever lived in. The reason it is such a great neighborhood is because it's a real community where people care about each other and about making sure that people can stay and it remains a strong community. There aren't so many of those kinds of communities left in the city. I am now a homeowner and I love the tenants who live in my house. <clears throat> I would hate for them to have to move because my taxes are going up and I need to raise their rent. I would hate for my working class neighbors to be displaced and have to leave because real estate developers and the lawmakers that go to them are trying to rezone over a million square feet of industry city without community agreement and support. We know this will hike up rents and cause more displacement in Sunset Park. Our council member, Carlos Mechaca, took a long time making the decision to say no to this private rezoning plan because he wanted to try to work with industry city developers for the benefit of the community. It is only when he realized that the developers weren't acting in good faith that he made the decision. It is very upsetting for those of us who have been invested in working on behalf of Sunset Park to realize that the decision made by the council member we elected and we trust in not, is not being backed by the rest of the council and particularly by its speaker. The Sunset Park waterfront, New York City's largest maritime manufacturing area embodies not only New York's industrial pa past, but also the neighborhood's history as a community of recently arrived immigrants and working class families. Industry City envisions transforming the historic waterfront. Um, is Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker on this panel will be Rachel Meyer. Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you whenever you're ready. Okay, great, thank you. Um, my name is Rachel Meyer. I am a homeowner in Sunset Park. Um, I have only been in the neighborhood for about five years, but I um, am opposed to the proposed rezoning and would urge the council to vote uh, against it. I wanna echo um, and amplify what my neighbors have been saying that there is real fear and real concern about rising rents in the neighborhood and that it would displace um, so many of our neighbors through gentrification and um, would really, you know, we fear destroy the fabric of the community and the diversity of the community and just totally change the face of Sunset Park and why so many of us um, love to live there and raise our families there. Um, this issue has been studied in such detail and there are no guarantees that the jobs will be for Sunset Park. There's no way to keep that accountable. Um, and we can't just take Andrew Kimball's word for it that he's gonna um, you know, support the neighborhood and invest in, uh, in the people who live there. This is a totally arbitrary deadline and there's no reason to rush this process. There's no reason it needs to be decided on right now in the middle of COVID and uh, without community support. And so I think the process needs to slow down and um, really look at the issues that the community is raising. And I hope that the uh, council will vote no because those conditions haven't been met. Thank you. Thank you. Let's call the next panelist, please. No. Chair Moya, that concludes the speakers for this panel. Uh, I see no members with questions at this time for this panel. Okay, let's call up the next panel. The next panel will include Shanna Castillo. Phone caller with a number ending in the digits 8802. Elise Shuck, 
Grace Bothwell. Sorry, Chair, uh, an individual named Jeffers, an individual identified as Patricia W. Jorge Muniz, Karen Guzman, and Jane Lee. The first witness on this panel will be Shanna Castillo. Good evening, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Thank you for your time this evening and for providing us with the opportunity to testify. My name is Shauna Castillo. I'm a longtime Sunset Park renter and local public school parent. And I'm urging the city council to vote no on Industry City's proposed rezoning. Um, as a local school, school parent, I've spoken with many parents and many school teachers who know that Industry City is wrong for our community. They know this when contacting Industry City to try to work together in partnership to provide real learning opportunities for Sunset Park students. They know this when they take their students there on tours and they look around and see that there's very little that their students and their parents will be able to afford. And parents know this also when they walk into that space, it is so very distinct in an undesirable way from the character of the Sunset Park community. This is not a place that is being built for the local community. At a time during COVID, this is really our time to get a reality check. This is our time to really focus on the racial injustices that have been with us for decades. The mayor talks about this in his press conferences. Yet saying yes to an industry city rezoning will just be the type of business deals and real estate deals, deals that also happened under Bloomberg. And we see the devastation that that has caused to those local communities. I understand earlier the city council, city council does not want us to uh, name call council members but council members are certainly being disrespectful when they're coming from outside of our community and demanding that we embrace a deal that is only going to further displace those that are most in harm's way. It is not the right time for an industry city rezoning. They will not go anywhere. They are here. They can continue to prove that they can be good community members. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Let's move to the next panelist, please. The next speaker will be an unidentified caller with a phone number ending in four digits, 8802. We're calling the witness with the uh, phone number ending in 8802. We'll come back to uh, that caller. The next witness will be Elise Shuck. Elise? Elise, you, you ready? We'll come back for Elise. Yeah, mute yourself. We Hello? Can you hear yep. us? You can go. Hola, buenas noches. Gracias por la oportunidad de hablar, de que escuche la comunidad. Mi nombre es Blanca Carabajo. My name is Blanca Carabajo. Thank you for the opportunity to listen to the community. Vivo en la comunidad 25 años. I live in the community for 25 years. Tenía un negocio aquí y lo que antes era Bush Terminal, hoy Industry City, por I más used, de 10 años. I used to have a business here at Bush Terminal, at Industry City that was known as Bush Terminal for 10 years. Para crear Industry City nos votaron a todos los de aquí. 
más de 300 negocios. In order to create Industry City, they had to get rid of the businesses. There were 300 businesses that they, that they displaced. Era aquí trabajo para la comunidad. Madres, muchas familias trabajábamos aquí. Pregúntense ahora, ¿en dónde están esos trabajos? ¿Dónde están esas familias? Nos han desplazado para crear Industry City. Those businesses provided jobs to the community, to mothers and families. Now, those 300 businesses that have been displaced, where are they now? Now that Industry City is here. Dieron paso a Industry City, trabajos para la comunidad. Mentira. Cada negocio que está aquí en Industry City viene con su propia gente. No es trabajo para nosotros, para la comunidad. Um, they're lying. Industry City had to displace us. And the businesses that they brought in came with their own employees. También están desplazando de aquí a la gente. Las rentas están subiendo. Muchas de mis amistades no han podido pagar la renta. Se han ido de aquí. Estamos perdiendo a nuestra comunidad. The rents are going up and tenants can't afford their rent. I've lost a lot of friends. They've been displaced from this community. Industry City no es trabajo para la comunidad. Se han equivocado. Industry City does not offer jobs to the community. That's wrong. Industry City está desplazando a muchas, a muchas familias de aquí, a la comunidad entera. Industry City is displacing families, communities. Por favor, quisiera que nos apoyen. No, no estamos apoyando al rezoning. Please, we need you to support the people. We, the people, do not support the rezoning. Recuérdense que somos familias trabajadoras. Somos familias que hemos venido a levantar a este país. Remember, we are families that came to help lift up this, this country. Sunset Park no se vende. Sunset Park no se vende. Next witness will be Grace Bothwell. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Grace. Hello, my name is Grace Bothwell. I'm a resident of Sunset Park, and before my work, shut, work site shut down due to COVID-19, I was a low-income worker in the neighborhood. I stand with my neighbors and strongly oppose the industry city rezoning. The rezoning plan will displace longtime residents and vulnerable migrant communities in order to create additional luxury retail that no resident wants or needs. This isn't baseless speculation. We've seen this play out in countless neighborhoods like Williamsburg, Chelsea, and downtown Brooklyn. This plan will dramatically accelerate gentrification in a neighborhood that is pre predominantly populated by people of color. This rezoning plan is racist, no qualifiers. Industry City is not built for the community, but only serves to make the rich richer and make the poor suffer. This plan does not reflect the interests of residents and is catered exclusively to rich developers who only care about shareholders and their bottom line. Sunset Park has the largest working class industrial waterfront in Brooklyn. The space could be immediately put to use to create planet-friendly jobs like manufacturing windmills and showing up the waterfront. We are staring down the barrel of multiple crises, COVID-19, gentrification and displacement, and climate change. It is an absolute travesty that this plan is being considered at all. There's no reason why we need to be voting on this today. City council members, you need to do the right thing and vote no on this rezoning. Put people over profit for, one, for once. I yield my time. The next speaker will be Jane Lee. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jane Lee. I am a resident of Sunset Park and I'm also a housing attorney. Um, and in that capacity as a housing attorney, I've had the opportunity, um, unfortunately, to represent tenants and tenant associations um, in Sunset Park who have been facing the pressures of gentrification and displacement and large um, landlords coming into the community to um, put profits over people. And Industry City is a similar type of organization, but just on a huge, massive scale. Um, the profits from Industry City aren't going to be coming and flowing into the community. It's not, while there are small businesses that work um, and rent space in the development or campus, so to speak, the profits are, are going outside to investors. Um, Sunset Park is a working class community um, with lots of immigrants and people of color. And 
frankly, one of the only affordable places left to live in South Brooklyn. And if residents and tenants and families are being pushed out, there's no other place for them to go. Um, so for those reasons, I oppose the rezoning plan. And I think there's a false choice being presented between having good labor jobs and having to pushing this rezoning forward. And Sunset Park shouldn't be bearing the brunt of a failed economic development on many fronts. And especially a lot of people are anxious about the economy um, in the times of COVID, but this is a real lasting impact um, that's gonna take place in this neighborhood. And we shouldn't be so short-sighted about what's happening and who we're inviting to do additional business here. Industry City does enough business in this community at this point that they do not need to expand. Thank you. Next witness will be the individual identified as Jeffers, J-E-F-F-E-R-S. Jeffers, going once, going twice. Okay, let's move on to the next one. I'll try to go back to unidentified caller with a phone number ending 8802. Can we have the phone caller with the number ending in 8802? Caller. Hello. Hello. Yep. We hear you. Hello. You just state your name and then you can start your testimony. Damn, bro. You fucked me up with this. All right. We're going to, we're going to mute you now. Um, Let's move on to the next panelist. At this time, I will ask if Patricia W., Jorge Muniz, or Karen Guzman, if you're hearing me say your name right now, please raise your hand in the Zoom window. Patricia W., Jorge Muniz, Karen Guzman. Okay, uh, we appear to have lost those witnesses or they appear to have uh, exited the meeting. At this time, I would ask uh, if there's anyone in the public still waiting to testify, to please use the Zoom raise hand function so that you can be identified. We're going to admit the phone caller witness identified as user underscore seven. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, what's up? Um, first, I just want to say something to the folks listening who are from Sunset Park or other parts of the city. Don't for a minute get fooled into thinking that this process is if Hello? you can state your name, yep. If you can state your oh. name for the record. Sure. My name is Corbin Ledline. Okay. Sweet. Um, yeah, as I was saying, um, don't let any of us get fooled into thinking this process is democratic, right? We've been fighting for years to stop this. In spite of all the resources, Industry City, and the sellout business unions threw at this, we got our community board to say no. We got Carlos Menchaca to say no. So why are we even having this conversation right now? We don't wanna have our voices heard by a bunch of politicians so you can go and make a decision for us. We don't wanna just be heard by you. We want decision-making power over what happens in our neighborhood, which is why we need to be continuing to build with other communities for a moratorium on all rezonings until it's replaced with a new process and ULERP is abolished so we can have decision-making from the ground up and power over land use. 
right? I'm from Red Hook. I live in Sunset Park now because I could no longer afford to live there. And it's not a mystery that the rezonings have played a huge role in accelerating gentrification and displacement in Red Hook. If you know Red Hook and you go back to the what's called the front, the area by the waterfront, right? You know it's it's been a, there's been an ethnic cleansing back there. The folks that remain, the working class people of color that remain, all the rezonings have brought are precarious, low wage service jobs. And the folks who've managed to stay around, they tell me they feel like aliens in their own neighborhood, right? And that's what's going to happen to Sunset Park. And I don't know if you heard, Andrew Kimball will talk about his solution for gentrification which essentially was to warehouse poor people nearby so they can make it to work easily. Nowhere did he mention any concerns about displacement, about the effect gentrification has on the social fabric of communities that he's destroying. He doesn't give a fuck about the people of Sunset Park. Right. And to the business much. owners. There's not gonna be any profanity in these hearings. Thank you. Let's move on to the next panelist, please. The next panelist will be the unidentified witness labeled user underscore six. If you're going to testify, you can say your piece. If you're going to use profanity, we're going to cut you off. It's that simple. We'll now hear from witness user underscore six. Okay. Going once. Going twice. Let's move on. Emmett Mendoza, if you wish to testify in this subcommittee hearing, please use the Zoom function to raise your hand now. We'll now hear from Emmett, Emmett Mendoza. Emmett. Hey guys, can you hear me? Hello. Hi, uh, this is Emmett Mendoza from Sunset Park. As you can see, I am in the middle of Industry City here with my friends. Um, the reason why we're in the middle of Industry City is because we're trying to stop this rezoning from moving forward. There are many obvious reasons why this rezoning needs to stop. For one, it's a private rezoning, which means that the interests of the community are not first. The interests of the profiters who are developers who are going to basically create this rezoning only to create profits for themselves, for their investors, for the people who are funding um, Jamestown, like BlackRock. As you all know, like these corporations are not in here for the community, they're in here for the investors to create profit. In the end of the day, the 20,000 jobs that they promised are not real. Um, Jamestown is a landlord, they're not job creators. As you mentioned, as you heard, they are like hiring or they're, they hired at least around 80 people. These 20,000 jobs that they're gonna, that they promised are not gonna be through them. It's gonna be through the people that, or the organizations that they're gonna hire. Secondly, um, as you know, um, rezoning in the past have displaced communities a lot. Um, Williamsburg, 4th Avenue, the parcel rezonings, the Barclay Stadium rezoning, each one of these rezonings has dramatically impacted the communities that have long lived there. Um, the same thing can happen here in Sunset Park and I'm hoping that you, um, Francis Camoya, will vote no, but I'm also hoping in the time where we have a red moratorium, I hope that you also take account that if this rezoning does go through, it will displace thousands of people. And I'm hoping that you also push for a um, rezoning moratorium for any upcoming rezonings. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. Let's move on to the next panel. So the participant identified as Shlomo Rothschild. If you wish to testify in the subcommittee hearing and have not already done so, please raise your right. Please raise your hand. <laughs> Shlomo Rothschild, if you wish to testify in this subcommittee, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Okay, let's move on to the next one, Martha. Colleen Peabody Diaz, if you wish to testify in this subcommittee, please use the Zoom raise hand function. I see uh, the next witness will be Colleen Peabody Diaz.
while we attempt to get Colleen Peabody Diaz in. Is Shlomo Rothschild ready? Okay, let's let's move on. Participant identified as Alyssa, one name only. If you wish to testify in the subcommittee, please use the Zoom raise hand function if you have not already done so in this here. Chair Moya, I see no additional hands people who have not already testified. Great. Okay, so are there any additional members of the public who wish to testify on uh, Industry City? Here at this time, I see no other members of the public who have not already done so who wish to testify on this item. Okay. okay, there being no other members of the public who wish to testify on uh, public hearing LU numbers. 674 through 677 for Industry City. Uh, the hearing is now closed. Uh, this concludes today's business. Um, all of today's applications are laid over. And I remind you that if you have written testimony on these items, you may submit it to the land use, uh, you may submit it to land use testimony at councilnyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or the project name uh, in the subject heading. Excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry, Chair Moya. Yep. I see that Councilmember Menchaca has his hand raised for to be recognized. Council member. So before, uh, are you just gonna give a closing statement? Cause, all right, yes. I'm gonna get back to you in a second. You got it. Okay, yep. Just give me two seconds and then we'll, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back to you. Um, but look, folks, it's been a long day, and uh, I think there is just uh, a lot of um, information that we've received, and I want to thank all the participants, everyone who stayed on uh, for hours. We've now gone on for 11 hours and 31 minutes. Um, it's an important issue. Uh, whether you're for or against it, uh, we, we appreciate uh, your time and your patience, but I also have to give um, uh, a big thank you. Uh, to the staff, uh, our sergeant at arms, uh, all of you who have uh, really kept this uh, hearing going uh, and moving. Uh, we thank you so much for what you've been able to do uh, to have this be a, a seamless um, uh, Zoom meeting today and made it so accessible to the public. Uh, we appreciate all the great work that you've done uh, and you, how you've hung in there with us uh, uh, for these 11 hours. Thank you to all of you uh, for what you've done. Um, and then I also have to thank the incredible staff uh, that we have in our land use department. Uh, my co-pilot in this, Arthur, thank you. Uh, you have been incredible. Uh, you have really driven this thing home. Uh, and I know that uh, I couldn't have done this without you, uh, but the staff, Chelsea, Amy, Rosa, John, Sam, Andrew, Brian, uh, Katie, Caitlin, um, Malika, Julie, Sandy, uh, Michael, and of course, uh, Raju, man, who uh, have spent uh, endless hours uh, trying to get this uh, hearing together, uh, doing all the great work that all of you have done. Uh, it's been incredible. And to Megan Taddeo, who's on my staff as well, uh, I wanna thank uh, her as well. And, and again, the staff, this has been a long hearing, but I wanna thank you uh, for everything that you've done I'm gonna turn it over to council member Minchaka, uh, who I think also wants to say a couple of thank yous to all of you. 
Yes, and, and the first thank you is to you, Chair. Uh, you've managed to, to build something that was, uh, I think, historic in a lot of ways. Uh, all the thank yous that you gave um, really built out something that I think is going to be a model for future hearings as we move forward. Uh, I want to say thank you to all the interpreters as well who have been on this call interpreting for folks in the different Zoom calls. I think it's the first time that the council has done that before. Um, and I, I think it's just, it, it, it's telling of the commitment that you chair and the council has, has made and demonstrated to bring our immigrant communities into this process. Um, I will also say thank you to Corey Johnson, our speaker, uh, and Jason Goldman, who really created um, that expectation from the very beginning. Um, I also want to say thank you to Arthur. Um, thank you. I don't know how you did what you did. Um, I, I hope you ate. I don't think I even saw you like eat. So I hope you ate something. If not, I hope you have something waiting for you. Um, but, but I also just want to say thank you to all the members of the public who stayed so long uh, in this. I think the last time I remember being on a public hearing like this was on budget uh, and staying for the whole thing. It, I feel the same way. Um, I have Zoom eyes right now, um, but hearing workers, hearing residents, hearing folks that are supporting of Industry City, all of those members of the community are what made today possible uh, and even has have supported my final decision to say no. Um, and I'm hoping that, that Chair, you can help me really amplify the voices that have come here today to all the rest of the subcommittee committee members. Um, and that's the work tomorrow. But thank you, uh, y buenas noches. Oh, oh, final, uh, it's Mexican Independence Day and all this stuff on the hearing has forced me to do this and not think about Independence Day. So for all the Mexicanos and Paisanos out there, um, let's celebrate wherever we are safely. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I also want to say thank you to Speaker Corey Johnson, Jason Goldman, uh, and also to Chair Salamanca uh, uh, for filling in. I appreciate um, what you've done. Uh, we really um, couldn't have done it without you. So thank you all. Um, this meeting is hereby adjourned.